Fantastic. I wasn't sure he was going to be here. Um, so welcome everybody to the RISE conference. I think I said about a year ago, or maybe not quite even a year ago, uh, that this was the last RISE conference, and it turned out not to be. This is this really is, though, the last RISE conference. And I'm enormously grateful to our funders, FCDO, who have given us a little bit more money after the end of the RISE program to be able to continue our work um, for a further six months, including this conference. And what we're doing um, over these next two days is really talking through all of the themes that we've addressed during the past eight years of RISE. So you'll see that the program spans a big range of themes. We're starting today with two sessions on teachers, the first about recruitment, placement and motivation, then we take a break for half an hour and then we come back and we have a session on uh, training and support. We are going to be ruthless with time. We really, we've got so many papers being presented, we have to stick to time. So UAE is going to chair the next session and she is going to keep all of our speakers to 15 minutes and we will end at 10.30. Okay, thank you. I'm the thematic synthesis team at RISE focusing on teachers and management and now I'm a senior education specialist at the What Works Hub for Global Education. So I'm very excited about this panel. Um, we are going to have four speakers. We'll start with Maria Lombardi. On, oh, just a minute. <laughs> That's <right>, Maria. <laughs> That's fine. And Maria will be talking to us about a change in the law in Chile that led to permanent contracts for a lot of teachers that have been previously holding temporary contracts. Then we're going to go to Gregory Alacqua who will be talking about a new administrative platform in Ecuador that gave teachers personalized information um, at the point of ranking the schools that they prepared to get placed in. And then we're going to go to Ricardo Estrada on Mexico, where he's talking about a nationwide scale up of a teacher selection mechanism that replaced a previous discretionary selection mechanism for getting teachers into the pool. And after that, we're going to go online and to India to Jalnith Kaur, who's going to be talking us through a psychosocial teacher training intervention that tried to change teachers' beliefs about how much they can influence the classroom. Um, so the one thing I wanted to say in framing this panel is that what I find both really important and really challenging in thinking about this set of papers is trying to hold in my head that all these things, so, you know, selection, allocation, contract structure, training, or the lack thereof, happen to the seat each teacher in each education system concurrently. And so by extension, they affect every child in every classroom concurrently, right? Um, and in good Lant Pritchett fashion, I tried to come up with a pithy metaphor, emphasis on the tried. So, you know, I was thinking, you're trying to manage or design a teacher whole career structure. It's sort of like, let's say you're given like a plot of land or a field and you're told, okay, your job is to cultivate a garden or an urban forest that can be a habitat for local wildlife. Um, the metaphor got really complicated really quickly, apart from the obvious fact that children are clearly not wildlife. You know, we have things like, okay, I'm gonna come up with the best plants and figure out where to allocate them to the best place. But then all of a sudden, you learn there's a scary cartel of plant nurseries who say, no, 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 half your teachers need to come from my saplings or I will get politicians involved. Or, you know, there's also the much more important fact that the plants in this analogy have agency, right? teachers shaped by their circumstances can decide to some extent whether they want to channel more of their nutrients toward growing nice shady leaves or beautiful flowers or thorns or some plants after years and years of not getting enough nourishment and seeing local wildlife habitat numbers stagnate. They might just lose hope and decide there's no point and kind of just hang out there and wither. So, Moving on from the very stretch metaphor to the actual careful research, the point is that, you know, the kinds of teacher preferences about where there's, which schools they go to that um, Gregory is going to talk to us about are shaped by the incentives and the contract structures they face, right, which Maria is going to talk about, and teachers' beliefs about what they can and can't change in their classroom, which John Nith will be telling us about, are shaped by the selection mechanisms that shape the pool of teachers, which Ricardo is talking about. So, I hope that in our Q&A, we'll be able to get into some of these interactions. As Claire said, we're doing this in typical RISE conference panel session. So 15 minutes strict on time. And then after that, we'll take a few rounds of questions. So hold your questions to the end. We'll be very excited about them at that point. So now, Maria, we are so pleased to have you come up here. Time. So the this paper is on the impact of giving high dismissal protection to teachers, and it's co-authored with Ricardo Estrada over there. 
So let me just start by saying that job stability is like a very common feature in many public sector jobs, including teaching, which is what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about. And this in practice means that it's very, very hard to fire people when they're not doing a right job. So it's restricted to very exceptional circumstances. And even though this is such a common thing, we know very little about its consequences. So one can think about the impact of high dismissal protection on the quality of education as being a good thing or a bad thing. So on the one hand, giving people high dismissal protection prevents us from having excessive turnover, which has a lot of switching costs associated to it. That's a good thing. Also, it will increase the appeal of teaching for people who have good outside options, thereby improving the pool of teachers. And finally, one can think that knowing that the contractual relationship will have a long standing horizon, this gives incentives both to teachers and to schools to invest in like job specific attributes. So, of course, all of these things come at a cost. The main cost associated with this is that once you make a bad hiring decision, this has very high costs because you cannot fire people unless it's a very, very extenuating circumstance. Also, just people don't have incentives to perform on the job if they know they're not being able to, not going to be fired, thereby worsening the productivity of teachers. And finally, something that we're not talking about in this project, but it's an interesting thing to think about, is that having high dismissal protection gives less flexibility to the educational system to adapt its teaching workforce to changes in the demand for education across disciplines or geographical areas. So in this paper, we look at the impact of high dismissal protection on turnover and productivity of teachers. And we're gonna look at this in the context of public school teachers in Chile. And this is important to, uh, to keep in mind once looking at the results, we're gonna be focusing on dismissal protection that is granted on the basis of seniority and not on performance, which is actually a very common thing that, that occurs in many educational systems. So for identification, we're gonna use a law that was enacted in 2015, which mandated that educational administrators grant a permanent contract to teachers that had a temporary contract and a minimum level of seniority by, by the previous year. And because there were teachers who were affected and unaffected by this law, we're going to use a typical differences in differences estimation, comparing the outcomes of these two groups of teachers. So before I go into the estimation and the, and the results, let me just tell you a bit about the educational sector in, in Chile. Public education, at least in the moment in which we were studying this question, was run by municipal governments. There's 300 and something municipalities. And the municipal governments can hire teachers under two types of contracts. Permanent contracts, which are your typical civil servant teachers, and temporary contracts. Permanent teachers are hired through a competitive process whereby the municipalities have like a, they receive direct applications and they have a panel of evaluators that look at the, at the applicants whereby te temporary teachers are directly hired by direct appointment. There's no like competitive process associated with this. An important thing is that their contracts, they can last up to two years, but they typically last for one year, for the entire school year. This can be renewed though, and in many cases they are. Um, unlike what happens in many countries here, both types of teachers have the same working conditions, the same salary, they do the same job. The main difference lies in the protection they have against dismissal. Basically, temporary teachers, once their contract runs out, it can it can not be renewed, and thereby they don't receive any uh, severance pay. This is the main thing between these two types of teachers. Other than that, they face the same working conditions. And even though the law in Chile caps the share of temporary teachers at 20%, compliance is low. In particular, right before the reform we're gonna look at, 59% of teachers had a temporary contract. This had been going up for the previous years, for different reasons that we look at in, a, in another project. And of course, as you can imagine, this was not, uh, this met some resistance from the main people affected by this, which were the teachers. Here you can see people who are saying, uh, no more teachers a contrata, which is like temporary teachers. And this led to the policy that we're gonna look at, which happened in January of 2015, here in the Southern, here not there in the Southern Hemisphere, the school year starts in March. So this was right before the start of the school year. And Congress forced municipal governments to give a permanent contract to some teachers that had a temporary contract. Who were affected by this? Where it covered those by, that by mid 2014, so in the previous school year, had been working in the same municipality for at least three consecutive years or four non-consecutive years. So this was completely seniority based. 
And a year of experience counted as long as you were working at least 20 hours, which is most of the teachers were, were full-time teachers. And almost a third of K-12 teachers with a temporary contract were covered by, by this law. And an important thing to bear in mind is that this was a one-off event. It's not that this changed the way in which you can progress from a temporary contract to a permanent contract. It was just a one-off thing to regularize an irregular situation, but then things went back to normal after, after this regularization process. And also an important thing to bear in mind is that the way to think about this is once the law was passed, those who were eligible for this dismissal protection had protection against dismissal, even though their contractual status may have taken a little time to adjust because of just some bureaucracy associated with it. Let me see. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to look at the impact on turnover. Basically, who is retained when you give them dismissal protection? To do this, we're going to take advantage of the nice data that we have in Chile. We're going to use a database that has every teaching position in Chile since 2003, both in the public and the private sector. And importantly, this database has the characteristics, oh, sorry, and the characteristics of the teaching position, the number of contract hours, and the type of contract. And we have a teacher identifiers that allow us to track teachers across years and positions. So this allows me two things. One, to identify who are the teachers who are eligible for this dismissal protection under this law. And also it allows me to look at what happens after teachers are giving dismissal protection. We can look at turnover, and we can look at movements across different types of schools in the, sec in the educational sector. And because we don't only care about retention, but we also care about who is being retained as a result of this dismissal protection, we want to look at heterogeneous effects across a dimension of teacher ability. What we can do in this context is look at teacher evaluation results, which were being held on a regular basis. And this is going to be a measure of teacher ability that we're going to uh, explore to see heterogeneous effects. So our sample is going to consist of public school teachers that in each year between 2010 and 2014 had exactly two or three years of consecutive experience in the municipality and had a temporary contract. So here we have a repeated cross-section of teachers. In each year, I'm going to look at those that have or three or two years of consecutive experience. Those with three years of consecutive experience are our treatment group, and those with two years of experience are our comparison group. And the cohort in which we have differences between these two types of teachers in their dismissal protection is a 2014 cohort. So using this sample, I'm going to run a very simple difference, differences estimation. My outcome variable is going to be a dummy for whether this teacher is not working in the same school after one or two years. My treatment dummy is what I showed you before equals to one if the teacher had three years of consecutive experience in their municipality under a temporary contract in that year, and zero if they had two years of experience. And I'm going to interact this with a dummy for the 2014 cohort, which, as I told you, is a cohort for which we have a difference in these two types of teachers in whether they had access to this dismissal protection. So now I'm going to show you my treatment dummy, the, the, my coefficient of interest is beta 2 for these two outcomes not being in the same school after one and after two years. So we, what you can see here is that dismissal protection leads to a large reduction in teaching turnover, teacher turnover, basically seven percentage points after two years, which, which is a 25% reduction over the control group mean. And teachers could turn over by either not being in the public education system or taking a job in another public school. So we break down this, this turnover, looking at what would have happened in the counterfaction. And we can see that two thirds of this reduction in turnover is driven by teachers who, in the absence of dismissal protection, would have been working um, would, would not have been working in the public school system. So I don't have these results here, but basically we see that teachers uh, are prevented from working in private schools and from quitting teaching altogether once they receive dismissal protection. The reminder comes from a lower probability of taking a job in another public school. So basically, just over five minutes. Perfect, thank you. And because we don't care about turnover just in general, but we also want to know who are we retaining as a result of this, I'm going to interact this regression with dummies for a teacher's baseline a teaching evaluation results. So here you can see the impact of dismissal protection for teachers in the first, second, and third tercile in a teaching evaluation conducted before this policy was in place. 
And we find a statistically significant reduction in turnover for teachers at the bottom and top of the distribution of teaching performance. So to speak very crudely, we're retaining the bad and the good teachers when we give them dismissal protection. So basically the average quality of teachers, at least in this context, is unchanged. So I'm gonna just spend the last minutes that I have talking about what happens on, with student learning, which is of course the outcome we, we, that we care the most about. We're gonna proxy teacher productivity using value, value added to student achievement. In particular, we're gonna use math and literacy scores from a nationwide standardized test that all kids take at the end of sixth grade. And again, we're gonna use this 2015 law as an exogenous shifter in the probability of having dismissal protection. Once again, a difference is in differences estimation comparing the students of treated teachers with the other teachers, those that did not have their dismissal protection status changed in 2015. A potential concern here, and every time that we're looking at a policy that affects teachers, is that you could have sorting to treated teachers in the year in which the policy takes place. So for example, if the best students are assigned to treated teachers in 2015, we might think that dismissal protection is wonderful, where in fact, it's just a change in the composition of the student body. So we take advantage of the fact that in sixth grade, almost the majority of kids have a different teacher in math than they do in language. So some kids are treated in one subject, but not in another. And so we're gonna use a within student across subject estimation. And it's unlikely that sorting is subject specific. So I have like three minutes left. Let me just quickly say that I have two observations per student, one in math, one in language. And I'm gonna compare kids that have a change in the status of the dismissal protection of their teachers in one subject, but not in another. And in some estimations, I'm gonna include a teacher fixed effect, where what I'm gonna look at is for the same teacher, what happens when they change their, their dismissal protection status across time. As you can see here, on average, we find no effect on student learning. In particular, we can reject a drop in test scores larger than 4.6% of a standard deviation, and we can reject an increase larger than 1.2% of a standard deviation. But once again, this could be masking some heterogeneous effects going on. It's not obvious that all types of teachers are gonna react the same way when they're giving dismissal protection. So what we do is we interact this estimation once again with the performance at baseline of teachers in their teaching evaluation. And what we find, so here what you can see, or you can see, I don't know how big this is, we have the treat, treatment times pulse dummy interacted with the a tercile or a position in the, in the distribution of teachers in their baseline evaluation. And what you can see in the second column is that once we include teacher fixed effects, so once we keep the pool of teachers fixed, we find that there's a negative effect on student performance for a students that have teachers with low baseline uh, teaching evaluation scores. So the way to think about this is that once you grant dismissal protection, teachers with ha that have a low baseline performance, they perform less effort. And we have some direct evidence of that that I don't have time to, to show you now, uh, but that's the main mechanism that, that we find. And so to sum up, how am I doing? I'm okay. Uh, we find that granting permanent contracts on the basis of seniority, and this is an important qualifier, leads to a large reduction in teaching turnover throughout the distribution of teacher quality. And we also find a decline in student learning for students of teachers with low baseline performance. So the way to think about this is that high dismissal protection is a double-edged sword. So on the one hand, it allows you to retain teachers that have good outside options and would have otherwise left the public school system and perhaps also the teaching profession, but it has a cost that it makes it more, diffi more difficult to separate low performing employees and to mot motivate them as well. And an obvious conclusion that one can think about when looking at this is, why did they grant dismissal protection based on seniority and not on performance, which is something that they had been measuring for a long while? This is like a political thing, I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but it's a good question to think about. Right? So I'm good with time, thank you very much. of the presenters at this conference. I'm um, 20 seconds, sorry, 20 minutes. Yeah, so Greg, <laughs> also measuring things in the right unit is a good precedent for a conference, but Gregory, all yours. Thank you, by the way.
Did you, will I, will someone, the presentation? Oh, it'll come up, okay. Well, it's great to, it's great to be here. And thank you, that was a, I actually really liked your metaphor that helped me think about where we think about teacher selection and deployment. Uh, this is some work, so they're gonna put up the presentation? Okay. This is some, no problem. This is some work that we've been conducting in Ecuador with, uh, with Chris Nielsen at Yale and at the, at the IDB. I'll get right into it. So making optimal choices, let me, let me set my time as well. I hope I'm, hope I'm as good as the previous presenter. <laughs> uh, making optimal choices is very difficult when faced with information frictions. And there's a growing body of evidence that providing agents, individuals with personalized information can facilitate the decision-making process. Inter uh, informational interventions are potentially beneficial at the individual and at the system, at the efficiency level. So we're gonna show some of this today. There has been uh, a, a, an emerging body of evidence on uh, using inter informational interventions and in, uh, school choice in Chile, there's some work, and also in Pakistan, financial choices, healthcare plant, different healthcare plans, consumer behavior. And most of these studies show that low cost and they have these interventions are low cost and have a positive impact on the decision making process. But the, Devil is in the details in, uh, in most of these programs. So we explore the role of information in teacher job markets. We look at uh, Ecuador's system. Uh, teachers, and this is, we've done a lot of work on this in Latin America and different countries. And I know the previous, uh, Ricardo and, and, and uh, Maria, right? Maria have also looked at this uh, in Mexico and some other places. In, in, at least in Latin America and in other developing countries, regions, teachers face a, an opaque and, and very limited transparency with regarding teacher openings when they apply for vacancies. Uh, they often prefer, so they're information barriers. And teachers often prefer to work close to where they live uh, in urban areas or in schools with specific characteristics, more advantaged schools, such as better infrastructure, more experienced teachers, more credentialed teachers, uh, and more socioeconomically advantaged students. So uh, most evidence has found, and there's not a lot of research on teacher deployment, that information barriers and teacher preferences can lead to inefficiencies and inequities in the job market. So often what happens, teachers cannot secure a vacancy in their in, in more popular schools, and slots in less attractive schools or more disadvantaged schools often go unfilled. So just to illustrate this, uh, this is a map in Peru. You can see all of the red dots are vacancies that teachers have chosen during the job application process. And the yellow dots are vacancies that were not selected by any teachers. So you can see about 40% of the vacancies, and this was, I think, the job contest in 2018, were not selected by any, any teachers. Um, about 60% of disadvantaged vacancies or vulnerable schools had no applicants. Uh, just to show some ex extreme, 77% of intercultural bilingual vacancies, these are schools that serve indigenous students in Peru, mainly in the Andes, but also in the Amazon, were not chosen by any teachers. And if you look at an even more extreme case in Loreto, which is the re uh, region in the Amazon, 83% of vacancies were not selected by any teacher. However, you had, have a lot of market congestion, a lot of uh, density of applications. So 32% of the chosen vacancies received over 10 applicants. So you have a lot of teacher sorting and a lot of market congestion. And this you can find in other places as well. Uh, what, what, this, what ends up happening is a high percent of applicants in the, in the process are not assigned to any vacancy. So in Ecuador and Peru, over 50% of applicants during the contest do not, get a, do not secure a vacancy. Uh, and this is actually very inefficient for governments because they have to reapply in the following contest. In Ecuador and Peru, they have to take all of the tests. Again, so it's, it's expensive for the government. In Ecuador, they have to take at least part of the tests as well. And this often leads to teacher, teacher sorting. So disadvantaged schools struggle to attract qualified candidates, often resorting to temporary hires. And you can see in Ecuador, uh, the higher the school's socioeconomic status, the higher the teacher's content knowledge. About one, there's about a one standard deviation between teachers in the highest and the lowest quintiles. 
And so governments uh, have adopted different policies to improve efficiency and to try to attract and retain teachers in hard to staff schools. So they've used monetary incentives to work in disadvantaged schools. There's some evidence in Peru, and we have, we have some evidence in Chile as well that these can be effective in retaining teachers in high performing schools. In Chile, they're not as effective to attract teachers, but these are very expensive policies. In Peru, they usually represent about 30% uh, over the base salary, the, the teacher incentives. These are, these are quite expensive. We've also uh, tr uh, tr uh, tried low cost non-monetary incentives. So we have two large scale experiments that one that we ran in Peru, another one that we ran in Ecuador, another one we're running in Peru actually right now as uh, this week, uh, using techniques from behavioral economics to nudge teachers or try to try to nudge teachers to uh, consider applying to some of the hard to staff and more remote and rural vacancies. We find that in Peru, um, focusing on extrinsic and intrinsic motivations increased the probability of including rural schools in choice sets and, assign, and had an impact on assignments. And in Ecuador, the experiment that we ran on the job platform increased the share of applicants that included schools in their portfolio. That actually had even a, a, larger, a larger impact. So these, these are some low, other low cost ways to attract teachers to hard to staff schools. But in this paper, we test a low cost intervention that provides teachers with information aimed at increasing their chances of securing a position and seeks to improve system level assignments, uh, trying to improve the scores of the pool of teachers that get jobs and the number of filled vacancies. So the, the, the intervention was implemented in Ecuador as part of the Quiero Ser Maestro program, which assigns teachers to schools through a centralized choice and assignment system. Uh, since 2013, the Ministry of Education has selected teachers and assigned them through a centralized process that has three phases. The first phase, they have, teachers have to pass a psychological exam and a knowledge exam. I think they need to get about 70% of the answers correct on the knowledge exam. Then they pass on to the next phase where they evaluate their credentials and they have to do a demonstration class and they have to also pass the dem demonstration class. You can see that about 27%, this was in the, this was in 2019 when we ran this experiment, 27% of the almost 130,000 applicants passed. Uh, in Peru, actually the numbers are much lower. It's like seven to 10% pass. Uh, and then once uh, teachers pass, they go on an, uh, an online platform and they are able to, they have to select and rank up to five vacancies and then are assigned, they are assigned by an algorithm with similar properties to a deferred acceptance. Uh, and this that takes into account their scores and their preferences. So the teachers, I also should mention, this is kind of important for our experiment, uh, have uh, a 10 day application period and then a two day validation period. So what we did, so I have about six, six, seven minutes. I'm a little slow because I arrived last night, so I hope I'm coherent. Um, the, the, inter the intervention consisted of providing teachers with a personalized report. So we sent about 20,000 teachers via WhatsApp and email that included a summary after, they, after the 10-day application period and they closed and submitted their applications. We sent them a summary of their application that included the location of their school, the distance of the school from their home, the number of applicants and the number of vacancies at the schools that they applied to. So all of the teachers that applied received this personalized report. And then some of the applicants, uh, those that were at risk of not getting a vacancies received in addition to the summary, a warning and a list of recommended schools similar to those in the summary, summary se selection. So they received something like this that said, this can increase your chances of getting a vacancy. You're applying to schools that are oversubscribed and that have a lot of have other candidates that have better scores than you have. We recommend that you go back and add schools or modify your application so you can increase your chances of getting a vacancy. And basically to, to identify the risky applicants, we generated 200 assignments uh, simulations to, to determine the proportion of simulations in which applicants were not assigned. So risky applicants were those that were not assigned in 30% of the simulations. This is similar to previous work that Chris did in Chile on school assignment, and this generated a sharp discontinuity. Just really quick, and this is important, uh, on the note on the recommendations, uh, the, the risky recommendations were, what we did is we pointed the teachers toward 
uh, in our list of recommendations towards schools that they had a good, better chance of getting into, so that they had where they had higher scores than the other applicants. But we did not consider the general equilibrium effect concerns that some schools might end up more congested, congested if uh, they were recommended to many applicants. This, is, this will be important in a second. I'll show you the results. We did not, we did include as diverse uh, uh, a group of recommended alternative to reduce the risk of generating excessive congestion, congestion at the highly demanded vacancies. So we used a regression discontinuity strategy. Let's skip over this. Uh, we tested the validity of this using covariate tests. We'll see what that can, I can come back to this if you want, but I want to get into the results. Uh, what we found is uh, treated teachers were much more likely to modify their application and to be assigned to a vacancy. So receiving the risk warning increased the likelihood of applicants going back to the platform and changing their application. Usually the, this meant modifying. Unfortunately, I, I can come back to this at the end. Unfortunately, this usually meant modifying their application rather than adding schools to their application because over 90% of, of teachers uh, uh, listed five schools on their applications. And Ecuador only allows teachers to list five schools. They should really allow them to list unlimited schools. Um, and this has some implications for strategic behavior. Uh, and also they added a recommendation from about 43% added a school from the recommended list that we sent them. And these are some other outcomes as well. Uh, at, if they added any modification, added any school, added a school from the recommendations list, uh, the, about 30 set, they had a 37 greater probability of being assigned to a school and then about a 35% greater chance of being assigned to a school that we recommended from the list. Uh, just I have about three minutes. So just, I wanted to show a couple other results. Um, first, and I think this is important for policy, um, there was a drop in the assignment in the probability for applicants. If you see on the left of this, the discontinuity, the partially assigned schools are schools before the last validation phase. So this is before they could go back and this is when they closed or submitted their application and before they went back and changed their application. So you see on the left of the discontinuity, they were more likely to be assigned. Um, and applicants on the right of this, the discontinuity after the validation phase were more likely to be uh, to to increase the, so what ended up happening in some they some of the applicants that we recommend or that we sent risk to were applying to oversubscribed schools so these tended to be higher performing candidates that were applying to oversubscribed schools they were displacing some of the lower performing candidates that were less at, less at risk so kind of a system level descriptive result. And this is very descriptive because we didn't design this experiment thinking about the GE effects. We just designed the experiment thinking about individual effects, increasing individuals' chances of securing a vacancy. But we did find that it increased the number of applicants and the overall assignment score. So the general quality of the pool of applicants that got that secured positions increased by about 0.23 standard deviations. So I think that's an important. Uh, impact, it's just descriptive, it's not causal, but I think it's worth mentioning because it's important for policy. So to, to conclude, I think I'm gonna include, conclude on time as well. <laughs> we find that the effect that program, this loss, low cost information intervention in the context of Ecuador's assignment system had an impact. The results are robust to different specifications and lead us to conclude that the intervention positively, positively impacted individual choice and assignment to schools. So they were more likely to choose schools if they got a risk and choose from the list of recommended schools. So personalized information can impact and affect individual behavior. Um, the results also suggest, they're more descriptive, a positive general equilibrium effect by improving both the average score of teachers and the total assignment. So a greater percentage of teachers were got a job after this compared to, to previous contests. Uh, and it also increased the score of the overall pool of students, of teachers. So that's also, I, we also thought that was an important effect. So centralized choice and assignment system, similar to, to Quiero Ser Maestro contest, they provide a unique opportunity to interact with applicants and offer personalized feedback. And so we, you know, future work we think should consider the GE effects 
And also, and this is something I didn't get into, but we can talk about in the Q&A, mechanisms rules. So uh, in, in Ecuador, in Peru, five seconds. In Peru, you, you can list unlimited schools. In Ecuador, only five schools. And that does have implications. And just to, lastly, uh, you, there's also an opportunity to use new technologies to engage teachers during the process. So we're doing some of this work in Recife, Brazil, right now, using recommendation engines to engage uh, students and uh, centralized choice platforms. And we also think you can use these technologies to engage teachers. Thank you. Yes. Now, Ricardo taking us to Mexico. organizers for the invitation and everybody for being here. I don't see the presentation. It just, it's just thinking. Okay. So anyways, well, this is joint work with uh, Juan Bedoya and Rafa de Hoyos. And uh, today I'm gonna talk about teachers and um, so in front of this audience, I have to elaborate on the point that teachers are a key input for learning. Uh, but even though uh, we know uh, teachers matter, I don't want to distract you. My phone. <laughs> <laughs> in many education uh, systems in developing countries struggle to hire teachers, effective teachers, in a systematic way. And, um, and, and that, that, that's a big challenge. I mean, we know teachers are important. Then. How do I get good teachers into schools? That's what you want to know. And uh, in Latin America, motivated in part by public pressure about the low quality of education, many uh, countries, including Ecuador, uh, Chile, and Mexico, have moved to basically what we call uh, rule-based hiring, which is the hiring of teachers based on uh, competitive examinations. In the case of Mexico, heavily based on standardized testing. And, and there are uh, some, several papers evaluating this, including one of mine that I presented in the very first RISE conference. In, in that paper, I show that the introduction of rule-based hiring into Mexico leads to the hiring of more effective teachers, teachers that, that add higher value added to student learning compared to the counterfactual of using the traditional system, which in Mexico means a highly discretionary uh, system and opaque. I will talk more about that. Okay. Uh, so, so, so that we have some papers that have uh, evaluated whether uh, this rule-based hiring uh, leads or not to uh, higher student learning. In general, in Latin America, the results tend to show that are positive. But still, uh, we know for more uh, descriptive work that implementation of these reforms tends to be very challenging for political economy reasons. And, uh, and I think we still know, we still have to know better why reforms uh, succeed or fail. And this is a little bit the motivation of this paper. So we know teacher quality is multidimensional. There are many things that make a good teacher. And we are going to study one of these dimensions in this paper. And that dimension is cognitive skills. There is some evidence by papers that show that teachers with higher cognitive skills tend to be more effective teachers, tend to add value, more, add, more value added to student learning. And in the context we're going to study, which is Latin America, this is a little bit worrisome because teachers tend to have very low levels of cognitive skills. And this is something that uh, Maria and I document in a different paper. And I'm going to just pick a graph from that paper to, 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 to motivate the context. So there we use this PIAC data, which is this survey of the adult population by the OECD that is like the PISA for the adults. And there are four countries of Latin America that participate in this uh, survey, including Mexico. And what we do is we compare the cognitive skills, the numeracy scores in particular of teachers and not teachers, of the tertiary educated population of, P of people in these four Latin American countries and what we call the high performing OECD countries. And when you compare the distribution of test scores, you observe two things. One, if you look at the panel on the left, uh, which is Latin America, it's uh, teachers are negatively selected in terms of the skills compared to the population with tertiary education. No? The, the, the distribution of teachers is still left than the other people, educate, tertiary educated people. Second, people in Latin America countries, the tertiary educated people tend to have lower cognitive skills than people in the OECD countries. 
Now, the combination of these two facts, lower skills in the population and a negative uh, or a skills gap of teachers with respect to other uh, person educated, produce a fact that I think it's worth to, to put attention. If you look at the vertical lines, this tells you the first vertical line, who are, what are the share of the population who is below uh, proficiency level one of PIAC, which in Latin America means 50%, 15% percent of teachers. What does it mean? These people have trouble to, to, to calculating 30 percent, to understanding basic, uh, a basic test, text uh, devoted for uh, at the level of the primary school level. So probably this, if this teacher had problem making basic calculations and understanding basic texts, they're going to be hard for them to be effective teachers. The other one is a vertical line is a line at the performance level number one. And people below, they can manage to, to, us to calculate a percentage uh, number, but they have trouble putting this in context or, in, or as a part of another operation. So people here have limited cognitive skills and probably they're gonna be a limitant for their effectiveness, uh, effectiveness as teachers. So what we're gonna do in this paper is study the effect of a civil service reform in Mexico on the skills profile of new teachers. And specifically, we're gonna look at cognitive skills. And when I bring more attention to the mechanisms behind this change, we're gonna look at self-selection and screening. And uh, the context is this nationwide reform that Mexico adopted in 2014. So in the 13, the Mexican group, Congress enacted a major education reform that basically revamped the teacher's civil service system. It was a big uh, reform that changes many things in the selection, promotion, and permanence of teachers. And this included the, 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 the mandate of using competitive examinations run by the federal government to determine hiring decisions in basically all schools, uh, public school system. And the reform aimed to put an end to this system characterized by a high use of discretion and opacity in the hiring of teachers. In Mexico, schools are run by the state governments. And what this reform did is it took away one uh, function that is selecting teachers, and it gave it to the federal government, okay? And this reform basically expanded in a scale of the scope a previous reform named ACE, which introduced teacher hiring. So let me show you this quickly in a timeline. So what we look uh, in the period before, from 2007 to 2013, is this first reform that introduced uh, rule-based hiring. But in this time, rule-based hiring was optional. A state would say, this year I would put into the competitive national examination 60% of our new vacancies, and I will keep 40%. And it was up to each state to decide which year. Completely. Uh, then the reform came, changes many things in the teaching career, including now you have to put 100% of vacancies. And what we're gonna do is to compare the before and after, and hopefully I will show you that uh, looking at mechanisms, we find evidence that the changes that we observe have some causal interpretation, okay? So the data we're gonna use is first, we're gonna use the basically what is the payroll in Mexico. And using the payroll of teachers, we can identify who are the new teachers. Then we're gonna merge those payrolls to the results from the competitive examinations, both before and after the reform. And in this way, we can identify who are hired through the competitive examination system. And those hired, other way, must come from the discretionary system, okay? And the third we're gonna use, this is important, our measure of cognitive skills come from a national standardized test that teachers took when they themselves were students at the end of secondary school. Okay, so in Mexico, to be a teacher, you need to have a university degree. And what we do is we look at people who enter the teaching profession and we go and look back in time with data and at this result on this national standardized test that all students take at the end of secondary education when they are around 18. Okay, and that's our measure of cognitive skills. So if, if we look at the new teachers hired through the 2012 to 2017 period, which is when we have data from the uh, payroll uh, data sets, which are new, we were created in this period, uh, we've identified around 180,000 teachers. Now some, the average age of new teachers is 29. So some are too old, 
to be found in this national standardized test that started in around 2006. So what we do is, is we focus on what we call recent graduates, which are young enough to be found in the standardized test, which is basically people who enter the teaching profession four years after finishing high school. And the university degree in Mexico typically takes four years. Okay, it's people uh, who are, uh, yeah, what we call uh, recent graduates. And I think this reason is uh, probably, this creates that we underestimate the changes that we're gonna, gonna observe because we're looking at a good population of, of the new teachers, let's say. So, okay, so we're gonna just basically compare before and after. And as you imagine, there are many challenges for identification and the basic one is secular trends or shocks of individuals who self-select the teaching. And hopefully we're gonna show uh, this is not a problem in our case. So when we compare before and after, we see an important improvement after the reform is implemented in the profile, uh, the skills profile of teachers, which is around three percentile points on average of the distribution of the skills. If we look at the quantile regression, we look that the, most of the change come from the bottom part of the distribution. The change in the quantile 0 0.1 is almost between five and seven percentile points. So the change is really coming from the bottom part of the skill distribution. Then when we try to look what is behind this change, one very first thing we do is how the reform was implemented. And what we observe is a large increase in the share of teachers who are higher under the rule-based system, from 65% to 75% and up to 85 But this is not one. Why? Because there are many reasons in which the state governments react, basically using administrative tricks to prevent putting all uh, vacancies in contests. And this is a common in other uh, contexts in Latin America. Second, we look at what happened between the skills gaps between the rule base and the discretionary hires. And we will say, what we observe is when the reform is implemented and the share of rule based hires go, goes up, and uh, we observe also an increase in the average quality of the teachers hired to the uh, rule-based system. They become better. While the, the discretionary were becoming worse even from before. So the skills gap between the rule-based and the discretionary hire widens with the, re with the reform because the reform improves the quality of rule-based hires and there is a trend of uh, worsening of the discretionary hires as this becomes the less dominant system. So, then we, when we look at the rule-based hires, because from them, we have the pool of applicants. We know who applied to the system. We don't know for the discretionary system because there is no such a data set that uh, records who are the applicants to the system. But we know who applied to the discretion, to the rule-based system both before and after the reform. And we compare if there is a change in the self-selection of people to the main dominant mechanism to recruit teachers. And this can be a potential interesting mechanism of the reform, but can also illustrate if we are on not, if our main result might be driven or not by the self-selection trend. And we, what we observe, if you look at the panel of, on the left, is there is no clear change, basically, in the pool of applicants to this reform. Particularly, I think, is because we're looking at recent graduates, right? So there is little time to adapt and, uh, and change this. But this is good for the credibility for main results. There is a small change when we look at the bottom, but it's around 1%. And if we look about the change in the quality of the rule-based hire, this number is up to seven percentile points. So it's very little compared to the overall change. It's likely very modest at most to explain the main result. And so the, the question is why? No, I mean, we are observing that the quality of the rule-based hire increases clearly just after the reform. And we don't observe that the quality of the applicants to the rule-based process changes. So there must be, because these guys are screening better, are selecting better, are now better at producing teachers from a given pool of teachers. And that's what we study here. And what we do here is just, we just plot the probability of being hired as a teacher for the applicants to the rule-based system. And we put the before, which is the ACE system, to the after the reform, which is the SPD. For time, I didn't go into the detail, but the reform not only made mandatory with this hiring, improved the institutions running the system. And that probably had an effect because we look how the, how the slope 
it becomes much higher. Now, cognitive skills are a much more important determinant of hiring. And we find the same results if instead of using the probability of hiring, not the same results, but the same pattern, we use the test scores used to select teachers, to screen teachers. So the correlation between my performance at 18 and my performance in the test that I took at 22 to enter the, the, the teaching career becomes stronger with the reform that brought this institutional change about how these competitions are made. So to sum up, we find that the SPD reform likely improved the skills profile of new teachers. And mainly this is key, we think, by an improvement in the bottom of the skills distribution. And basically, we think there are two channels behind this thing. The reform decreased the prevalence of discretionary hires, which were disproportionately drawn from the bottom of the skill distribution. And second, the reform improved the screening efficiency of rule-based hiring, making cognitive skills a more important determinant of hiring outcomes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Jonathan, can you hear us? Those in the room, feel free to stretch, have a drink of water while we wait. Tech issues in the 21st century. Wonderful. We're so pleased to have you, Donna. Are you ready to go? Yes. Thank okay, you great. Much, All yours. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. My name we is can't Jen. hear you. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think it's on our... Or on our end, just give us a moment. Okay. <laughs> just so you know what the room looks like, we have a screens with your slides and then screens with you as well, so everyone can see you. So okay, you. perfect. <laughs> Are you able to hear me now? Still can't hear you. They're, they're fixing, I think it's the speakers in the room possibly. So they're getting on that. Sorry for the wait. No problem. I guess this is the challenge of the first panel. You get everyone before they're saturated with information, but then you also get all the tech hiccups. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Jonathan, I'm so sorry. They say they need to reset the system, so it'll be a couple of minutes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a couple of questions from the room on the other three papers and look forward to hearing okay. about future release very soon. Sorry about that. Okay, so we're going to do first round of questions in a bit of a swapped order. So, yep, um, I'm going to try to take three questions, and I'm going to ask strictly one question per person. If there's more time, then we can come back to you if you have more. But yes, I see one hand there. Any other hands? Any questions with this? One and, okay, so let's go one, two, three. Great, it's like... Okay, thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the reason I asked about it is because I was just a housemate who did a uh, teacher training college in the UK. And I don't remember like still to this day because like he was like super stressed since the first day I ever met him. Uh, it was because he has to fight for like school placement during teacher training stage. So 
what is it? The admin is like doing this, like, uh, really getting this documentation. They have to go to like so many different places. So everybody wants to get into like the good schools. So everybody's ready to compete during the placement stages because if you get to this, like, for example, like, the district and uh, doing the uh, school placement, then you will have a higher chance of becoming like a permanent teacher. Vicky, can I ask you to jump to the question? Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Thank you. And we'll go here. Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, a question for me for the first presenter. I was wondering about the potential anticipation of this policy, meaning that schools may have been incentivized to fire the least productive teachers shortly before they receive the dismissal protection, which would create a bit of selection of the group that is then treated um, going to maybe a Okay, so very boring question to Maria about identification as well. I'm just thinking that if the probability of dropping out uh, increases by five percentage points every year of experience, the difference in the difference in dropouts could just be mechanically driven by those uh, more experience is more likely to drop out. Uh, but I'm sure we have responses and answers. Great. Okay, so let's do. Gregory first. What's that? Oh yes, sorry. Actually, can panelists can you come up to the front? Sure. Ricardo Maria, okay. can you come up to the front here? Can I ask a question for Maria? Why we want to front? Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, why not? You can you can use part of your time to respond. So Gregory, then Maria, and then Ricardo, you have the joy of making any comment or reaction you want. <laughs> Great. I was just curious about the net effect, like what you thought was the net effect of this policy change, because you found that it decreased teacher turnover, which is really costly for systems, especially mm -hmm. in the early years, but at the same time, decreased productivity. So if you were talking to, you know, a government, what would you, what would you suggest? Very sorry, can you okay. also briefly respond? Yes. Uh, so your question was about pre-service training. That was one question I had for you. I think because in Ecuador, it's after pre-service. So when, when teachers graduate from their undergraduate teacher training programs, they have to go through a selection process, kind of similar to what Ricardo explained in Mexico with multiple instruments, with different phases, and then they apply to schools. Um, and so I, I guess in, in the UK, it sounds like they go, th they, they apply when as they're finishing their undergraduate teacher training? Is that... um, so I think my understanding is that you do like a course called PGCD, which is like, uh, so you do an undergrad and have to do like a particular professional certificate called PGCD in order to kind of apply for schools. But during the training of PGCD, some professors uh, allow to have more experience. So that's part of your I mean, yeah, I don't really know exactly how I need, need more information, but one thing that we've been working on with, with other governments in Latin America is centralizing their processes, because some of these processes are very costly to manage for, for government. They have to process all of the applications, they have to interview the teachers, they have to find placements for them, they have to often negotiate with them, there's a lot of discretion like Ricardo described, and so these are very costly processes, so one thing that we've working on with some governments is how can they centralize the process where they can apply online with a platform same rules for everyone they can rank their preferences they know exactly the rule that they're going to that's going to be used to determine if they get a position or not and then we have some of these techniques like the one we mentioned now to kind of reduce inefficiencies in the process so because what happens like like with your roommate everybody applies to the same schools there's their popular emblematic schools or really popular schools that everybody and they become oversubscribed and often teachers don't get vacancies so that's kind of the, the rationale behind some of the things that we're doing but in that sense what we've been working with lots of lots of different places states and municipalities in brazil is how can they centralize the processes and this reduces cost, but at the same time uh, increases transparency. It doesn't always uh, increase efficiency in the applications, and that's why you need 
more information to reduce some of these information barriers. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to move some. Maria, you have three questions to ask. I'm going to ask you to be brief. That means yes. you get to pick and choose. I'll be brief. So about uh, pre anticipation effects, the law was passed at the beginning of 2015, but it was conditioned on seniority at mid-2014. So schools had, would have had to react at the beginning of the 2014 school year in anticipation of that. And we don't see any pretrends, and it's consistent with they're not being able to, to, to do that. Then the other question, we compare teachers with three and two years of experience, like in a repeated cross-section fashion. So if there's differences in turnover by experience, that would be captured in the pre-trend in, in the previous years. So we, we control for that in that way. I don't know if I, if I answered your question. And for you, the net effect, I would say like, on the one hand, you're lowering turnover, uh, which is good, but, of, but you want to lower the turnover of the good teachers, not of the bad. And it's actually like costly. You're retaining people forever in the system who have bad performance. Um, and so my recommendation to policymakers would be like, perhaps you want to have these dismissal protection type contracts, which is a very common civil servant uh, feature, but you should do this based on performance and not seniority, which is like, something that it's, uh, unions pressure for, but it's very costly to do. Great, go <laughs> Before I go to you, Ricardo, just an update on panel structure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spend the next few minutes wrapping up Q&A on the Latin American teacher career structure papers. And then for the last 20 minutes, we'll get Jelmeth her 15 minutes to present and do Q&A for her. Um, yes, so accidentally segregating the papers, but yeah, um, actually, Ricardo, I'm going to take a question from Barbara Bruns because I know she's written about, I think, pretty much every topic here in most of the countries. Mm -hmm. And then we'll, we'll come to you, I promise. Yeah, Barbara, go ahead. Um, oh, I didn't see Barbara. Uh, it's still not working. So. Yeah, just still not working. Okay, I'll speak loud. Um, one of the things that there is some degree of evidence, including from Ricardo's earlier work on the telesecundaria uh, questions when the, there's a partial towards the rural based hiring. But one thing that's striking about the Latin American cases is that the, the main, the only filter for teacher quality is at the point of taking these, you know, hiring tests. And, you know, one thing you see in Peru, Ecuador is it's very low pass rates. So if you contrast Latin America with other, you know, high, you know, highly developed countries that have great education system, Finland, you know, East Asian countries, there's a lot of filtering is high quality, and there's some cases like those uh, uh, exit exams for teachers to, to get a degree. So Chile is the only country of the Europe group that I think has been working actively on that issue to try to restrict the number of teacher training schools to make sure that they're qualified. And so uh, is there anything like that happening in the other countries? And uh, and what, well, how would you assess the impact in Chile so far? Um, anyone else want to jump in on this round? Because it's likely the last opportunity for asking questions. Yep, go ahead. The microphone is working now. <laughs> Progress. Uh, yeah, I'm going to start with the question about the um, thank you for the three papers. I had a I had a question. Well, a uh, question for Maria and question for for Ricardo, which is a political economy question. Uh, you both sort of swept the political economy under the rug, and I wanted to hear a little bit more uh, about um, why in Chile they chose to use um, performance uh, seniority and not performance, um, and why it was such a struggle to implement in some states in Mexico and not. And a very like simple empirical question related to that: um, How noisy? is performance year on year within a uh, teacher. Okay, so I'm gonna give Ricardo prime, the prime place for answering. And then we have in total four minutes. So then Maria and Gregory, you'll have to fight it out for the last couple of minutes, but yeah. So trying to, to go to Barbara's question and making a connection with, with, with the last one. So I, I would say we cannot take for granted that Latin American countries are going to keep moving towards more professional uh, uh, civil service systems that look like those in the developed countries. There, is, there was certainly a trend away which we observed, and many of us have studied, in which they are adopting uh, systems to regulate entry into teaching uh, profession. And as you say in Chile, entry into the uh, teaching and uh, training schools. 
But for example, in Mexico, in 2018, the reform that I was uh, discussing, even though there is evidence of the important effect on teacher quality, was canceled when a new administration came from. And that uh, relates to the political economy question. It was very unpopular with the union. Two reasons. One is the discretion of the previous discretionary system was uh, criticized for uh, abuse of discretion that would lead to selling of position, to hiring of relatives, of teachers who are as part of the system, and as part of a political machinery which, in which the union would play an important role in politics. So it was a bold reform to take. This reform included not only uh, evaluations to entry the professions, but also to stay in the profession, which was um, very unpopular with the union. And, 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 a new, and a presidential candidate was able to manage this anger and finish this reform. And I think, to me, in, in a more uh, general way, one important lesson of the Mexican experience is that you may have reforms that are technically very good. And I think this reform, if you look at it technically, it was designed very well. I mean, but then you have to make it as important or more. How do you create? the political environment in which there are stakeholders that are going to support this new equilibrium. And that's key. And even when I was talking about implementation, but at the beginning of this reform, there were several implementation errors that made teachers uncertain about their future in a way that the, the reform didn't contemplate and that increased the opposition. So I think implementation and the political economy, the, the part, the work of creating a coordination and a dialogue that create that helps to support these reforms are key. Okay, thanks Ricardo. So Maria Gregory, 30 seconds each. You go. Oh, are you sure? <laughs> yes. Uh, just to address Barbara's question, I think it's really important. So there are trade-offs between focusing on uh, the quality of pre-service training. Places like Peru, they didn't focus on that, probably because of the political economy. It's really difficult. Institutions have autonomy, so they focused on selecting teachers into the profession. And so in Chile, they, they, they kind of are doing both uh, in both now. But there's also a trade-off. For example, in Ecuador, uh, at a few years back, they closed some of the institutos pedagogicos. Um, and this had a, an impact on access on, on the supply. So in some areas in Ecuador, you don't have teacher training institutes. They have to go to Cuenca or Quito especially for teachers in the Amazon. So I think there's a trade-off and, um, and it, it depends a lot on the political economy. And answering the question over there about the political economy, what I think happened is that they just emulated a regularization process that happened in like 1999. So they just hopped onto that previous law and said, let's change instead of 1999 is 2014. Uh, so that's one reason why they did it based on seniority. And I just think like, probably political pressure there was like a, they were changing the, the teaching career at that time and i think maybe it's like just to give a concession this is my personal opinion to give a concession to the unions and stuff or something like in this already moment in which they're implementing a lot of reforms that could have been something and on your question of the noisiness of the teaching evaluations I have i'm gonna ask you to take that I to the coffee cut break. It now. That's fine. thank you so much <laughs> ricardo maria gregory and we're gonna go to delnit online delnit are you ready i hope we can hear you this time Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm so, so relieved okay. to hear. Thank you. All Wonderful. yours. Great. Thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to be presenting here. My name is Jelnit Kaur, and I'm a PhD candidate at uh, Teachers College on the job market this year. So this paper is about our teachers' beliefs and how these beliefs impact behaviors and student learning. So to begin with, it's empirically established that teachers effort is a strong determinant of learning. Systematic reviews of evidence point out that teacher-driven interventions are the most effective for improving learning as opposed to interventions led by, say, schools, communities, or technology. And it's not just the selection margin per se. We also know that teacher effort has a direct and causal link with student learning. However, do teachers themselves think that their effort matter matters for learning? Unfortunately, no. Surveys across multiple developing countries show a consistent pattern. A high share report that their effort has limited impacts on student learning. And so to give you a flavor of what these beliefs 
look like in the survey data. The figure on the left is um, summarizing data from nine developing countries. Uh, this is work by Shwetlana Sabarwal and others. On an average, 40% of teachers either agree or strongly agree with the statement on top, which says there is little I can do to help a student learn if parents are uneducated. On the right is data from the Young Lives Survey. More than 60% of teachers in India agree I am very limited in what I can achieve because a student's home environment is a large influence on his or her achievement. And this is also consistent with anecdotal evidence presented uh, in Pritchett 2013. It's not uncommon in these settings for teachers and even school leaders to publicly admit that disadvantages at the student level are difficult to overcome. And so therefore teachers have a limited role to play. And so why should we care? This is a concern because we know that these are settings with high shares of disadvantaged learners. And we also know that beliefs about the productivity of one's effort are important for influencing effort and investment decisions. So in this slide, these, these, uh, this descriptive evidence generates worrying implications for teacher effort learning. A person standing in the front of the room believes that my effort does not matter, then it's, it's hard to uh, see how, how that will uh, actually translate into real effort. So in this paper, I ask two research questions. One, are teachers' beliefs about the productivity of their effort malleable? Can we change them? And two, how does targeting these beliefs impact teacher effort and student learning? To answer these questions, I use a field experiment in India across a rural school chain. And to target teachers' beliefs about the influence of their effort, I use a psychosocial intervention, which is grounded in positive psychology, to specifically use to target beliefs about the mapping between effort and learning. So the setting I work in is with Akal Academy schools in Northern India. I work with 83 schools, 292 teachers and 6,000 plus students. Um, I randomize within schools at the teacher level. Uh, given the variation in assignment status within schools, there's a risk of potential spillovers. So because teachers in the setting are typically more likely to interact with their colleagues from adjacent grades, I attempt to reduce the risk of spillovers by including teachers only in the non-adjacent grades. So for this study, we have math teachers from grades two, four, six, and eight. And so the intervention that I use to target teachers beliefs about perceived control is a psychosocial intervention de developed by World Being, which is a nonprofit that has that develops evidence-based modules grounded in positive psychology for disadvantaged populations. Also, this intervention has been used by uh, Mary McElvey in another setting outside education and has been found to be effective in influencing people's uh, self-efficacy and locus of control. So in practice, what the intervention looks like, it's a medium touch intervention. It's a five week training with two sessions per week conducted remotely over Zoom after school. The treatment group receives the psychosocial intervention. Um, and this intervention, essentially the curriculum uses skill building and control enhancing approaches. So as you can see, um, the modules on the left, the, the modules first build awareness of participants about their strengths, the character strengths, and then also impart skills such as goal setting, problem self solving to help them develop more confidence about their abilities to influence outcomes. Um, and off note, the curriculum has no discussion about teaching skills or classroom practices. This is to minimize the scope for experimental demand effects. So this training is packaged as a general training for pers personality development of teachers. Um, while the, uh, I also have a placebo group that receives a training in the similar structure and format, but with uh, purely informational content uh, unrelated to personal development. So the study was conducted over the academic year 22-23 with four rounds of data collection at baseline. Um, I had the intervention around in September, followed by three rounds of end line, uh, one month after the intervention, three months later, and then six months later. And each data collection round involved 
uh, in-person visits by field team, collecting teacher surveys, conducting classroom observations, um, while also collecting administrative data on student learning. So a core challenge um, in this area is the measurement of beliefs. Using self-reports may not always be credible because teachers have an incentive to misreport. So to incentivize truthful elicitation, I devise a novel real stakes task using a multiple priceless procedure. So what I do is I ask teachers to make a sequence of contract choices to receive a bonus at the end of the year. And each choice is between a flat bonus or receiving a performance linked bonus that links payoff with test score improvements of low performing students. And the choices can keep the flat pay option fixed, but incrementally increase the stakes of the performance pay contract. So the idea is I use information on the switching points to elicit teachers' beliefs about how much control they perceive over education production. And to make sure that teachers understand this task, I uh, walk them through guided examples and a sample question along with comprehension checks uh, for um, to ensure that they understand the task. So this is the choice that was presented to teachers. As you can see on the left, um, is a fixed amount of rupees 1,000, which is unconditional. On the right is, is double the amount, rupees 2,000, but with strings attached. It's conditional on increasing test score of a low-performing student in the classroom by some amount. And as you go down the rows, what's changing is the amount of test score increase required for the payment to be received. So in practice, teachers choose the right-hand side option for the initial few rounds and then switch to the left, left-hand side option at some point. And, and I use this switching point as a revealed preference measure of how much teachers believe they can influence student learning. So how many uh, test score points do they believe they can influence through their effort alone? So one concern is that this choice could be capturing maybe risk preferences, which beyond teachers' beliefs about their abilities. And so to tackle that, I also independently measure risk attitudes and control for these. Um, moving on to effort, I capture multiple dimensions of effort. First, I um, capture effort at the extensive margin by collecting data on teacher attendance. Uh, second, I capture effort at the intensive margin by conducting classroom observations. So these observations are conducted by trained observers um, who score teachers on objective measures of effort, which are hard to manipulate on the spot. So I, um, I basically curate uh, a classroom observation tool adapted from uh, multiple international instruments um, and extensively piloted in the setting. Uh, I also pre-registered this tool and uh, combine all the measures into a single summary index on which uh, I examine the impact. Uh, thirdly, um, as an additional measure of effort, which is not subject to Hawthorne effects, I also conduct reviews of homework notebooks of students. So this is a, essentially capturing a measure of past effort. Um, and these notebooks are scored for whether these are checked, the kind of feedback that's provided, whether it's detailed feedback or just generic feedback, um, whether it's encouraging feedback uh, or, or, or neutral. And fourthly, I also collect data on time use and whether teachers engage in after school tutoring. So moving on to the results. Um, so first of all, the experimental integrity that the randomization balanced most observables at the teacher and student level at baseline, except for teacher education, which I control for in all my specifications. Um, attendance tracking shows compliance with experimental assignment. On an average, teachers attended 50% of the sessions and attendance was balanced across both the groups. Um, the, the, the first result on teachers' beliefs, so I find that the intervention shifted beliefs as capital by the reveal preference measure. So here, my dependent variable is the switching point, the row in which the participant switched from the uh, performance linked option to the, to the flat pay option. I see that treated teachers have later switching points compared to control teachers. And this is even after controlling for risk preferences. 
And so this effect translates to around 1.5 points on the test, which is around 7% of a standard deviation for student test scores. In other words, treated teachers are more confident about their ability to increase test scores by an additional 7% of a standard deviation. And relative to the control group, this is a 23% increase in confidence. Um, Moving on to effort, I do not see any effects on the extensive margin of effort, uh, so, so on attendance, but of note, attendance is already much higher in this setting. Um, these are private schools, although these are rural and operate in low resource context, these are private schools, so the attendance is already high. Um, I see strong positive effects at the intensive margin of effort as captured by the pre-registered summary index of effort. I see that treated teachers score 0.13 standard deviations higher on this index, and the effect is significant at the 5% level. And decomposing this effect, I find that um, this is majorly driven by treated teachers exerting more effort at facilitating engagement and also adopting better pedagogical practices. So I had measures in the tool uh, capturing effort at facilitating eng engagement, such as whether the teacher um, makes an attempt to engage the backbenchers in the class, um, how many students are called out by name. So it seems that um, treated teachers are more likely to uh, make efforts at um, engaging students in their classroom. Um, Further, I find I find positive effects of 0.1 standard deviation on grading effort, and this is majorly driven by treated teachers providing more detailed question level feedback to students. Um, moving to time use, so I asked teachers to report um, how report the time that they spent on an average day uh, on four different activities. I do not see any effects on class preparation, time spent on class preparation, but I, I see that treat, treatment teachers spend more time, around eight minutes Hello? additional time checking notebooks Jonathan. compared to control teachers. Yes. Sorry, just, just a warning, you've got one minute and 50 seconds. Okay. Okay, um, so moving on to the most important results on student learning, I see that students taught by treated teachers score 0 0.08 standard deviations higher in the end of year exams. These exams are independently proctored and externally graded. Um, and moreover, I find that these learning gains are broad based. So even though the incentives are geared towards the bottom half, the gains are broad based, both the bottom half and the top half of the distribution gain from the intervention. I do not see any heterogeneity by student demographics. Uh, did the intervention impact other channels apart from beliefs? I do not see any effects on mental health, growth mindset, or teachers' expectations of students. But um, on the contrary, I find that beliefs are a more plausible mechanism as corroborated by additional measures um, captured in the self-reports as well. So to conclude, um, this, this work finds that teacher, teachers' beliefs can serve as a powerful lever for changing teaching practice and raising learning levels. I find that teachers' beliefs about how much their effort matters are malleable, and that targeting these beliefs raises teacher effort and leads to broad-based gains in student learning. Um, a direct policy implication of this work is for teacher professional development programs in developing countries. Typically, it's found that teacher training programs don't work, and it's, it's not clear why these don't work. Um, this work, through this work, I propose perceived control or beliefs about the mapping between effort and outcome as one explanation for um, uh, the ineffectiveness of these programs. And this also suggests potential for scaling, um, scaling up these training programs through large scale professional development um, curriculum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect timing. Okay, um, I'm gonna stay here for Q&A, so hopefully the cameras can show John with the whole room. Um, John, if we're just gonna take one round of questions first, and then we'll go from there. Sorry, more tech difficulties. Okay, I see one question here, and then we'll go here. Any, anyone on the side of the room? Okay, and then Devyani over there. So let's start here. Hey, hi, Jalnit, great presentation and great study. Um, I was wondering if you have collected data on like dosage effects, like for example, 
data on whether teachers turn their Zoom like camera on, how attentive they were in the Zoom like sessions, because it would be interesting to see if there are dosage effects associated with the treatment, like teachers who were more attentive, either like in terms of just their attendance or by more engagement, if they had a stronger treatment effect. Great, thank you. And there's one over here. Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I was wondering if you had any comments on the generalizability of these results, given if these teachers are being, if the intervention is happening in 2022 and 2023, teacher beliefs may be quite low after the pandemic anyways, um, considering their effect on students in comparison to the home effects. Great. And then we had Devyani. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jalan. It's very interesting presentation. Just a quick question on you. When you, in the beginning you alluded to the fact that teachers' beliefs of how students perform are based a bit on their background, right? And we know in India that means you come from a certain community or from a certain certain socioeconomic background. So, did you analyze that? Because I know you went quickly over your demographic slides. I wasn't able to see what you looked at there. Was there any effect uh, based on students' socioeconomic background or which caste? Uh, they come from, I think, very clear in, in Punjab that that demarcation is there. Okay, thanks. And Jonathan, because you only have one opportunity given time, I'm so sorry to answer this. I'm going to take one final question and make it very quick. Just okay. Uh, hi, Jalneet. Uh, first of all, brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, just wanted to ask a question. So it, uh, the treatment also involved some sort of financial, like the incentivization was financial in nature uh, with which the teachers, you were measuring how teacher effort changes at each milestone. Uh, wondering, uh, and this was a low cost private school setting, uh, I'm assuming, um, something like this to replicate, and this is a generalizability point, how, could, how would you replicate it across a say a public school setting in India where this kind of incentivization won't be possible and does it also mean that any other for form of incentive we would be able to detect similar sort of uh, effect so you're just wondering about that. Okay great John if you can see people are very excited about your work bodes well for the job market but just pick and choose yeah you have one and a half minutes I'm so sorry. Thank you for all the questions and thank you for so much uh, engagement and interest uh, in my work. Um, okay, starting with the first question on dosage, I do collect data on uh, um, the degree of participation, whether uh, 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 teachers switch on their Zoom cameras and um, how much they are uh, active in the chat, but I'm yet to analyze this, uh, but that's a great suggestion. Um, so so this is these results are forthcoming. Uh, on the generalizability bit, um, uh, so I think the first question was about this is 2020, 2022, uh, 23, and uh, teachers' beliefs might have been lowered due to COVID. So the motivating data that I showed earlier was, was from 2016, 17 Young Lives and also from the last decade collected by Shvetlana Sabarwal. So it seems like those beliefs were independently low before COVID and they might have gone down further. Um, and um, to the extent that this intervention works, I think this this um, the fact that uh, COVID could have led to a, a downward shift in these beliefs. It just raises um, possibilities for, for higher scope for such interventions uh, in the future. Um, and then coming to the question about um, SES and CAST, uh, I do not find any heterogeneity in uh, effects on student learning by SES. However, I was not able to get access to data on CAST. So this was not available in the school registers. But um, apart from that, I, I did have um, data on other student demographics, uh, in, uh, also whether um, they were receiving financial assistance. And I do not see any uh, heterogeneity in effects uh, by, by those characteristics. So it seems like everyone across the distributions to, to gain uh, from this intervention. Fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you to everyone for a wonderful discussion. So on to coffee and conversations, and we're back in half an hour. 11 o'clock on the dot. 11 o'clock on the dot. Thank you.
Yeah. I'll come find you after. Great that you could come. second session please take your seats um, I'd like to apologize for ringing bells at you um, I am sorry I know it creates a, a vibe of, of being back at school maybe that's not such a bad thing for the rise conference but we, we really want to maximize the time we have to hear from the people that are coming to speak to us and to get Q&A and so we don't want to lose time trying to herd cats so apologies um, so this is the second of our sessions on teachers, and it connects to one of the messages that came out of RISE, which was about the importance of supporting teaching. But we already heard about that in the first session, which was the need to think carefully about teacher careers and how that might interact with teacher motivation. We're now going to move on to think more explicitly about supporting teaching through teacher training. And we're going to hear from four, well, actually, three papers about teacher training. We're going to hear from, the, the order has changed slightly from on the programme. We're going to hear first from Salman, who's going to talk to us about training for leadership. Then we're going to hear from Paul, who's going to tell us, Paul Glover, who's going to tell us um, about uh, training of teachers themselves. And then we're going to hear from Lindsay, who's going to think about uh, diagnosing a diagnostic tool for studying the teacher management system in general. I'm going to see contrasting results in terms of positive impacts versus null impacts. Then we have a paper from James, where is James at the back there, which we have to confess is not on the subject of teachers <laughs> or training. You may have spotted that from the title, but we loved it and we wanted to get it on and um, it's in this session. That's, I can't really do anything other than that. But um, So we will take questions on all four papers at the end, but bear that, bear that in mind. Okay, straight over to Simon. You have 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Claire. Uh, hi, everyone. It's very nice to be back in this room. And thank you for the opportunity to present this work. Uh, this is joint work uh, with Stefan Durkan and Donna. Donna is in the room. And uh, Ravinder Kasligera at the World Bank. So I think this is something which you all are very familiar with in terms of like the role of school leadership. In the, um, in the quality of schooling. So the, this paper is set in a particular context. So I will give you a little bit of background on the contextual side. So we are looking at the school leadership program in sub-Saharan Africa in a very small country, Malawi, which has like very, uh, which has a set of issues since it introduced free primary education in 1994. So the education system expanded and then the system is catching up. And we know that the school leadership from the literature plays a central role 
in improving outcomes through multiple channels. But most of the evidence is coming from the middle income and the high income countries in terms of like better allocation of resources, innovations in pedagogical techniques, and the teacher and the head teachers can do a lot in order to improve the school climate and enable a learning environment for, for the children to do better. So, but there are mixed results, even in the high and the middle income country, ranging from very small effect sizes to about 0.425, which is the highest standard deviation effect on the test scores. So I think there are three points that I want to make about the Malawian context, uh, which will guide this presentation. Uh, number one is that there are unresolved issues, so it's very difficult to move the needle in the context where structurally the system hasn't caught up with the enrollment. I think uh, Lance's work was there that schooling uh, without learning, so there is a need to do some work on enrollment without schooling, so which is basically you have enrolled the kids before the schools have arrived on the scene, so you don't have the classrooms and the teachers. So you can see that in terms of the outcomes, no matter which test instrument you look at, about 25% of the students are meeting minimum proficiency in terms of like student achievement. Um, one of the tests that is included is the one that we will be using, which is a Malawi Longitudinal School Survey, which by is kind of like outcomes at the standard four level. So what, what is happening in Malawi A, that the resource distribution is very poor. So 20, 25% of the schools basically sit on all the resources. So 80% have very fewer resources, but within the schools itself, there's a problem of inefficiencies and distortions where the teachers are not using what is available uh, to them at the, at the school level. So what we are trying to do here, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. So this is the education production function and you have the classrooms and teachers and the student test scores. So what we are doing through a, uh, through a large scale program in Malawi is to both tackle the binding constraints to learning overall at the system level, and then to have specific intervention, i.e. the school leadership training program in order to improve the efficiency of resource use. So A, you want to try to move the frontier, given that the resources that Malawi's GDP is so low that it will never have the resources that it needs in order to provide the PTRs and the PCRs equivalent to the OECD countries. So in the meantime, what it needs to do is to resource, resource utilization at the school level need to improve. So that will be movement to the frontier. Now there are two ways of moving the frontier itself. One is to invest more in terms of like improve the distribution of the teachers. So that's basically the overall education system can be moved, but that's not like amenable to like a randomized control trial. And we have a paper on that, on moving the education system through targeted kind of like set of reforms to bridge the gap. And we are seeing like convergence taking place. But for today's paper, the presentation is going to focus on moving to the frontier and also trying something on the school culture side in order to move the frontier without more monetary resources, but by kind of like inculcating a school culture that enables learning. So what is the intervention here? That is also important that the context matters in terms of the implementation of these trainings. So when we look at like different interventions that have been tested out on the training programs, the impacts are uh, uh, quite heterogeneous. And the reason for that is the how you motivate the intervention. So in this context, I think we relied on the head teachers focus group discussions in order to identify the weaknesses in the system. And we also used like descriptive data, which was collected, which sets the baseline for this intervention as well. Uh, the, the Malawi longitudinal survey, the first round of that data, that gave us information in terms of what are the binding constraints that the head teachers face 
So head teacher is just assigned to be a head teacher one day without knowing the TORs, what it means to be a head teacher. So in that particular context, when you turn up to the job, what is the expectation? So there is no expectation except for the fact that you are doing some record bookkeeping uh, on day-to-day -day basis, but you are not engaging in the issues and trying to address those issues at the, at the school level. So the standard training kind of like responds to those issues of inefficiencies that are there that can easily be addressed by the head teacher. For instance, like assigning the teachers to lower grade uh, uh, classes instead of like those being stacked up at the, uh, at the upper primary level or the textbooks. Textbooks sit in kind of like uh, storerooms and they are not brought into the classrooms at times. So it's not the shortage of the textbooks, it's the utilization of the textbooks that is an issue that creates inefficiency. And then overall, an environment like if, the, if there is peer-to-peer -peer bullying, students cannot uh, ask questions and uh, the treatment of overage girls within the system is kind of like biased, that will create kind of like an environment where the test scores come down. Uh, key thing to note is that standard four classroom in Malawi is more or less a multi-level classroom. 20% of the class cannot do seven minus four, but is sitting in, seven, uh, in standard four. So when you have that kind of heterogeneity within the classroom, the interventions on average are not likely to yield uh, very, very significant impact. So that's also when we discuss the results, something to bear in mind. So the longitudinal school survey, I think that's the central piece of like identifying the constraints to learning within Malawi. Because previously the, the lens through which we look at these issues is just the education management information system data and that does not give us the nuance. So the classic example is like using a 1990 camera to take a snapshot and then you ask for precision in terms of where to target the resources that's not going to happen because you're using an old tool in order to address kind of like a problem of uh, uh, resource targeting. So the more nuanced the tools are in terms of collecting the data and you have like better measurement on the outcome variables, you're going to be able to target resources better. So standard randomized control trial for the school leadership program. There are two cohorts. The second cohort is added uh, when we, uh, again, identifying like the weaknesses in the system through the data that were not uh, noted in the first round of the intervention. So the first round of intervention is administered to 800 school. So it's an intensive training program with uh, 10 days of classroom training and then going back to the schools, giving them refresher training and seeing if they are uh, uh, adopting the behaviors that are taught in that training program. Then there is an augmented intervention, which basically looks at areas which are not previously covered, which is basically the attitude towards the mindsets, towards girl students, towards uh, overage students in, in the classroom and peer-to-peer -peer bullying issues. So basically giving them videos of like what good teachers are doing in terms of positive behavior and how they can inculcate that kind of culture in, 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 the, in the school setting. So randomization, okay. So I think uh, on the identification, because this is a longitudinal sample, so the key concern will be that how many students we are able to track. So there is no differential attrition between the two groups, between the treatment and the control groups. 80% of the teachers are tracked and 85% of the students are tracked on average at the school level. So impact of this uh, standard intervention. So our hypothesis is that it will basically reduce like the reputation rate and improve the test scores. We see improvements in the reputation rate only at the lower primary level, uh, uh, which is uh, significant. We have kind of like done the multiple hypothesis testing correction for the standard errors. On the test scores about like 0.1, standard deviation improvement, which is kind of like the ball range that we see in the, in, in the training interventions, uh, more so in the math scores 
and uh, less so on the English scores. But there is heterogeneity in terms of these treatment effects. So if I cut the data on the class sizes, so class size is an important predictor. So if you're not, if you're teaching them at 150 class size and you're doing a leadership training program, it's not going to have an impact that is uh, uh, quite intuitive. So the, the lower the class sizes, you can see that the higher uh, the impacts even on the English scores. Again, the baseline scores also matter. So if you have student population, which is highly disadvantaged, uh, head teacher training is not going to lead you to kind of like resolve, resolve those issues. So what are the mechanisms through which these changes are taking place? So we, we had like the modules uh, related to the theoretical framework on the resource utilization, teacher management, teacher effort, practices. All these are in indices form. We don't see any impact only on the tangible mechanism, like where we said that you're teaching very few hours to the Malawian kid, like two, two and a half hours of teaching. So that message kind of like resulted in concrete changes in terms of like how they approach the remedial classes. So you see the remedial classes kind of like 20% improvements. Uh, just, uh, just a caveat there that teacher management and resource utilization are positively improving, but they are not significant. So again, you need like 20% improvement in order 20 to 30% improvement with the sample sizes and power in order for it to be statistically significant. So it's not very easy to kind of like decode the channel here. Uh, then breaking down the remedial classes, both the share of grades that they do the remedial classes and the frequency of the remedial classes, both have gone up as a result of the intervention. Augmented intervention, the dosage that we gave, showed them the videos in terms of improving the behaviors, that didn't seem to have an impact on the mindsets or the belief shift. So our hypothesis is that it was a too low dosage that like one off session showing them that and also the timing of it, that it came right uh, when COVID started. So they were pulled in many different directions after they had gone back to school. The details of these indices are there in the paper and Donna is also here. So she can also talk about the, uh, about the indices, how they are constructed. So what, what is the takeaway from this paper? I think uh, two takeaways. One is the descriptive work is very important in education systems research. If we want to take implementation seriously, we need to have like very rigorous parameters of collection of data and in terms of uh, uh, the quality and reliability of the data. So most of the data that we use in Sub-Saharan Africa from the education systems is uh, is noisy and it, it 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 is difficult to have like very precise interventions developed. Um, the second thing is in terms of like uh, the head teacher leadership program helped in the catch up story in terms of like the students which were at the bottom benefited the most. But you need to have like an environment. You need to have a classroom and a teacher there before those effects can kind of like come, come into play. Um, we are surprised to see no impact because bullying was an issue that was identified and the beliefs of students and all the focus group discussions pointed out in that direction. And I think the team, uh, the authors will learn a little bit in terms of like from the audience that uh, why uh, elicitation of the beliefs is not showing an impact. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, I'm Paul Glebe, and let me just see if this is gonna work. Okay, great. All right, so um, I think the previous presentation by someone was a, maybe an optimistic story. So with some balance here, we have a very pessimistic story, as you can see from the title, about what can we learn from an unsuccessful teacher program? Uh, in this, in the case of Nepal, I've been to many RISE conferences, usually presenting on Vietnam, but this is a different thing that we've been working on. And my two co-authors, Julie Schaffner at Tufts University 
and Utam Sharma, a former student of mine who now works in Nepal. Okay. Um, so just a brief overview of what we do in the paper. Uh, we have RCT for kind of a standard in-service teacher training program um, where the teachers like leave their schools and come to these training centers and spend two weeks learning all these things. We're looking at math and science teachers in grades nine and 10. Um, we collected a lot of data here. Um, you can see the bullet points there. I won't read them off for you, but, and, but it's very useful because as you see in the bottom bullet, this program did, had no effect, okay? In fact, the only thing significant was negative. Um, and so this is almost like an autopsy when you like the patient dies, what killed the patient? You know, maybe we'd like to figure that out so we don't kill some more. Um, so uh, that kind of gives you an overview, but let me go into um, a little bit about this. It's an RCT. So we had, actually we were supposed to have 204 schools, but there was one area where there, we we're gonna pick four schools, but they only had three schools. So we have 203. Um, these in Nepal, the schools are kind of uh, like in some other countries in South Asia, they go from one through 10, grades one through 10 or one through 12. So they don't really separate so much between primary and secondary. Um, so of these 203 schools, we randomly assigned 102, almost half of them to a treatment. Um, and we had two versions of it. And then the other 101 are controls, okay? And the two versions of treatment, uh, I'll talk mostly about the first one. The second one, we, we added, uh, a kind of video assignment or video assessment where we ask the teachers to take videos of themselves doing what they were trained to do. Um, it turned out that the difference between these two was very small, not significant at all. So we just kind of lumped them together because the sample size is not as large as we'd like, okay? Um, we did this, it, this was pretty much a nationwide representative sample. There were a few districts that were remote and one that was sort of politically unstable that we didn't go to, but we went, we we were able to randomly pick 16 districts out of six, 65 of Nepal's 77 districts. Um, I'll show you a map in a second. And um, two thirds of these schools that we picked were ones that hadn't had much training at all in the previous uh, training program that was done like five years earlier. Okay, so here's the map. You can see in red, the, the 16 districts, which we randomly picked from out of those 65, they're spread throughout the country. Um, the ones that are really remote and mountainous were not really in this, um, just couldn't get to them, but it's close to represent. I think 95% of the schools in Nepal were in our randomization. Okay, I'm kind of going fast here because uh, I can see a timer looking at me right there. Okay, um, this, this picture kind of shows you the obvious thing where we have the 203 study schools. We broke them up uh, into 102 that were got what we call phase one, which is the program. Phase two, 101, those are the control group because that, um, that was gonna happen later so we could use them as control group. And then for the 102 schools that were in the program, we, we kind of divide them up with and without this video assignment, this VA, and it didn't really make any difference. So everything I'm gonna show you today is we're just combining those two programs uh, together. Okay, um, this slide just shows you a little bit about the sample design. Um, why did we pick this? Well, we had a, you know, like everybody, we had a budget limit, so we couldn't really get as many schools as we wanted to, but this seemed to be a good uh, size to get at, uh, you know, an impact of 0.2 standard deviations. Um, as you'll see later, we can actually say very clearly that we did not get 0.2 standard deviations. Um, and uh, yeah, so, and the bottom bullet there is just saying that those ones that had the video assignment, they were pretty much the same as the other ones, so we're just gonna lump them together. Okay, so what is exactly that we're doing? So this is pretty much a standard uh, old school teacher training program, um, which uh, if you look at what people have written up, I'm thinking of um, Dave Evans and other people, they pretty much say these don't work very well, okay? Um, but why do they don't work? We'll talk, that's sort of a part of the contribution here. But so they had these uh, ETCs, these education training centers where the teachers would come for 10 days of training. Um, we're talking about grade nine and 10 math and science teachers here. And what are they being trained in anyway? So basically trying to teach them to use more active demonstration type um, teaching methods. For example, for the math teachers, they will like to teach trigonometry. They'd say, okay, there's a tree over there. It's this 
you know, measure the angle here between the base of the tree and the top of the tree, and we're standing this far away, how tall is the tree? That's one kind of a demonstration thing, where they would go to a, a local bank and ask them what the interest rates, have the kids ask the uh, bank people what the interest rate is, and they do some math problems with that interest rate. So they tried to make this more interactive and more demonstrations. And for science, uh, they would bring in like plants when they're talking about plant thing, you know, a plant in a pot, I guess. And there was another thing that was, that was kind of interesting, like to teach astronomy, um, they would take an umbrella and paint like the stars and whatever else is up in the sky there on the umbrella. And part of this was like, uh, also mentioned you're losing local materials, trying to, to like have the teachers show, have these physical objects to show the class to make it more interesting. Okay, so, you know, that probably sounds like a good idea. Um, you know, maybe some people disagree with that, we'll see. Um, anyway, so the NCED, the National Center for Education Development is in charge of the training teachers in Nepal. Actually, they've, they've now completely changed the structure. So I'm not even sure that it exists anymore. But during this time, that's who did it. Um, the teachers were, um, in theory, you know, kind of held accountable in the sense that they were graded on whether they actually showed up for the training and whether they participated. And in terms of, you know, they're getting a promotion to the next level of teaching, you know, this would help count for that. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So we collected a lot of data, both qualitative and quantitative data here. And we think it worked pretty well. I mean, this slide just shows you that, yeah, the qualitative data, which me is, and many of you as economists were not really trained to, to work with, um, help us to actually design our questionnaires and also understand like what happened here. Uh, why did this not work very well? Um, so we advise it. One of the things that really worked well is that uh, we interviewed most of the teachers that were trained and most of the trainers who were training them by phone it was very cheap. We just got the phone numbers and called them up. So that turned out to be a very nice thing to understand what's going on. So that's the last bullet there. Okay. Um, okay. So um, just to kind of, oh, our, the test that we use, um, we had, since these are math and science teachers, we tested kids both at baseline when they were in grades eight and nine and at end line at the end of grades nine and 10 for uh, their math and science skills. Um, and we had some very, we had some questions in the test that focused on exactly what the teacher training was about and other ones that were more general. Um, and because we knew that the students weren't so good in many ways, many of the students, we asked some questions that were way below the, the grade nine and grade 10 curriculum, okay? And um, in terms of implementation, here's another lesson. The, the baseline test, we just asked local people to design them. Um, it didn't work out very well. So for the end line test, we brought in some sort of international people to work with the local people and that seemed to work a lot better. Okay. Um, all right. So that's about the assessments that that's our basic, our outcome that we're looking at in terms of measuring teacher practices um, to see whether they really change them or not. Um, we first had some classroom observations uh, using the Stallings method, which if I were doing it today, I probably wouldn't use it, but Barbara can tell us the, the new latest thing with teacher observations. Um, and then we asked the teachers themselves to do, what did you do? How do you teach and stuff like that? Then we also asked the head teachers, the school principals and the students themselves, like tell us like what the teachers were doing. Um, so we have lots of data on what the teachers were doing. Okay. And then um, we also measured teachers subject knowledge of math and science, because we want to know if they actually learn because part of the training is not just to make you a better teacher, but it makes sure you actually know the math and science you're supposed to be teaching. Um, and it's very, very uh, touchy, you know, to like ask teachers to take tests, you know, because they're worried that they might get punished or something if they don't do well on the tests. And in Nepal, like many countries, has a strong teachers union. So how could we really test the teachers? Um, we didn't think after talking to people that they'd be willing to take a test and like have their name assigned to the test. Um, so we kind of did two things. First of all, we gave this uh, teachers this, what effectively was a test, but they didn't have to write their names, okay? So we have a school with, you know, some math and science teachers and, and you know, maybe if, if one did bad, they, they say, okay, that wasn't me, that was the other person maybe. So you can't really um, hold them accountable. But secondly, we didn't really say we're testing you. We said, okay, we're testing the kids. And so here are the questions that we're asking. Here are some of the questions on the test of the kids. And we want you to tell us if you think this is a good test question or not. So we say like, what do you think, um, 
you know, is this a, a fair one to ask the kids, you know? And then the, the key one is we said, you know, what do you think the test designer was thinking as the correct answer for this question? You know, so basically supposed to say, what's the correct answer for this question? And so that's what we focus on, what they said, okay? All right, so, um, and then we also had sort of evaluations of, of you know, how, how this thing was implemented. Uh, as I mentioned before, we had these phone calls about, you know, the, with the teachers and this, and actually the education training centers, we called them, not we, because I don't speak Nepalese, but we had people uh, in our group sort of call them and ask them what's going on. Did the teachers show up, you know? Is it starting on time and, and things like this? So we have a lot of uh, um, things on this. And uh, yeah, sometimes it was hard to get information about what was really happening in these education training centers. So we had to call some of these people up multiple times. Okay, but it wasn't very expensive. Um, to make those phone calls. Okay, so here's sort of like the punchline or the, the first punchline, which is that this program did not work. So these are the test scores in, in math and science uh, in grades eight and grade nine. You can see that, so the first column is the, is the numbers. You can see three out of four are negative. Um, none of them are significantly positive. In fact, two of the negative ones are significant at the 10% level, but not at the 5% at the level. So it, this program really did not work very well, despite you know a lot of hopes on the kind of a lot of people. Um, so we can rule out. You see in the the final column here the ninety five percent confidence interval. So for three out of the four tests, we can rule out an effect of 0.1 standard deviations or higher. So this clearly uh, was not very successful. Okay. So then the question is like, why? What happened? What went wrong? I think I've already suggested a few things. So we basically. Um, Oh, this, so before I get to what went wrong, we do some other things. Like we, we focus just on the questions in the exam that were focused on what the training was like, the SSDP training. Um, we also um, look only at, uh, let's see. Yeah, we looked at a set of teachers that didn't have the previous training because, uh, okay, maybe, maybe the reason it didn't have a big effect because a lot of the teachers were trained five years ago. But so we looked at the ones who weren't trained five years ago, doesn't matter. We do uh, local average treatment effects because a lot of the teachers actually didn't show up for the training. Um, so that's like measuring the effect on the teachers who did show up. Nothing significant, okay? It's just, it just didn't work no matter what we try to do. Okay, so why did it fail? Um, well, uh, we can go through in the last two minutes here these five things that you know sort of went wrong, okay? So the first thing that go wrong was really obvious. Half the teachers didn't show up for the training, okay? They were, uh, it was optional. They weren't required to do it. Okay, so um, so why did they not? We actually asked some of them, you know, like what is your experience in past training? And they had a lot of negative things to say about the past training. Okay, um, some of the reasons they didn't show up is because, actually what I mean they didn't show up is I mean at end line, a lot of the teachers had not been trained. Okay, part of it is due to the fact that there's a lot of teacher turnover. So at end line, uh, maybe 20% of the teachers um, are new ones, and so they wouldn't have been around for the training in the first place. But most of them, they were around for it, and they, they didn't apply, they didn't uh, attend, okay? Um, one of the reasons why this happened is that the training took place when the schools were in session, okay? So basically what it means is that your math and science teacher is pulled out for two weeks. So a lot of this head, uh, the school principals, the head teachers would say, no, I'm not letting my teacher go to that. Okay, so that didn't work out very well. But, but this isn't the entire explanation because even when we control for, we just look at the ones who did get the training, it's still no significant effect. So it's a problem, but it's not the only problem, okay? Weak governance of um, the, the ETC centers. Um, we find that uh, the trainers didn't get a lot of preparation for this. Um, they weren't really trained for it. They were just given some materials and didn't give, have much time to look at them. Some of them never got the materials. They didn't have much time, and some of the teachers said, yeah, that uh, they didn't show up or they were not knowledgeable, okay. Um, but it's not the only reason because a lot of the teachers said it was pretty good. At least half of it was good, okay. A third thing, mismatch between trainer content, teacher skill. Um, basically, we talk a lot about teaching at the right level for kids, but there's also made life to some teachers as well. Some of these teachers couldn't answer, didn't do very well. But on the other hand, most of the teachers did pretty well. So some of the teachers really weren't up to it, but okay, there, I just ran out of time. So I've got two more little quick slides here. Um, and then there's weak motivation. Maybe the teachers, <coughs> cool. you know. Wrap, okay. Go ahead. okay, wrap it up. Okay, so anyways, 
that make make uh, motivation. Again, we think that's part of the problem. It's not the main thing. And then, oh, the kids were not really, you know, uh, at the level we wanted them to be at. So uh, that could be part of the problem. But a lot of even the kids who were better didn't do well. In fact, the kids who were better scored worse in the treatment group than in the control group. Okay. So we have last two sort of what what is it that um, we think is both. Okay. Yeah. I'll answer this questions. Uh, I'll we, get we to can this. discuss this. Okay, we can discuss. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay. Uh, Lindsay. Uh, Paul, do you still have the clicker or did you leave it? Fanny? Um, hi, my name is Lindsay Brown. I am a senior uh, research scientist at Global Ties for uh, Education, and I'm going to be um, presenting on behalf of uh, the ERIC Consortium, which is also FCDO funded. It's a multi-year, multi-country um, research program that is focused on education in emergencies in crisis-affected contexts. So that's largely um, the context in which we're going to be talking. I'm also not going to show you any experimental or quasi-experimental results. So just so you know that at the outset. So our program um, it happens in seven focal contexts. Today, uh, I'm going to be talking uh, primarily about research that comes from the country of Jordan. When, uh, from the outset, what we really wanted as part of this consortium is that we work really closely with, um, with organizations that have really strong ties in the places where they're working. And so Common Heritage Foundation is who we partner with in Nigeria. And today um, we're gonna be uh, talking about work that we did in partnership with the Queen Rania Foundation. Okay, so one of our challenges from the outset is we of course wanted, we have this great consortium, we wanted to be able to talk about some research that happens across countries, so we needed some, uh, some of the questions to be comparable across these contexts, but we also really wanted each research agenda to be focused on things that were really salient within those country contexts. And so we had this tension from the outset. How do we, um, how do we design a consortium so that we can speak to the countries um, across them and think about some of these contexts? Uh, but also how do we co-construct in ways that are specific to national priorities. So this was um, what we ultimately decided uh, was our process for constructing the country research agendas. And uh, we went looking for a tool that could help us sort of standardize this approach. How do we identify um, opportunities that are particularly high leverage for interventions in these contexts. And we came across um, the RISE programs tool for diagnos diagnosing systems uh, of education. So I kind of assumed that people would be familiar with this tool before I came to this conference, but now uh, I've, I've updated uh, that expectation. So if you're not familiar with the RISE diagnostic, um, it's, a, it's a looking at, uh, at ways to diagnose systems. And we knew that it had been used in some stable context and it's relatively new as a research tool. So we proceeded along two sort of parallel tracks for this, um, for this research. One, we wanted to use it in the ways that we think it was thought of uh, um, to identify areas that are high leverage for interventions within a context because um, those systems are misaligned or components of those systems are misaligned in some way. But we also wanted to think about it uh, as its suitability for use in conflict-affected contexts. So I'm going to talk about both of those things, its suitability for use in the context or ways in which it might need to be adapted and um, what are some uh, incongruences that we found. So it looks at some major relationships within the education system, politics uh, between citizens and the national government, compact between the government and ministries, management between ministries and schools and teachers, and voice and choice between um, citizens and schools and teachers. 
And then within each of those relationships, there are design elements of the education system. So really quickly, delegation, uh, who tells that person what to do and how, finance, what kind of monetary resources do people have to achieve that goal, uh, information, how do you determine if that person is reaching their goals or not, motivation, did those people want to reach their goals anyway, and support um, what kind of assistance, uh, usually non-monetary, are people given. So I want to also talk a little bit about the country of Jordan. So this is a relatively small, highly centralized country. It is a kingdom. There are about 10 million people and nearly a third of them are refugees. A good proportion of those have been there for a long time. Um, they're Palestinian, but nearly half of them have come since the Syrian war broke out in 2011. Uh, and Unlike a lot of the Palestinians, these are in host communities. So if you're picturing a refugee camp, don't. Uh, they're living in cities in Jordan, definitely within particular regions, um, but they're, they're living among everyone else in the communities in Jordan. This has put a ton of strain on public services, as you might imagine, uh, chief among them, the school system, because all of a sudden their population nearly doubled um, because these kids are by and large integrated into the national school system there. Uh, so in a lot of places, what ended up happening is they, um, instead of, uh, they have built some schools, but largely they've turned their existing schools into two shift systems. So the Jordanians go in the morning and the Syrians go, mostly Syrians, in the afternoon. Um, <clears throat> also, COVID, because of the um, worsening economic conditions, a lot of Jordanians were going to private schools in the system. It pushed even more kids into the public school system. So it became even more crowded than they were before this. Um, I'm going to mostly skip this, but we ended up through a long process focusing on teacher management. So we have interviews and focus groups as our data here for this study. We talked to ministry officials in a bunch of different departments. We talked to supervisors who are um, intending to be coaches. Their role is shifting a little bit. We talked to school principals. We talked to a lot of teachers and some NGOs that are prevalent in the teacher management um, or training field. Um, so this is an annex of the uh, of the RISE diagnostic tool. Uh, we can talk about this later, but basically um, it's for each relationship and then you have the, the design elements and you look at whether there's alignment or not within these various components of the system. Okay, again, I'm gonna talk about both policy and process. So one of the major things that we found is that there were huge policy incongruences between who's teaching the first shift and who's teaching the second shift and how those teachers are managed. There was almost uh, no similarities. So the first shift teachers, these are your permanent civil servant teachers. They're managed nationally by the ministry. They're salaried. They have a, a a rather new, but um, what people would consider pretty good, I think, teacher ranking system with a salary scale. And um, they have in-service training where they can increase their pay. By contrast, they have daily paid teachers who are teaching in the second shift. These are ad hoc management largely by regional ministry officials. Um, they're on either month to month or semester contracts. They have nearly no job security. There's no differentiation differentiation in pay. And a lot of times they have to pay out of pocket for any training or sometimes uh, in this climate, an NGO sponsors their training. But uh, when it's not a crisis uh, context anymore, who knows whether that will happen. Um, for people who are thinking, okay, contract teachers are everywhere. These are not community teachers. I want to be clear. These are fully trained and qualified teachers who are on a wait list to be civil servant teachers. In a lot of cases, because uh, of people who have been grandfathered into the system, they are more trained, more qualified than the current civil servant um, uh, workforce. 
Okay, so here's just some uh, quotes. The morning teachers lock their rooms and you have to see where we sit in a room size of one meter by one meter as if it was a graveyard. And then a second teacher chimes in, we should be lucky we have a share of the bathroom. They even wanted to lock the bathroom and would have done it if we had not objected. So there's a level of tension between these two groups that was really palpable when we did the um, focus groups. They feel like second class citizens, uh, even the teachers, we can talk about the students maybe later. Um, one of the other things that was interesting is there has been this shift in evaluation role, roles. So um, they've been shifting the role of the supervisor uh, into principals. Um, and pedagogical supervisors feel like their authority has been usurped and principals already feel like they had too much to do before. They don't really want this new responsibility. And uh, there's a lack of resources for evaluation follow-up. So they have this new teacher ranking system and uh, they have this evaluation that's supposed to help determine their rank. But um, the people who maybe are the most likely candidates to be doing that evaluation system are not the ones who have been given that task. The ones who have been given it largely don't want it. Um, and here's uh, an exemplary quote. When a super, this is from a teacher. When a supervisor attended my lesson, he wanted me to split the class into groups, but the class is not qualified for that and there is not time. He went to the principal and told him that this teacher does not do groupings and so on. The principal told me in front of him not to worry and to let him talk as the evaluation is based on the principal. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm gonna skip this for time, unfortunately. Uh, okay, the other thing is we wanted to think about how this uh, RISE diagnostic worked in conflict-affected contexts. One of the ways we thought that it needed to be adapted is to add global actors because they're, it's currently primarily focused on national contexts, which makes a lot of sense, but global actors, donors, UN agencies, multilateral donors, they're so influential in areas of conflict and crisis that we really need to be examining this uh, this component of the system, because very often it's also adding a lot of complexity and um, lack of coordination. Also, the addition of an NGO and donor relationship, which isn't currently part of the rise. Um, again, given the movement to integrate refugees into national school systems, this relationship uh, is something that we think uh, would be beneficial to add in these contexts. The other thing, and this is something I'm kind of interested in, in talking about with people who are working in systems and maybe have similar populations is we were finding even in our own consortium where we were interested in marginalized populations, this tension of, of course, there's always limited budget, limited time. We want to talk to the people who are determinant of the system. We're interested in working at scale at, with policy. But also the marginalized groups, a lot of them, they um, are experiencing things that happen on the edge of, of formal systems or even outside of formal systems. And so being able to sort of think about both of these groups at the same time, the people who are outside of the formal system and the people who are the determinants of that system uh, was a tension that we, we had a lot of research meetings about. How are we even gonna decide on the sample and who's in it and who's out of it? Um, and then the other thing is in this diagnostic, one of the ideas is to look at the policies and the ways in which they are congruent or incongruent for certain things. But a lot of times what we were finding is a complete absence of policy. And so uh, that's also something for us to consider is where is there no policy for us to even look at? Okay. Um, Next steps for us is we're continuing to look at interview and focus group data. These are preliminary results. They're some of the things that came up for us. And for us to think about expanding this um, to the ERIC consortium as a whole. Oops. 
Um, the next step for us as a center is we're doing some new work on teacher systems in the context of Cameroon. This is a new context for me. If you've done work here, if you're familiar, I would love you to come talk to me about it. Um, and also, I'm personally working on a framework for increased coherence of teacher professional development. I was super interested in that last presentation. I have a lot of thoughts about it. Um, working paper coming soon. Okay, thank you. Um, I've changed. <laughs> So thank you so much for the wildcard entry uh, to, 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 to present at RISE. Uh, this is my favorite conference. Um, I'm going to present a paper that's co-authored with Yoke uh, Vasilius, who is in, uh, uh, in the room up there. You can ask him all the hard questions. Uh, and Martin Hitty, who uh, is a, uh, should, an undergraduate student who uh, you should be looking for in the applications about four years from now. Uh, 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 in incredible uh, uh, student. So um, over the last, I guess, 30 years or so, there's been a kind of a proliferation of administrative units around uh, in many middle and low income countries. Uh, many of them have essentially kind of followed uh, public sector reforms to improve the management of, uh, of service delivery. And in fact, this is why post hoc, I would like to sort of argue that in fact, what I'm talking about is really about you know, education input management, and in fact, teachers, because we think that's kind of the most important input. But uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to sort of have uh, co really compelling evidence to show you that, in fact, it's about that. Okay. Um, and we essentially kind of uh, going to exploit uh, a pattern of, uh, of uh, district fragmentation in Tanzania uh, between 2011 and 2019 uh, in about three waves. Uh, and then some of you know, the number of districts essentially kind of change from about 130 districts in 2012 to about 184. So about a 50% 50, 50 increase. And you know there have been many uh, studies of, of, of this question. I, some of you might be familiar with the work by Sam Bazzi and Matthew Gajan or uh, Ricardo Dice in, in Brazil. So there's quite a lot of uh, recent work on, uh, on this fragmentation. And in some ways, it's ambiguous theoretically uh, sort of whether, in fact, uh, fragmentation will actually improve outcomes. Right. So there's some public economics theory that suggests that it should, you know, preferences are essentially kind of aligned, uh, you know, but on the other hand, essentially kind of local elites can essentially kind of uh, capture resources and, 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 and divert them. And then, of course, it suddenly increases public administration costs. And so everybody takes a hit when we essentially kind of create a new, uh, a new uh, administrative unit, and that in some ways could essentially kind of affect uh, essentially kind of uh, outcomes. Uh, so I'm going to show you that, in fact, we don't see a lot of uh, sort of big changes in the funding of the school system. Uh, but in fact, doesn't mean that in fact other uh, domains might essentially kind of have been affected. Okay. So uh, one, you know, political economy question was raised a little bit earlier about um, about kind of the you know the, the context here. Uh, Tanzania was uh, sort of uh, started a process of decentralizing uh, essentially kind of uh, the administration of public of public services in 2001. But the central government was essentially kind of a little bit nervous about giving local governments actually the authority of hiring and firing uh, essentially kind of uh, uh, local bureaucrats. And in fact, the central government actually sort of retains control uh, over this. So, so education is essentially kind of uh, administered by two agencies, the Ministry of Education sets standards and essentially kind of uh, and policy and the Ministry of Local Government actually implements uh, these programs. And in some ways, Yukovis and I have written uh, quite a few papers on uh, on essentially kind of the challenges that essentially kind of generates. Okay. But but that so so decentralization was, let's say, not not complete. And I think Jean Paul Faguet and others have actually written quite a lot about uh, uh about essentially kind of the the maybe the 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 the, the promises of decentralization have, have not been fully realized because in some ways the political economy has not uh, allowed them to go as far. Okay. Um so so let me show you a little bit about essentially kind of the pattern of the data that the, uh, uh and in some sort of the variation that we exploit. Uh, so in, this is in 2012, these are the, about 132 districts. Uh, in, in 2013, uh, there's kind of, uh, you know, the, the blue districts essentially kind of are uh, the splits that, that we observe. Uh, we observe this data in two different administrative data sets. The Ministry of Finance keeps information on, on essentially kind of where money is allocated. Uh, and we also essentially kind of observe this in the examinations uh, data, uh, where essentially kind of the school changes 
its district designation when that happens. Uh, in 2014, there's another set of round of splits. Uh, you know, so I, I'm only showing you the splits that happen in that particular year. Uh, and then in some ways, I'm sort of combining the splits for 2017 and 18. And so three waves of splits, but most of them you should sort of think of as being concentrated in the first two waves, so 2013 and 14. Uh, and you know, and ultimately, so what we do is effectively sort of uh, combine this data with uh, school uh, location data. Uh, and I'm sort of going to say a little bit about why, why we actually need the school locations, because we actually sort of, in our uh, trying testable mechanisms, we are trying to look at how far a school is from uh, from the uh, from the district headquarters. Okay, uh, so we, we have some data. Uh, you know, those of you who will ask, I mean, so those who are familiar with the political science literature on on district fragmentation will sort of think there's a political story. It's perhaps an electoral strategy. Uh, perhaps it's essentially kind of a form of patronage. We've done the the, the, the sums. There's not a lot in Tanzania, uh, and in fact, uh, and you know, there isn't actually sort of a very clear administrative uh, essentially kind of rule that is used to actually sort of uh, uh, split uh, districts. In the last set of uh, splits, we actually do see some some uh, you know more competitive uh, districts essentially kind of more likely to split, but the, you know the difference is not that big. Okay, so eventually, you know, effectively what happens if we look at kind of a comparison between the splits and never split districts, we actually see that in fact the split districts essentially kind of reduce in size quite dramatically uh, from about 160 schools per district to essentially kind of, you know, about half of that. So what do you expect if you actually sort of split them down the middle? And, and so in some ways, this is effectively the variation we look at, uh, you know. You can all pull out your essentially kind of identification uh, enforcement knives. Uh, this is this is this is a diff and diff uh, with uh, essentially kind of staggered, uh, essentially kind of uh, sort of treatment. So that a lot of concerns about uh, kind of dynamic treatment effects. There are a lot of concerns about heterogeneity. The districts that go early might have very different effects. Anyway, so so we use the latest technology, and, I, and my younger co-authors. Uh, have updated essentially kind of my, my literature. The, the paper that I knew the best was the, the Duflo paper of 2004, which is just how much can we trust differences differences. Uh, but there's apparently a new industry, and I, I'm told by your papers that we're using the latest technology. Uh, but you know, we, we have some pretty limited data in some ways that we can observe when a district gets split. Uh, so the key, uh, can I, I, I guess I have to point. Uh, so, so, so this little G sort of in some ways uh, essentially kind of indicates which cohort of splits you're in, because uh, if we expect some heterogeneity in treatment effects, we actually sort of want to keep that. And we have, you know, our outcomes are essentially kind of learning outcomes at the, uh, at the school level. So we observe in some ways all of the primary leaving examinations for all students in Tanzania between 2011 and 2019. Uh, and we can collapse essentially kind of that at the school level, standardize it, and essentially kind of uh, take the aggregate at the district level. And we can also observe the number of candidates who are sitting for exams. Okay. Uh, so here's essentially kind of you know, just the quick event study plot uh, in which essentially kind of each data point is a kind of a weighted average of essentially kind of the treatment effects across all of these splits. And what you can see is that in fact, you know, we do observe a small increase in test scores uh, essentially after the split. The year negative one is essentially kind of the year, think of that as essentially kind of the year just before the split. Uh, and kind of that data point up there, the biggest data is about a 0.25 standard deviation sort of increase. So if you take the average, it's about 0 0.1, 0 0.09 standard deviations over time. Uh, but if you look at essentially kind of the test, uh, the, the number of candidates who are sitting exams, in fact, we observe that sort of kind of one potential mechanism that's driving essentially kind of the gains is in fact that uh, local government districts or school managers are essentially kind of perhaps reducing the number of kids who are taking uh, who are taking the test. And this is not a this kind of this is not a new result. Uh, Ukrabus, Andy, and uh, Andy Zeitlin and, and, and Isaac and Beatty have a paper uh, which in fact sort of shows very similar results. And in fact, I'm going to argue with uh, wave my hands a lot. Uh, that in fact, essentially, kind of the timing of, of of these splits coincides with an important reform that may have, in fact, that may explain essentially kind of the results we observe. Okay. So, so you might think, okay, well, you know, so somebody's just getting rid of the kids who are essentially kind of weaker, and so generating uh, essentially kind of artificial gains. Uh, we actually have some data from Uezo, and you know, many thanks to Julius and his team for actually sort of producing uh, for producing this data. This is a household-based uh, essentially kind of uh, test, uh, ASER type taste test that was done in Tanzania. And we can observe essentially kind of the test scores of all kids who are essentially kind of uh, tested at the household. 
And we also, what's nice about this, this survey is also it collects information on the public schools in the enumeration area that in fact was visited. So we can actually use that to actually sort of see what's happening over here. And you know, the attention that we have, you know, we have to correct for multiple hypothesis testing. Uh, and we do see essentially kind of some gains, a little bit smaller, but essentially kind of about the same magnitude uh, in grades three and four. And I'm going to explain why I think those those things are that that's probably not sort of that's not going to come from the high stakes. So there, I think you know, school managers don't have incentives to reduce. Uh, they don't have incentives to essentially kind of manipulate essentially kind of who's in grades three and four uh, and who's taking the test. Uh, so I actually think that those reflect essentially kind of potentially real gains. Uh, in terms of money, I think one concern, I think in, in some other contexts has been that when you set up these new administrative units, it takes some time for money to flow to such kind of the, uh, in the right places. We don't observe that in Tanzania, but I have to say our data here is pretty poor. Uh, we observe budget allocations. We don't observe essentially kind of actual receipts. And so, you know, you, you know the, the, my, that's, that's an invitation that I'm happy to, yeah, got it. Yeah. Uh, and so whether we look at capitation grants uh, or essentially kind of other essentially kind of discretionary expenditures, uh, and, and all of these are actually sort of normed by the number of candidates. So one, one important feature, one piece of data that we don't have uh, is essentially kind of annual school level data that would show us the population of students, teachers in a school. We can observe the number of candidates who sit an exam. And so we essentially kind of use that uh, as the norm. The 2012, the pre uh, split uh, number of candidates is essentially kind of the number that we use. Okay. Uh, in terms of inputs that are essentially kind of the input we can observe at the school level using the household level data set. And I should also say this household level data set only looks at 2011 and 2015. So we don't actually look at splits in the 2017, 2018 uh, time period. Uh, but we don't see any sort of really important sort of changes in inputs uh, at the school level, uh, where they essentially kind of textbooks, teachers, uh, you know, there's a small, essentially, kind of uh, positive effect on teacher attendance, but you know, so it's essentially kind of not, uh, not, not very precise, uh, precisely estimated. Okay. Um, and then, so now we're essentially going to come to the question of essentially, you know, can we explain where all of these gains, uh, these small gains, are, are coming from? And 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 we essentially kind of try to uh, uh, test essentially two mechanisms: one about attention uh, and, and monitoring. Uh, and, and then and essentially kind of the other about essentially and very similar, I guess, uh, sort of underlying mechanism, but essentially kind of the location of where your headquarters are. So a split can essentially kind of take place in two ways. A split can be essentially kind of, we can lop off the urban uh, sort of sec, uh, the urban uh, sort of set of schools from the rural schools. So, so the urban place becomes a district uh, and the urban schools are essentially kind of, uh, uh, the, the rural schools become their own district. In, in those places, those in some ways that kind of concentric uh, sort of uh, arrangement, the location of the headquarters for the rural school remains essentially kind of in the urban areas. And we think that that may also be some bargaining between the bureaucrats and, uh, and essentially kind of uh, uh, their, their higher ups. Uh, and in some places, a split actually essentially, in a particularly rural district, will split essentially kind of in two and create two new headquarters. And so we observe essentially kind of, you know, a set of schools that are essentially kind of, you know, exist in, in split districts that are essentially kind of have the same headquarters as they did before. So the distance to the headquarters doesn't really change. And in, a, in, in another set, essentially kind of, we have a new set of uh, headquarters where the district actually, the, the, the distance to the headquarters actually will change. And we observe, in fact, that most of the gains that we actually sort of see uh, in, uh, in, in, in over this period, in fact, are concentrated in the new headquarters. Okay. And so the top panel in some ways sort of shows you that in some ways that's where most of the gains are. In the, in the sample of schools where in fact they essentially kind of stayed in the same headquarters, we actually don't observe uh, any gains. And it also looks like, especially in the new headquarters, that you know, the further away you are for, from essentially kind of the old district headquarters, the larger essentially kind of the, uh, the effect size. Uh, Okay, I'm running out of uh, running out of time, uh, so so uh, I'll move on very quickly. Uh, so we do the same thing, looking at resources by sort of uh, whether it's sort of new or uh, new or same headquarters. Uh, and here we don't observe any effects. In some ways, kind of these are the two rows uh, that that you want to sort of uh, focus on. Uh, and we think that in fact, you know, a lot of the gains. Okay, so let me let me let me let me let me let me let me. Uh, so I have a minute and a half. Uh, let me let me just say that. We think that most of the gains are coming from schools uh, either implementing a particular set of programs 
during this period between 2013 and 2015. There was a big uh, reform in Tanzania referred to as the big results now, something that we studied uh, quite a lot in uh, under Rice. Under that program, there was a big emphasis on test scores at the end of the school cycle. So schools were ranked. That's the paper that uh, Kavis, Andy, and, and Isaac have. Uh, and at the, at the lower end, they changed the curriculum. So essentially kind of schools were now teaching English after the third grade and they're focusing on essentially kind of the uh, foundational skills in the first two grades, okay? Now, I don't have data to show you that the quality of implementation of these programs was better in essentially kind of the new headquarter districts versus the essentially kind of same headquarter districts. But in fact, local government leaders of education systems had to make pledges that were actually sort of going to improve learning outcomes. So one reason we see the decline in the candidates who are essentially kind of number of candidates who are sitting is in fact, there was actually quite a lot of pressure. And we think that in fact, this pressure actually sort of did translate into better uh, implementation of some of the training programs for essentially kind of this reform. I don't have the data, but in some ways, uh, you know, I think that's the, that's the story that is essentially kind of, uh, that, that is emerging. Uh, here's, here's my conclusion. Uh, we think there is some better monitoring, certainly beliefs about better monitoring, maybe not so much direct uh, evidence of monitoring, uh, but our, our evidence is, you know, seeing all the teacher, uh, the teacher papers earlier today, I had a lot of data envy. Uh, we have, we, we, we push the data we have as hard as we can, uh, and that's where we are. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, James. And thanks to everyone for being very uh, punctual. Could the, the rest of the speakers come down to the front and we will, we will take um, around about 25 minutes of Q&A. Paul? Coming. I'm not going to enforce a kind of, we'll do it on teachers and then we'll do it on uh, James's presentation. Just ask you a question. So, um, I thought I was persuasive. You're not going to ask James, right? But you are a specialist on teacher training. So, um, okay. okay. <laughs> I won't even try for it. On there. Ouch. To Paul, you were. The framing that I would have had is why do teacher training programs succeed at reducing student learning? Because you have a largest impact, it's an ITT, you have non-compliance, 10% significance. And I mean, there are a lot of reasons why the best, best students suffered the most. Uh, maybe these teachers were now, um, they were taken out of the school, maybe they didn't learn enough, maybe this interactive work takes away from other works. So, I mean, I'd be curious if you believe that there might have been a negative impact, I'd be curious to know why. Mm -hmm. Wait, one there. Um, okay, I'm going to take uh, one from here, and then if we have time, I'll sweep back around. Okay. Uh, from, yeah. Okay. There you go. Uh, the question is for the presentation using the system diagnostic framework by RISE. I'm Parthajit from Central Square Foundation India. We use the similar finding at the same diagnostic tool for studying the system of Punjab, a state. I think my question to you is, is it, you know, that the kind of tool lends itself to a situation like an education in emergency, where you're forced to think like, you know, uh, probably non-system actors and people outside the system, even the donors were relevant and should be included because it's kind of in a time space, right? The emergency is not the steady state of the system, hopefully. So that's my question to you. Okay, from the middle. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's a long way. Well, thank you. Um, that's to Paul. So, um, I mean, I don't want to sound um, really terrible, but perhaps I should. Is is that that design the way it sort of sits? And you know, it's almost like a colonial teacher leadership project. I mean, uh, I'm shocked. I'm really surprised at the way the design was there and the way foreign experts came to you know, really uh, 
to, to, to do what was right. And then the teachers were sort of co-opted to sort of just align the curriculum. I'm just concerned at the, at the entire uh, way the design was made. And the fact that it was for grade nine and 10, I mean, I'm just concerned because if you have the paucity of time was not even two weeks, but just 10 days without any support, anything. And then for high stake examinations, the way they take place, when they happen, I'm just concerned that, you know, if we were to do a post-mortem, what, what would we do that is different? And we, just yesterday in a community of practice rise session, we were saying, you know, what happens to these high branded projects? You know, what is the possibility of any learning or longevity or sustainability? But, you know, this is a, this is a design which is, uh, which is, I think, designed to fail and, uh, and very colonial in its mindset and does. So the question is, there's a lot of discussion on, on decolonizing. And I think definitely if RISE had one piece of work to do, it would look at some of these uh, areas of where we seriously decolonize. And that's another language if you had, if so if RISE has this, uh, this uh, diagnostics, I think we need to come up with another diagnostic, which is seriously looking at decolonizing um, these kind of constructs. And I, I mean, it, it, it was like really, so that's my question. And I would be really interested to know, did we really think about those aspects? Fantastic, thank you. Um, take one more here and then we'll go through the answers. Yeah, hi, my question is for James. Um, I'm wondering if the, with the new districts, or the new headquarters, did you, were you able to observe any difference in the motivation or skills of the staff that were hired in there that might account for some of the differences in performance or were they similar to the old ones? Data. I, 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 no, so, okay, so no. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so I think we've got two questions for Paul. Uh, one or two possibly for uh, Lindsay and one for James. Uh, did anyone want to have a question for someone in this round? Okay, hand went up quickly there. And then... um, I think I can talk now here now. For the uh, district intervention, it was uh, big results now was specifically about ranking schools within districts. So do you think this result is generalizable to fragmentation of districts outside of this context? Or is it specifically through this channel where now there are smaller districts with uh, you know, uh, more competitive ranking than that uh, smaller district? Okay, that was a question for James. Um, was there a question for Salman? <sighs> no, okay, maybe in the next round. Right, so Paul, you had uh, two and uh, you kept us started, so why don't we start with you? Okay. You need a reminder so, of the questions or are you? Okay. I think I got it. Okay, so for the one about um, decol decolonizing, um, I should be clear that this um, teacher training was designed by the government and we were brought in later to sort of evaluate it. We didn't, we didn't have anything to do with design of the program. If you ask me like, what could they do better? We, I, I didn't get to that on the slides because I ran out of time. I mean, the first thing I would say, don't do it during when school is in session. So they pulling teachers out, um, give the trainers a lot more, um, advance time to prepare for the training and maybe train the trainers, which they didn't really do. Um, and yeah, and, and maybe, um, well, that's, that's uh, I think there was one thing I, I don't remember. Um, and then Jacobus, I think you were asking about what do we think really happened? Uh, we do think that the, the top students did actually, their scores went down. I don't think it's because the, the teachers were gone for 10 days, that doesn't seem like enough time. What we think is they actually did change their teaching to sort of more focus on students who were, you know, in the middle or the bottom of the distribution. Mm -hmm. Well, we know that they slowed down, like how far they got through the curriculum. And so the top students, you know, when they would like rush through the curriculum, the top students could keep up and they would get to the end. But if they slowed it down, they never got to the end of the curriculum. And so the top students lost that. But we don't have really good data to really prove that. That's what we think happened. Uh, let's come to, to Lindsay next. Um, the question here on contrast with Punjab, where the diagnostic was also used. And you might want to also chime in on Ella's point about whether we need the diagnostic decolonization as well, if you want. I don't know that I'm qualified to speak on diagnosing decolonization, but um, so I think in terms of 
whether or not we can use the rise in areas of conflict and crisis. I just want to, I'm going to completely butcher this statistic and I'm sure someone can correct me, but um, you said it's not the steady state of the system. And in by and large in these contexts, these crises are protracted. I mean, the Syrian war, it happened nine years ago and um, we're still, you know, in this state. And I think the, the statistic is something like if, if you've been displaced for at least three years, the average that you're going to be displaced is 20 years or something. Um, so I do think we need to transition into thinking about emergency contexts where we are looking at refugees and displaced persons being integrated into formal systems. And so what does that take? What does it look like to do that? How do you absorb that level of students? And so I think there's a lot in the diagnostic that we can use, but you're absolutely correct. And, and I talked about it a little bit in the presentation that there is this tension between what the diagnostic is looking at in the formal system and all of these things that are happening outside of the formal system. And it was, again, a conversation that we were having a lot in our group is, um, how do you account for both of those things? I don't have any great answers, um, but I, if, the, if the question is essentially, is it useful to use in an area of conflict and crisis, I still think there's lots of useful things in the tool. And I think the idea of identifying areas of maximum potential for intervention, I think that frame for us when developing country agendas where we were looking at scale and policy was also really useful for us. Great, thanks. Uh, James, two questions to you, one on uh, motivation and one on mechanisms. Yeah, so, so I, I think to, to your question about the, uh, the, the quality of the, the bureaucrats who are managing the new districts, I, you know, so we, uh, we, we tried hard to get data on postings and, uh, and in fact, we even did a survey of, of local government managers and these, uh, a lot of the, uh, the people who actually run the education uh, office at the, at the local government level. Uh, in 2019, but you know, many of those that essentially kind of moved around, and so we actually can observe who was actually sort of in posted to a lot of the earlier splits uh, in in general. But that's something I think that uh, would be important to look at. My my sense is, uh, given how Tanzania operates, that in some ways I think the the posting would not work in the way that you might think. Uh, I actually think that in fact they might actually post uh, better and stronger bureaucrats to essentially get the new districts rather than the other way around. Uh, but I certainly don't have the data to, uh, to show it. Uh, but that's, that's something that I, we, we certainly, we, we need to know essentially kind of uh, exactly how the program was actually uh, implemented to actually be able to explain the results. And then uh, to your question about the, the timing of, the, of these splits and, and the results we observe, uh, I think the short answer is I don't know if in fact it would generalize. Uh, you know, public economics theory would suggest that there should be some effects uh, even beyond that, just from the fact that you reduce the scope of the, of the, of the management and administration uh, effort that's required to, uh, to deal with districts. Uh, but it's not just the, 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 the ranking of, of schools, which in some ways the, 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 the main result in the other paper uh, that Jacobus and, and, and his co-authors have. But in fact, I think there were also essentially kind of changes at the lower level of the primary cycle, which I think were very different because of the timing of BRN. So I, I do think, you know, it, it, the, yeah, yes, but I'm not so sure if, in fact, uh, I could rule out this answer kind of that this wouldn't work in other places. Great. Uh, I will come back to the audience um, in the room, but we've had a couple of questions come in online um, for someone. Um, uh, so one is sort of a comment, and maybe you can reflect on it, um, about the existence of the national reading program and whether there were interactions between that um, uh, and your intervention. And secondly, um, and this is mu music to names ears, I'm sure, on implementation. What was the cost of the training and, um, you know, opportunity cost of doing that instead of the remedial classes directly? 
Very good question. So I think I'll start with the costing. So we did some analysis and it's in the paper on like uh, per unit cost. It comes down to about like $40 per student. So about like 0.1 standard deviation, 0.17 standard deviation gain is equivalent of like $100 of spending per student, which is not high. Uh, but I will agree to the fact that if you know a priori, that like remedial classes is the solution in this particular context, you would go with the remedial classes. But most of these interventions are designed at a time when you don't have all the information. So knowing like what has happened, because that's a binding constraint that they are teaching about two hours. So uh, the teachers, the head teachers will respond uh, to that constraint to resolve it by expanding the time by giving more frequency to the remedial classes and it's more concrete and easily actionable as well. Great. Um, let's open it up again to the floor. Um, I did see some more hands go back up. Uh, Hanatha, uh, do you want to start? And then um, Barbara, we'll come to you if there's time, but people who haven't already asked questions. questions there. Uh, Hanatha, back. Um, you know, it's interesting to see your study because it came out at the same time that a systematic review of a management training um, study came out as well. And one of the things that they say that affects uh, the successful implement or uh, implementation is slow take up. I was looking at your paper and you say in your paper that uh, 798 of 800 schools participated in the training, which is amazing. I'd like to see how you achieved that. Uh -huh. Question down here. Sec uh, no, no, the lady behind you. <laughs> um, for the study that was done about Nepal, I was wondering, um, it was interesting that you didn't mention when you talked about what could be done better, instructional coaching and more ongoing support. And I'm sitting next to the head of Dignitas, which does great work in that area. So that seems like a, um, if you have a chance when you're you know, summarizing what could be done better. I think that could be one to mention. Um, but I also wondered, did you have a chance to actually feedback your results to the government? Um, and did they listen to you? And do you know what's going on now in terms of whether they're actually evolving their model? Because I would hope so. Or are there NGOs that are working on trying to support the government to learn from what you found? Uh, there was a question over here that I didn't take in the first round. <laughs> So I'm just trying to make you run as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> and we're the wrong shoes. Thanks. My question is to Paul first. And um, help me help one system improve. Out of that study, if I went away, moved away from, backed away from data uh -huh. that you have presented here and took a simple layman question, uh, very similar to my colleague there who said, did you feedback to the government? Now, let me take complete layman position as government, say, and ask you, was this program a design failure? Was it a systemic failure? Was it something that was as a consequence of the what I call the donor lethargy, where people just expect, doesn't matter, even if you get it wrong, one, one very uh, lenient donor will always come and pick up the pieces. Uh -huh. What did you see about that? And my second question is to James. Sorry, to ask. <laughs> I'm a bit. Uh, <laughs> well, James, we'll, uh, we'll just stop there. I don't want to. If I establish a norm that you can answer to, I know where it's going to head. So we'll, we'll just take one. Um, <laughs> was there another question? Uh, okay, I was trying to look at people who haven't either spoken or answered the question before. But uh, where can we go for it? I just have a quick question. I have a quick question for Paul. What do you? What role do you think incentives or lack of incentives for teachers to participate in the program had? Because a lot of places have incentive career path incentives. You can get points on your career path. Do you think those play any kind of role to motivate teachers to be more engaged in the training? Or is it a design, just a design failure? Mm -hmm. Okay, Barbara, I'll take yours. If it's not for Paul. Is it for uh, Paul? Yeah, me too. I agree with that. <laughs> it's not for Paul? Okay, good. Okay, thanks. The research that exists on principal quality and impact on, on school performance basically shows two channels, managing the teacher cohort in the school and creating a school culture where teachers learn from each other. In both of these contexts, 
how did that play out? Was the training oriented to that kind of, you know, ac you know principal expertise? And in uh, Tanzania, what was the impact of these splits? I mean, you can imagine a teacher who's been working under one district administration may have the same language, et cetera, and all of a sudden have a different boss. And also, do those new bosses have any uh, impact, have any power over the teacher allocations? Great. Okay, so by my count, Paul, you've got three. Um, so we'll start with you. Three questions for me? Yeah. Okay. I, I think I remember some of them. So, the um, yeah, I agree that one of the things I should have said that I forgot at the end was follow-up is very important for the teacher training. There was really no follow-up going on at all. And it could be in the form of coaching or just having people go back. I have another paper on coaching and, and one of my co-authors is here in Peru. And the thing about coaching, at least in Peru, is it's very expensive. So um, that was it. Um, and I think a couple of people asked like, what was the, um, you know, how did we feed back to the government? It was actually really a mess because they, they completely changed. They did this federalization of the entire government structure. So these teacher training centers were disbanded. All, it, it was a very central structure before, and then they divided the country into seven regions and moved things out. And the, the two people we interacted with the most got new jobs. So they were like, just gone. We can't get in touch with them. So yeah, it was like, we don't even know who to uh, do. Actually, my co-author, Tom, probably could say better than me, like how, how it works, but it uh, it didn't work. And so whether, I think it was partly a design failure, you know, having the teachers come when, during the school year instead of out of time. That was one example of a design problem. But I think partly systemic, not having uh, much incentives. Yeah, that was the last comment. The incentives, um, I don't think there are big incentives that, you know, if, if the teacher doesn't show up for the training or the teacher doesn't really make use of the training, that they're going to lose anything. I mean, they get, they get paid a little bit more or a little bit goes into their, you know, annual reviews, you know, to get a promotion or something like this, but it's not a big deal. Um, so it kind of has to be almost the way it's set up now that there aren't big incentives. So it has to be sort of their own motivation which I think some of the teachers are quite motivated, but they also uh, struggle a lot with, in this case, the, the kids being um, behind when they already come into grades nine and 10. Okay, great. Let's go to Salman. Um, first, a very simple question. How did you get effectively 100% uh, take up? And then the point from Barbara about the two different um, ways in which you might try and approach improving management. I think on the implementation fidelity, I didn't give like the overview that this is part of like Malawi education sector improvement project. So that's basically funded by the Global Partnership for Education. So $45 million grant for system reforms. So this is one of the interventions that was implemented. I think what's looking at like Paul's presentation and like Malawi's context, I think the basic difference is how much time you spend in the context designing the intervention. Are all the stakeholders involved and they converge in terms of the implementation fidelity or not? And then like the government makes them accountable in terms of bringing them for the training. So once the, once the schools were picked as part of the process, it was basically, they, they thought that it was a very good thing for them to have on their on their resume or, or as a reference to go to these training programs. So how, the, the ministry kind of like inculcates that kind of like uh, attitude among, uh, among the head teachers. I think that makes a difference in, in terms of the fidelity. And on Barbara's point in terms of the channels, I think it's the local expertise. So if you look at the training program, it's a consortium. So it's the government of Malawi, it's a research university in Malawi, and then there is an international firm which is coming in. So how you codify new techniques and behaviors while listening to the people on the ground. I think that makes a difference in terms of bringing the expertise in, in this area. But at the same time, we didn't see any impacts on, on the culture side, which we thought was like, uh, should be, we should be able to move a needle on that. James, did you want to respond to Barbara's prompt as well? Yes, uh, uh, as, best I, as best I can. Um, 
so so I, I agree with you that in fact uh, you know one one potential channel is uh, having a new manager who actually cares about learning outcomes. I think the 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 key feature of of this big results now was kind of a shift from let's just you know worry about inputs to you know we really want our kids to learn and we're going to essentially kind of uh, you know, make uh, results of uh, test scores but transparent, and and we're going to essentially kind of put a lot of pressure on. There's a traffic light system. If you're a red school, you get more resources, and so we think a lot of some of the remote uh, schools are essentially kind of benefiting from the fact that this actually kind of there is a little bit more attention uh, that they're getting. Uh, but we don't observe essentially, you know, uh, and these LGA managers actually do have uh, the ability to actually allocate teachers, but we don't actually observe year by year. I essentially kind of teach allocations. We we use this the survey data, which essentially kind of we can't geolocate essentially kind of exactly where that we know it, what district they're in, but we essentially kind of can't geolocate and uh, link to the school. Uh, and so yes, I, there, there are a lot of interesting mechanisms that we would like to test, but are unable to. Okay, and um, Lindsay asked to make a response to uh, Paul's comment, and then I'm going to come back for one more question. So think um, what that killer question could be. Okay. I, I just, I'm a teacher trainer at heart. And so I am so interested in the study, but I also think realistically, if if the issue were compliance, there likely would have been a treatment on the treated um, effect. Um, coaching is expensive, but when done well, it can also be cost effective and nothing's more expensive than failed programs. <laughs> uh, we've all had them, so that's not a criticism, but just a reminder. Um, and uh, one of the results of our study that I didn't have time to talk about was how um, these supervisors who are intended to be coaches they have very little um, training in their approach for how they're supposed to observe and give feedback to teachers. And um, this has been something that I've seen in many of the contexts where we worked. We have this low hanging fruit. They're already on the payroll. They, are, they already have a position. Yes, ratios are high, there's other issues, but we have this workforce that is being underutilized in the teacher um, professionalization sort of trajectory that we could really capacitate to do some of this work in so many countries. I just wanted to give a... Okay, if you can ask a question in 10, 20 seconds, I'll come to you. Michelle, I know, I trust you. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks. Um, yeah, just a question for Paul on actually your mixed methods approach, because I think we can see that because you had that qualitative data, it has lent to a much maybe richer conversation about those findings than if it had just been a, here's another teacher training program that failed. So just wondering if you could speak for whatever one minute that's left, but challenges, how do you determine what questions to ask? Were there questions that you wish you had asked um, that you didn't in that kind of qualitative component and, you know, any thoughts that would lend to people doing quantitative studies that want to maybe add that type of component? Yeah, I think the answer to that is find somebody who's good at qualitative studies, which is not me. <laughs> so uh, we did hire a local person who turned out to be very good and talk to other people about it. So that that's my kind of quick thing. The other thing I just was reminded of is um, when we presented our results to the uh, to the Ministry of Education people, we were a little worried that they would be upset with us because we're saying, "Hey, your program is really bad." So we kind of softened it a little bit. But you know, they didn't actually seem to be worried. You know, and they and they said, "Yeah, we didn't think this program was very good," and uh, so we're not very surprised that it failed. And you know, no hard feelings or anything. I don't know. Yeah, that's that's maybe Utam, my co-author, could ask you. Well, the Asian Development Bank, you know, paid for it. And I, Utam said, is anybody from the Asian Development here? He said they just shell out the money and they don't care if it works or not. Okay, so, so thanks everyone for a really, really fruitful session. Really great discussion. Thanks for all of your questions. I'm just going to close by noting, like, it is obvious from the, the interest in this that supporting teachers is hugely important, but it's really hard to get it right. We kind of knew that from studies by Dave and other people like that, but I think what's coming out really clearly is we need to know more than there's just you know, mixed impact. We need to know why there are mixed impacts. We need to do the qualitative work. We need to do the studies of implementation, which leads really nicely into a session that we're gonna have this afternoon. So thanks to everybody and please go and enjoy your lunch. Um, I very much hope that there's a queuing system that we're not all queuing together. 
Um, and we're going to be uh, back promptly for half past one when uh, Julius is going to have a session on foundational learning. Thank you. <laughs>
seated let's get seated and started we have two minutes gone on the clock already welcome to session three so this is a session on uh, foundational learning and instructional coherence. We're going to have four high quality papers. We have three presenters here in person, and then Jen is online. She's in uh, Ghana. Jen, I hope you're there. So a brief summary, these are four high quality papers, two are on targeted instruction, one a rich ethnography, contrast, contrasting learner experiences across two subsequent grades, and the last one is system level instructional coherence analysis. We'll start with Mitchell, and then he'll be followed by Jen, who'll be presenting online, and then Miriam and Deji. Without any further ado, I'd like to invite Mitchell to come and start off. Oh, backwards pointing. No worries, stay there. Right. Sounds great, thank you all. Really looking forward to sharing this paper with you. Really proud of this work and the work that went into the evaluation because it personally got me, got me thinking about how to structure these kind of foundational learning programs in this context, but also just how to deal with implementation challenges. So I'm looking forward to sharing that as well with you all. So without further ado, this is a joint work my colleagues at ID Insights, Michael Sabele, Jeff McManus, and Tissé Mwanzele Mwai Gasol Pignon. I'm Micho. I'm a junior economist based in ID Insights Senegal office. So before we dive in, here's an outline of my presentation. I'll start by giving some background. I'll then move on to the evaluation design. After this, we'll dive into the results and then some key takeaways, including remarks. So Liberia is a country that is witnessing relative socioeconomic stability but continues to be a challenging context with these challenges amplified by the Ebola outbreak and the COVID-19 pandemic. Looking at literacy outcomes, we see that in Liberia, literacy rates are quite low. According to the World Bank, the adult male literacy rate sits at 63%, the adult female literacy rate sits at 34%, and the average across both sexes is about less than half, which sits below the regional average of, sorry, two thirds and less than the world average of four out of five adults. An illiteracy assessment conducted in Liberian public schools found that grade two students could read about 10 correct words per minute, much lower than the Ministry of Education benchmark of 35 correct words per minute. Also, these crises have led to a large overage population in schools. Um, in early childhood education classrooms, we see that 67% of ECE children were over the age expected for their grade, and they're expected to be between the ages three to five. And then also looking at the uh, population of children that are of the official age that are actually enrolled in school, we find that the net enrollment rate is about 58%. So what's being done? One policy that's been implemented is the Liberia Education Advancement Plan, mm -hmm. Advancement Program. This is a multi-partner public-private partnership um, where private partners support the management of Liberia government schools. The Rising Academy Network is one of the private partners that supports the management of LEAVE schools. RAND supports 95 government schools as part of this program, and they developed the FASTA Reading Program in 2021 and asked us to come in to help them design an RCT to evaluate it. So the FASTA Reading Program is a 20-week phonics-based accelerated reading program inspired by teaching at the right level. <clears throat> Excuse me. The program was designed as a catch-up program for students in RAND-supported schools who hadn't developed foundational reading skills. The FAST Reading Program has multiple components. The first 
is a teacher training session that lasted for about three days. Then there were regular target assessments. Once you're assigned to your baseline reading level, then they reassess you at the end of each cycle. So the program, 20 weeks long, was split into five four-week cycles. They are reassessed at each cycle. Then they had classroom monitoring that was done by RAN hired and trained school performance managers. They also distributed teacher guides and student workbooks and a mobile app to help teachers with their understanding of how to deliver a phonics-based curriculum. So now, jumping into the evaluation design. So which students do we focus on? We focused on overage ECE children. And we do this for three main reasons. First, it's a policy priority for RAN and the Ministry of Education. And also because only ECE classrooms were included in the randomization. All schools, control and treatment, were instructed to give the program to grades three to six. Treatment schools were instructed to include ECE classrooms. As maybe some of you are already thinking, this likely led to some confusion, um, which we talk about a little later, around what is your treatment assignment? And that led to quite a bit of non-compliance, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Please note that primary grades that didn't receive the program or grades one and two, where kids are expected to be between the ages of six to seven, and that's because the faster reading curriculum overlapped with their core curriculum. And lastly, resource constraints meant we couldn't survey all ECE children. What we hope to learn, we wanted to know what's the impact of the program on reading level, reading proficiency, what's the impact on non-reading outcomes, such as numeracy, attendance, and retention, and then also do treatment effects vary by gender or baseline reading level. We also wanted to see what challenges and opportunities were observed during program implementation. This is an infographic of our sampling strategy. There are quite a few steps, and just for the sake of time, I won't go through all of them, but just to highlight that we applied an eligibility criteria to RAND's 95 schools, where a school had to have an ECE section, naturally, and had to have enough teachers to support the implementation of the program. So that's more than three teachers. We stratified the randomization based on some school-level characteristics, and that leaves us with 37 treatment schools, 37 control schools. You can see that after COVID-19 school closures, one school dropped out. We do see some differential attrition, but we found that baseline characteristics are still pretty balanced across treatment and control. So most of our results are reported using this 2,303 sample um, with a return rate of about 85%. We do test, uh, we do use inverse probability weights and lead bounds on treatment effects in our robustness checks. We find that these do not meaningfully change our results, but those are available in the paper. To give a sense of the geographic spread, of the schools. This is a map showing treatment and control schools. The blue dots are control, the maroon dots are treatment. So we covered about 10 counties in our sample. So this is our reading assessment that was used to place kids into their baseline reading level, but also to test their reading proficiency at baseline and inline. Different assessments were used to assign them to their, base, uh, to their baseline reading level. And then we also have some other data that we had as supporting. So we, at N-Line, we added a numeracy assessment just to see if the fast reading program was crowding out uh, numeracy skills. We also asked students to report their perceptions of reading, their perception of school, and their reading practices at home. We also have process evaluation data that was collected by the Rising Academy Network that gave us some qualitative insights that helped us frame the quantitative results. We also have attendance data from school performance managers and school leader checks of attendance throughout the program. This is our analytical model. We use ANCOVA and we control for a vector of student level characteristics, baseline age, gender, baseline reading score, and then also a vector of categorical factors corresponding to the stratum that the student is in, so the school level strata. And then um, we test this on several outcomes of interest. So now to talk about non-compliance. So as I mentioned earlier, the program was implemented to, so in all schools in grades three to six. And some schools got confused regarding their uh, treatment assignment. And so in this table, you can see we report the number of faster reading cycles implemented across treatment and control schools. As you can see, not all treatment schools implemented all five cycles, and some control schools implemented cycles of the program. Our preferred way to deal with this in our TOT estimates is using a treatment intensity estimator. So this, we measure treatment as the percent of cycles that were implemented. So if you implemented three cycles, that'd be 60%. And so uh, this does rely on a couple of assumptions that I talk about in detail in the paper. We can talk about during the Q&A. But just for the sake of time, I'll jump over to the results. And we mostly report this for our TOT estimates, this treatment intensity estimator. So now jumping into the results, 
I'll start with the measures of reading proficiency. And in this chart, the y-axis is the change in faster reading levels between baseline and line. So I report two bars. The left bar is the control group average. Then there's a treatment group average with treatment effects measured using our treatment intensity estimator for non-compliance. And also we put the ITT estimates in parentheses just for reference. So we see that um, ITT estimates for the program are modest, but in statistically insignificant. We see a 0.07 increase in reading levels between baseline and endline for treatment school students. Once we account for non-compliance, this difference grows to 0.12 reading levels, which translates to about 0.28 standard deviations. You don't see any statistically significant differences between subgroups. And we also don't see a statistically significant effect on numeracy outcomes. It's not reported here, but it's in the paper as well. So we, this tells us that the FASTA reading program didn't crowd out um, math instruction. And we found that treatment school uh, children were more likely to be present. Our ITT estimates puts it at 0.08% more likely. When our ITT, uh, treatment intensity estimate, when we account for non-compliance, puts us at about 11.4% more likely to be present during the school performance manager's attendance checks. Now looking at non-reading outcomes, here as well, we don't really see many effects. However, interestingly, we find that students assigned to the treatment group were 7% less likely to practice reading at home. Once we account for non-compliance, that difference grows to about 12%. So treatment school children said they were less likely to practice reading at home. So now just what, what does this tell us? How do we interpret these results? So what do we do with this information? So overall, our results show that the program likely improved reading proficiency for overage EC students by about 0.28 standard deviation, even with implementation challenges. We also think that it's likely cost effective. We did a cost effectiveness analysis using our um, treatment intensity estimates. Of course, this comes with some caveats that are covered in more detail in uh, the paper, but our estimates show that the program has a cost effectiveness of 0.91 standard deviation learning gains for $100. And this is similar to j -PAL's estimates for three other foundational literacy programs, such as one on computer-assisted learning in India, a remedial education program in India, and a contract teacher's innovation in Kenya that all have a cost effectiveness estimate of about one standard deviation for $100. And then what are the learnings for other foundational literacy programs? So apart from the typical challenges of a new program, such as piloting a new curriculum, training teachers, getting materials to schools, we observed two main challenges in the implementation of the program. So first, phonics-based reading instruction is very different from how reading is traditionally taught in government schools in Liberia. The standard curriculum uses a whole language approach coupled with memorization, repetitive call and response, and many RAND teachers didn't feel prepared to deliver a radically different approach to reading. In the process evaluation data, we found that 36% of teachers said I at least sometimes didn't feel prepared to deliver the program. And the fact that fewer than half of the schools in the treatment group implemented all five cycles likely tells us they maybe didn't have the capacity to implement the program. So this tells us that to effectively deliver phonics instruction in schools where the whole language approach is standard probably requires more initial training, more frequent retraining, and ongoing coaching of the teachers. So I'm really glad this comes after the teacher training session that we just talked about. Also, learning in school may have spillover effects for learning at home. As mentioned earlier, the program was implemented during the school day so that teachers could feel like it was part of their day-to-day -day teaching activities. However, students exposed to the full program said that we're 12% less likely to report reading at home. And that might be because they have to focus on other things at home, such as their math homework. And the fact that we don't see an effect on math scores maybe tells us that this is an efficient trade-off. You do a little bit, there are moderate effects on reading and there no, there's no knock-on effect to math. But maybe they're not practicing reading at home because they don't have materials that correspond to the new curriculum. Or parents don't know how to teach them or how to support them um, in this new curriculum. So those are some of the things that we think program designers should carefully consider these externalities to the program. So even with the challenges encountered and the fact that the program is in its infancy and will likely go through many iterations, we believe these findings show promise and provide valuable learnings for any program looking to scale phonics-based instruction or teaching at the right level um, in this context. 
So I think I'm good for time. That is it. Thank you, Mitchell, and uh, thanks for setting a very good example. You've saved us two minutes. Jen, are you there? Jen, can you hear us? Okay. Hi, Julius. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, please do share your slides, and when you're ready, get going. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jennifer Parikumi. I am a doctoral researcher at the Blavatnik School of Government. And I'm really sad that I'm not in person. In fact, I can't actually even see the audience. I just see the podium. So um, if you are making quizzical faces at me, I won't be able to see them. Um, but I am, oh, there we go. I see waves, thank you for that. I. I love an interactive presentation. So this makes me the saddest to be sitting at a desk and not being physically present. So thank you for those who waved at me. Um, I am presenting some work from my doctoral research, a chapter um, on empirical evidence from Botswana, foundational learning and mental health. Um, this research was done um, thanks to support from the Rise Gap Filling um, uh, fund and also CSAE and done in collaboration with the Botswana Ministry of Basic Education. Uh, so what you'll see here, feel free to interrogate it. I hope it'll generate a really great discussion. Um, okay, sorry, next slide. So I, this is the outline of our presentation. I'll give you some background and context for the Botswana case study, the research questions, um, how I measured my outcomes of interest, a little bit of my design, key findings and main takeaways. So just to give you a little bit of a background and motivation for my study, Globally, what we know is that 20% of children and adolescents suffer from some type of mental um, health disorder, some mental disorder. And in Sub-Saharan Africa, one in seven children and adolescents suffer from significant um, mental health difficulties. Additionally, we also know that early onset mental health problems have potential to affect long-term development and, and well-being. And 90% of our young people, the global population of young people are in low and middle income countries. So I think this presents a really serious education and general um, global health policy, education policy challenge. So what we also know that there's a growing literature that links children's um, emotional and behavioral health to their education outcomes. So such as test scores and attendance, and that of course schools can provide an the enabling environment that can be leveraged to support uh, mental health and well-being. So a number of research has been done in, in the school setting that also has knock-on effects on um, children's well-being outcomes. And as I believe would believe intuitively as well, that a positive school climate can lead to improved mental health and education success outcomes. And some of the mechanisms that have been observed here is that you know positive relationships between teachers and students are linked to decreases in mental health problems. So so this sets the scene for um, why I'm interested in investigating an ongoing uh, pedagogical approach that has been spoken about, I'm sure at length even mentioned in the previous presentation, which is teaching at the right level. Uh, so it's, it's not new to anyone in the room, I'm sure, but to level set, we know that it is a targeted numeracy and literacy intervention backed by multiple rigorous evaluations, constantly shown to improve learning in multiple contexts, as we've seen and multiple delivery models. So of course there's a variance depending on who's delivering it, but uh, most often there is uh, an increase in learning outcomes. So the innovation here of course is that let's teach at the, the child's um, capability level rather than the assigned grade. So in the Botswana context where I'm looking at, um, this is typically done over 30 days, nine weeks, assess group by level targeted and fun instruction. So the, and focus on standard three to five. So I will speak a little bit more about the sample that I worked in, um, but just, just to keep going, give you a little bit more about Botswana. There's Botswana in the red, if you haven't been, please go, it's a fantastic country. Um, 
basic education is the first 10 years in Botswana. The net enrollment, um, according to the, the most recent statistics that we have, is about 93%. So most of so although there is an out-of-school population, most of the children are in school. And then a study that was done by um, University of Botswana professors, Panziri, Tayang, as well as researchers at Youth Impact, um, found that you know, one in 10 students could not do division at standard five. This was an expectation at standard three, level two to three, um, and 20% couldn't read a paragraph. And then linking back to, to health, as I'm going to be speaking about mental health, uh, studies in Botswana have also found insufficient mental health data to inform any kind of policy around young people and adolescents. So bringing all of these things together, I ask a couple of research questions. I want to understand what is the impact of foundational learning, teaching at the right level, on the overall mental health and well-being of students. Secondly, I want to understand what is the impact of foundational learning on the anxiety, specifically on the anxiety and depressive symptoms of students. And then I want to understand what's the impact on TAL on those who are predisposed to mental health difficulties at baseline. So those who at baseline had a higher level um, above the quote unquote normal threshold, um, if they are more or less affected by the pedagogy. And then of course, because it's TAL, I also looked in my sample to understand what was the impact of TAL on the education success of students. And by education success here, I'm defining that by um, school-based test scores and attendance of students. So I use a couple of instruments to understand um, mental health. Uh, the first tool that I use is the strengths and difficulties questionnaire. All of these tools are really well, they have really good psychometric uh, properties in the literature. So the English version of these tools have really good properties, but then I back translated them um, working with a team of people and then also tested the reliability and validity of the tools in the Botswana context. So we have the strengths and difficulties questionnaire and the some of the, the constructs that it targets include emotional symptoms, conduct problems, peer relationship problems, hyperactivity, pro-social behavior. And these are a combination of internalizing and externalizing mental health difficulties, which is why it's my measure of overall mental health. And then I look specifically at anxiety and depressive symptoms and this is my RCADS, my revised child and anxiety scale. So this specifically looks at more internalizing mental health challenges. So typically when we talk about mental health, we, are, we often in our discourse think about anxiety, depression, trauma. These are more internalizing uh, mental health difficulties. But I wanted to capture both internalizing and externalizing, which is why I use the two. Um, and then I had the teachers in my sample um, report on all their students in their classes. So I used a short um, SDQ tool to just get a sense of what the teachers' observations were of, of their students. And then, of course, admin data for my school test results and my attendance. Um, so that those are my outcomes. And what I do here is I do a standard diff and diff to tease out this relationship. Really She said on WhatsApp? No. Okay, so we have a technical difficulty. Could you post, you post it? Okay, it looks like we've lost Jen. Can we can we move to Miriam and then come back to her? We can move to Miriam. And then, okay. Jen, are you there? Okay, so we are suggesting to move on to Miriam. Rusty, could you shut up and tell her? Tell her we are moving to Miriam, right? Thanks. Sorry. Good, thanks. Sorry about that. Hopefully we get back to Jen at some point. So let's move to Miriam. 
Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm sorry to be interrupting Jen's presentation, I feel like. Uh, but anyways, my paper is called, and it is a paper, and I draw deeply on the anthropological tradition and feeling very much a fish out of water here. So I do want to make that distinction. This is a paper, not a presentation. And it's called the ninth, tenth dipole system. Slightly pretentious, I grant you, especially as a non-physicist, but I hope uh, you will be in greater sympathy by the end of the paper. Let me begin by situating my paper. First, by acknowledging its origins as part of a multi-country, multi-method study called uh, uh, Understanding the Secondary Education Experiences of Youth in Marginalized Communities in Colombia, India, and Malawi. And it was led by professors Chilkar, Kendall, and Lushai, and funded by the Wild Spencer Foundation. And it was as, as part of this study that I carried out, uh, I have been carrying out classroom and community-based ethnographic research in Padapur village since 2021 April. Badapur is home to a majority of scheduled caste or Adi Draberda households, once indentured agricultural labourer. Uh, these households have, in the last 30 to 40 years, increasingly shifted into a variety of daily wage work in nearby urban centres. These abundant but precarious livelihood opportunities have also drawn a growing number of migrants to Badapur in the last 15 years predominantly from the MBC or the most backward communities, but also from tribal, tri tribal Irular and Kuruvar communities. It is these student groups that are primarily served uh, by Padapur Seoul Government High School, where I spent most of my time. Part of a rural educational block, the school is administered by the Adi, Dravida and Tribal Welfare Department, hence welfare school in local and policy parlance. The Padapur Welfare School is one of 3,000 plus high schools in Tamil Nadu offering upper primary, which is 6 to 8 grades, as well as the high school grades of 9th and 10th. And if ASO reports are to be believed, uh, over the last decade, between 25 and 35 percent of 8th graders in rural Tamil Nadu were unable to read at second grade levels. Upper primary classes, as many of you might know, are no detention classes. That is, students are promoted from 6th to 7th to 8th, irrespective of performance. In contrast, however, the high school years culminate in the high stakes high, high school exams, the 10th board exams, which effectively determine students' educational futures. On these board exams, welfare schools have tended to underperform in terms of student pass rates in comparison to other schools in Tamil Nadu. And it is in this broad context of structural and educational marginalization, exacerbated, of course, by COVID, that I joined Padupur's newest ninth grade cohort as it started high school in July 2021. Of the 58 students in the two sections, about 60% belonged to Adi Dravidan and tribal households, and over a third was identified as BPL or below poverty line. How did this cohort, variously socially and educationally marginalized, experience high school? This paper attempts an answer drawing on over 20 months I spent with the students as they moved from 9th to 10th and sat the board exams in April this year. In the process, the paper also offers a commentary on the constraints and contradictions of the state education system that shaped students' lives. Finally, I situate my research in an anthropology of policy. Unlike evaluation studies that take policy as the given, with the unfortunate consequence of producing daily life in schools and classrooms as variously inadequate or deviant, an anthropological approach seeks to foreground its policy, what teachers and students actually do in classrooms, how they interpret and cope with policies and educational systems. To the classroom then, the, the Kabaddi and Kadai classrooms of the ninth grade, where free periods far outnumbered instructional classes for much of the year. My notes record endless Kabaddi games for the boys. The girls argued endlessly about TV dramas and film songs and exchanged Urukadai, village gossip. But if I was frustrated about lost time on the heels of the lost pandemic years, students felt differently. It was a time to be jolly together after the lonely lockdown months. Plus, as one of the girls remind, reminded me, they were still in ninth grade. There was time enough to study in the 10th. 
the number of teacherless classrooms today, I tut tut in my September observations, watching students noisily spill out into the corridor. There was another teacher's meeting in the headmaster's room. The following day, worried the boys might come to harm during a particularly rowdy kabaddi game, I find Mrs. N, their teacher, at the school's office computer. Office work, she grimaced. With no clerk at the school, much of the reporting tasks fell to her. She was one of the younger teachers and clearly tech savvy, therefore. The school had no computer lab assistant either, so Mrs. N was also responsible for the monthly computer-based assessment surveys. Two days each month, she sighed, before wondering if I could teach her classes instead. Indeed, by November, I was something of a mainstay in the school's daily substitution register. Teach something, anything, Mrs. L, the, the timetabler would coax while muttering bitterly. With 10 teachers and 10 classrooms, hers was an often impossible task. The local government elections were held in November, so teachers were pressed into their mandatory election duties. Saturdays were instructional days because it was a COVID-shortened academic year, but instead teachers were doing block-level election duties and trainings and registering voters in their wards. And it was only in February that instructional opportunity improved. December and January had festivals and uh, the half yearly exams. Uh, of course, even in February, teachers continue to be interrupted. School exchange visits, intramural competitions, science exhibitions, school management committee meeting preparations, treasury department submissions, I could go on, but at least the demands were less intense. A normal interrupted school day, the notes from this time Riley observe. By March, however, with the 10th board exams drawing close, teachers' focus increasingly shifted to the 10th graders, and the 9th graders were left to their own devices again. Yes, they had in-class assignments to complete, typically copying out answers from textbooks, but for the most part, they fell back into kabaddi and kadai routines. No wonder then that in May, when students wrote the ninth annual exam, many students turned in answer papers that were largely blank or only attempted the one mark questions. Some had merely copied the questions out. I was sad and horrified. But teachers and students were far more sanguine. They had seen it all before, Mrs. N shrugged. The pandemic had made things worse, but Varsha Varsham ninth na iprida. This was the ninth grade, year after year, this was how it was. Mrs. C agreed, this was students' first year in high school. Press them too much and you might lose them entirely. Only if you let them be a little free now, could you catch them properly in the 10th, she explained. You will see, Mrs. G promised, once they are in the 10th grade, we will squeeze them nicely. We will set them to write before the board exams. Students echoed the sentiment. They reassured me as they had done so many times in the past year. Dentalapathoclamis, we'll see to it in the 10th. And indeed, by November, my notes were full of exclamations about the serious stone of the classroom. Now the 10th classroom, as this expert uh, excerpt goes, I leave you to read it. Study, 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 the teachers exhorted every class and every special class period as the 10th grade feverishly prepared for the half yearly exam in December. The half yearly was the first full portion exam and this was scheduled across the state so that the whole system was focused on the board exam right in December, the board exam being in April. But to be tested on the entire syllabus in December, six months after 10th grade classes had begun, six months after a year of Kabaddi and Kadai, if I was astounded by such ambition, teachers and students responded vigorously. Class time was practicing, problem set after sample question paper, doing one and two mark worksheets, writing tests reported to their parents every week. Class time was also often morning to night hour-long special classes at school before and after the school day and almost a third of the students also paid for extra tuitions late in the evening. Class time was full on and all the time. 10th graders had no PE classes, no library classes, no craft classes and from February onwards Saturdays and Sundays were also spent at school doing mock exams and big questions, teachers and students both being there. 
So from the teacherless classrooms of the ninth grade to the non-stop 10th grade classroom, what had happened? Abish, newly earnest 10th grader Abish, thought for a moment before saying, when I was in ninth grade, the teachers didn't come to class. We didn't study, they didn't teach us. But teachers were strict now, his classmate Emma noted. There was none of the storytelling of the ninth grade. We were a junior class then. That's why they didn't care about us. They were taking care of the 10th students instead. But now we are going to write the board exam. So every teacher comes to class and even takes special classes. In fact, teachers were actually fighting with each other over taking classes. If anyone dared interrupt them for official work, she just pointed to the board on the blackboard saying, there is the board exam, go away. Such was the power of the 10th board exam to the exclusion of competing priorities. In order to squeeze as much class time as possible into every extended school day. A stark contrast to the ninth grade, where classroom instruction was all too readily crowded out by teachers' non-instructional responsibilities. There was nothing incidental about such contrast, however. In fact, they enabled and reinforced each other. Ashrija, one of the ninth grade toppers, astu astutely noted, last year, teachers fully concentrated on the previous batch of 10th graders, so they would have a good result, so they had to neglect us. She wasn't complaining in the least. It was the familiar cycle of schooling after all. This year, she continued, no one cares about the ninth grade. All the teachers are fully focused on us. Indeed, what sustained this peculiar cycle of neglect and focus was the sheer contrast. It was precisely by being the anti-10th grade that the ninth grade produced the 10th grade classroom as an exceptionalist, almost magical space. In the process, enabling a dramatic, almost superhuman concentration of teacher time and student effort. That is, the 10th grade transformation both required and justified the teacher deprived and learning poor ninth grade classroom. A ninth, 10th dipole system, if you will, that essentially constituted high school in Badapur. That this ninth, 10th dipole reproduces itself year on year reflects its relative success, as the recently released board exam results reveal. But the poor school achieved a remarkable pass percentage of 82%. A final ethnographic vignette. April 2023, week of the 10th board exams, I'm chatting with Nishit and Viran about the upcoming English paper. I'll pass, miss, don't worry. Just don't ask me to read, Nishet said. Vera nodded his agreement. He didn't understand English yet, but he would score 40 marks on the exam, no doubt. And so it came to pass. The boys were not able to read or understand English, but with scores of 46 and 45, they most certainly passed the exam. If the ninth, 10th dipole is a success in peripheries like Padapur, what does that say of the larger school system within which it emerges and is sustained? In the first instance, that efficacious as it was, it was more performative than performance. Nishit and Weiran were aware of the difference. They knew they couldn't read English. But between the exam-focused rituals in 10th grade and the sacrifice of the 9th grade, the difference was rendered tolerable for students. In the second instance, the 9th, 10th dipole merely makes a virtue of necessity. The neglect-focused cycle of teacher time that sets up the dipole is nothing but a pragmatic response to scarce teacher time. Favorable PTR ratios obscure the fact that the average high school in Tamil Nadu has just about 10 teachers. Any teacher absence, therefore, for any reason, however momentary, whatever official work or illness, results in classrooms outnumbering available teachers. This situation is exacerbated by a chronic lack of support staff in an increasingly data-hungry school system seeking accountability. Whether new data demands or the expensive welfare role of the government's expansive welfare role of the government school, it is teachers who remain the last mile duty bearers. 
Finally, the ninth tent dipole is an adjustment by teachers and students of two irreconcilable sets of logic. The no detention regime that emphasizes schooling for all and the high stakes regime that sorts and labels teachers and students. In a poorly resourced school system, one where the state has repeatedly refused its commitment to invest 6% of GDP in public education, the dipole is simply the efficient deployment of scarce teacher time in the board exam classes, even if at the expense of other classrooms, and even if performative rather than performance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. We are back. Jen is back with us. So, Jen, you have seven minutes to finalize the second part of your presentation. Please share your slides. Thank slide. you, Julius. Um, I will just go to the results. Uh, yeah. Basically, all I wanted to show you from my specification is that we look out for the interaction effect here, the B3 coefficients. So I'll just keep it moving. Um, and that I satisfied all the key assumptions under this um, method. Um, my sample size for the study was 1,297 uh, students. And um, we have Tau students, uh, uh, the treated group, and the comparison group, uh, the waitlisted Tau students who are yet to receive the program, who are receiving a business as usual study hour. Um, so for each cohort, there's a baseline measure before the for the TAL um, implementation and an endline measure. And I would, I would mention that I worked directly with um, the government implementation model, which is um, run by the national service participants. So um, these participants are, of course, trained and supported um, by the youth impact team as well. Uh, so, yes, next. Um, so the main headline results here is that I find that, are we looking at the same thing? Yes. I find that teaching at the right level significantly reduces the mental health difficulties of children that are exposed to the pedagogy compared to children that are yet to be exposed to the pedagogy, um, specifically by 0.15 standard deviations um, at the 10% level. And I find um, more interestingly that it increases the pro-sociality, um, pro-social behavior of the kids that are exposed to the, the intervention compared to the kids that are not yet exposed to the intervention. Specifically on anxiety and depression, I don't find any significant um, effect here, any meaningful effect, even though I can see it's moving in the right direction. And I'd like to note that I'm, I'm talking about screening for different difficulties, because I think you have to be careful a little bit with language in terms of researching mental health that I'm not talking about diagnostic measures. So I'm not diagnosing anyone with anxiety or depression, but rather being screened for symptoms of, of these challenges. Um, as expected, there are differential effects by baseline mental health difficulties. So those who had a higher level of um, whether total difficulties measured by the SDQ or anxiety and depressive um, difficulties had even greater benefits because of TAL. So they experienced a 0.5 standard deviation uh, in total difficulties. So a reduction in total difficulties compared to their non-TAL counterparts. Um, unfortunately, in this study, I find that there are null effects on my education success um, outcomes. So that's on test scores and attendance. And we can dig into this later, um, a little bit in our discussion. I didn't put my regression output here, um, but on attendance, I will, I will say that, you know, I didn't have a full sample because I'm collecting admin data. And on education outcomes, um, on test scores, sorry, a limitation of the studies that I, I wasn't using the TAL assessment um, tool or the as a type tool, um, but rather the admin data collected from the school, so the school-based test results. So it's, it's possible that this is a limitation, but also see it as an opportunity, um, because I think that as policymakers are making decisions based off their own data that they're collecting, which would be the school-based test results, it would it's possible that we can include um, the TAL assessment as well as um, school admin data in future much larger studies than what I, I can show here. And also interestingly, the recent paper by Rachel Meager and uh, Noam Angris did show the variance that happens um, in, in a lot of these education interventions um, due to implementation challenges and, and delivery models. So I, I think I'm citing delivery models here as 
maybe having a lower effect than a direct delivery model because this was done through the national service participants. Okay. A few um, things that the, uh, the teachers and education officers said um, that I thought was quite interesting to highlight from the chief education officer in the region that I was working in said, you know, TAL reinforces key concepts and builds self-esteem and confidence. When they work in small groups, it helps them open up. You can hear their voices. Without that, you don't even know if they understand. And another teacher said, you know, the pupils seem to be open and free, they're confident and free spirited. All of this really supporting the findings that I have. Um, and another teacher saying even slow learners are freely participating in class. Some used to display bad behavior, but these days there's positive change. So to sum up, I think this, uh, my main takeaways is that these results that I, I show are really in line with the growing literature demonstrating how education interventions can support the mental health and overall well-being of young people, specifically that student-centered pedagogies that are activity-based include peer learning, no corporal punishment, have been shown to um, improve psychosocial outcomes. And in TAL, what we have observed is that the ease with which students ask questions, the inclusion inclusion of structured play activities such as energizers, the use of small group peer activities to reinforce um, concepts, of course, no corporal punishments. All of these things are creating a positive school climate for students. So really what I wanted to highlight is that I, I, I believe that there are opportunities um, to leverage these ongoing uh, education interventions that we have in the space to think more broadly about how they affect students' mental health and overall well-being, how we can connect the two, because there, there really is a strong evidence base for the two connecting. And that this, um, I believe, also fills an important research gap, presenting one of the first studies linking teaching at the right level to mental health. But there are, there's so much more evidence that's needed to inform more context-relevant policy. So with that, I will say thank you for your attendance. I apologize for the technology issues, but I hope I have been clear and you've been able to get where I'm going with the study. Thank you, Julius. Thank you, Jen. Neji. Uh, thank you. For a think tank, we are based in Nigeria. Um, our name is uh, Center for Study of Economics of Africa. And um, this work I'm about to present is actually a joint work uh, between the center and researchers from uh, RISE. Um, um, I mean, Julius, uh, Mitchell, Rasti, and my colleagues, um, Sistus um, is online, and um, we, we will be presenting this together. So, um, I'll be speaking about instructional alignment in Nigeria using survey of an Arctic uh, curriculum. And um, the, the, the key thing here is the fact that um, as education practitioners or academia that we are in this room, um, we will have heard about um, concepts around uh, in, uh, incoherence, about uh, misalignment, about the pace of curriculum in recent times or literature. And one of these points to the fact that uh, there is an issue that uh, I imagine out of that. However, um, sometimes this concept actually looks like an abstract um, or theory that is far from reality. In this work using the uh, SEC tool, we are trying to actually uh, really concretize this, uh, what do we mean by misalignment and um, where do misalignment occur and um, what are the pace of the curriculum? And what does all of these, what, what do they mean for um, learning in, in, in the classrooms? So um, as a background, I mean, um, global literature suggests the fact that um, uh, disparity between standards, between uh, classroom instructions and assessment are quite common. And when this is present, we tend to actually see um, um, low learning outcomes. Um, and these are kind of the source of uh, misalignment in the system. So what I were trying to do is, where is this misalignment? Why is this uh, misalignment? And um, how do we begin to think about this misalignment? So um, we embark on this study, um, trying to answer these two questions. To evaluate uh, the extent of alignment across instructional components uh, in the primary school system in Nigeria, 
and also to investigate the curriculum pace across um, primary one to primary six uh, in, in Nigerian uh, education system. This is actually one area or one part of the objective that I think is quite in, uh, novel in, in, in this study because um, we, uh, this um, methodology has been applied more around um, trying to answer the question of uh, alignment, but not in the area of um, pace of the curriculum. So SEC methodology, uh, in, in one breath, you could look at it as um, uh, looking at four things and trying to see what is going on around those four things. So um, think of curriculum as a formal document that is produced by policymakers, right? By the time this policy document moves from policymakers into the classroom, we talked about enacted curriculum. Most times they are not the same anymore. And so to what, what are the differences in, in, in between the two? By the time this moves from teachers to students, we talked about um, land curriculum. Again, that might be really, really different. And also when we move from even what is assessed uh, uh, to, to the student and what is there as learned, it will also be different. But also we could talk about assessed uh, curriculum and the intended one, about the enacted one and in different ways. So there are quite a number of ways that misalignment uh, could take place in the system. So what we are trying to do with this SEC methodology is to uh, ask the question around especially what happened with the curriculum and the uh, assessment, what happened between the curriculum and, uh, and uh, classroom instructions. And the methodology as um, a combination of qualitative and quantitative approach, whereby um, you bring in a panel of experts, um, this panel of experts, um, they come from the curriculum body, assessment bodies, policy bodies, teachers, school administrators. And all of these people actually, they, they, they sit together in order to actually look at this document, uh, uh, I mean, the curriculum, uh, look at the uh, assessment tools. And all of them actually give a kind of what we call a ranking of the cognitive demand in each of these uh, 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 items. But more importantly, we also take these tools to the teachers in the classrooms. And when teachers also will be doing the same thing, such at the end of the day, we could see how it is uh, the, the thought process of the framework of the curriculum, the process, uh, uh, I mean, to also the people making the assessment, the teachers, and all of this in order to actually uh, uh, fit everything together to see what, what we are, uh, are they not speaking to one another. Yeah, so um, the study was conducted in Nigeria. Um, we focused on two subjects, English and mathematics. And uh, because we are talking about uh, basic education, uh, the, that role actually is being take, uh, uh, taken by uh, state government. And so we focus on two states, Oyo State and Jigawa State. One is in the southern part of the country, the other is in the northern part of the country. Overall, we uh, uh, looked at 100 public primary schools, and in each of these schools, we uh, uh, randomize and uh, select teachers that are uh, conversant in both um, uh, English and mathematics. Also, we, we, we also uh, randomize between people uh, teaching at the lower level and upper primary. Overall, 200 teachers actually were surveyed uh, for this work. Um, so in terms of the analysis, uh, we focused on um, two parts. One is within component alignment. And that speaks to the fact that um, um, the curriculum, what is the pace of the curriculum itself? The, I mean, from primary one to primary six. Uh, also, we look at the teacher's instruction. What is the progression and pace of that instruction uh, from primary one to primary six? But also, we look at the uh, 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 exam results. This is actually a national exam conducted in Nigeria. We collected three of these exams, and the data we have actually is at item level, such that we are not just looking at how many passed, but in what topic area are they actually uh, the success rate across uh, this uh, 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 item. Items. Also, we are going to be looking at um, across uh, component uh, alignment. We're looking at um, curriculum versus uh, exam alignment, uh, curriculum versus teacher instruction, and also the instruction versus exam alignment. So I will show you some results. Um, I believe most people will know how this should be interpreted, but this you're actually looking at a 3D graph. Uh, it has three dimensions. Here we have the topics, where we have the cognitive demand, and the color you see is actually showing depth. 
in terms of the coverage of each of the two. So by the, when I'm interpreting this, you look at the intersection of this and this and the color in, in, in that space to see the depth of that. For example, when you look at um, primary one to primary three, you could see that uh, uh, the emphasis is on number and numeration and also to some extent measurement and also basic uh, uh, operation. That's actually the three main topics that's uh, widely covered in the curriculum. But when you look at uh, the other axes, you find out that the more cognitive demand uh, that's in the size in the curriculum is around memorize, uh, pro uh, procedure, performing procedure, and to less, lesser extent uh, to demonstrate the knowledge that has been picked up. Um, so by, but by the time we move to uh, upper primary, primary four to primary five, uh, six, sorry, you see that the emphasis still remains around numbers, basic operation, and also measurements, but some element of trigonometry and everyday statistics has Overall, when we combine all of this, you could see the fact that uh, these three topics accounted for 70% of what we have in the curriculum in terms of how the curriculum objectives were, uh, were highlighted. Now, what about the pace of the curriculum in this space? Again, in interpreting this, you can look at two aspects. I mean, the upper part actually, we, we call that the cross grain alignment measures. And here we have the fine grain alignment measures. This is just alignment across topics. So look at numbers. There are many things on that numbers, but when you look at number alone, that's the alignment you see. But when you look at the component other numbers, that's actually this fine, uh, fine grain alignment, and that's what you see. So expectedly, you, are, you, you will know that this actually will have lesser alignment compared to this. But I mean, uh, what is of importance in the result here is this. If you look at the level uh, of alignment, uh, when you move from primary, I mean, lower primary to upper primary, you find that, that I mean, uh, the level of alignment is quite high. I mean, this is 0. Uh, 0.75. But as we move to the upper primary, a little it drops, which means at the lower primary, the pace of the curriculum is actually quite slow. And when you move to the higher level, the pace is a little bit higher. And the same thing when you even look at the fine grain in, in, in that area. So we can really see that curriculum as we move from uh, one level to the other, it's actually quite uh, slow, which is actually an ideal system. What, you, what, you, what we like to see or what the literature tends to say, okay, the curriculum should not be too fast. But when you look at, um, what is taking place in, in, in the classroom in terms of uh, teacher's instruction. Uh, again, when you look at what is being covered, numbers... Five minutes. Oh! <laughs> no, <laughs> numbers, basic operation, it's also actually uh, more advanced, but you could see that teachers, in, in a way, uh, uh, two topics really, really dominate in the classroom compared to uh, the three that we talked about in the curriculum. And same level of cognitive demand also domin uh, dominates in the class in terms of memorize and uh, procedures. So what about the uh, a kind of uh, pace of the curriculum in the classroom? We find that that actually pace even becomes slower in the upper primary compared to in the lower primary, which is actually what you don't expect. So teachers are actually not moving as fast as they should, or the curriculum is expected, expecting them to move. So you ask these two questions, why are teachers not moving? Is it that they don't have the con uh, 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 content expertise in order to actually uh, 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 go into those higher levels? Or, teach, or, or uh, students are also not picking up what they need to be picking up, so that it's forcing teachers to actually concentrate on lower, lower level, such that slowing down. To, so, but the, the curriculum Curriculum in this case is very slow. Uh, in terms of assessment, it also covers, but assessment is actually quite broader than what we see in both instruction and, uh, and, and curriculum in terms of its emphasis. This is actually more spread. In terms of performance, when we look at the performance in mathematics, you find that the performance is quite low. In no cases do we have uh, this, uh, I mean, performance level uh, exceeding 50%. But what is actually quite uh, 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 curious is the fact that uh, when you see areas where students are performing a lot or much better, you find that it's actually area that is less covered cover in the classrooms. And I think one reason for that is because it's less covered, one of the, when you look at the assessment around that level, it's mostly around memorization. So students are actually about to pass. But even when, uh, for concept that is covered in the classrooms, 
even when you move from memorization to procedure or to demonstrate, even little movement in cognitive demand, failure rate actually spikes up, even though it's actually uh, being covered in the classroom. So that points to one uh, uh, part of the story we, we are seeing here is the fact that uh, the cognitive demand also, I mean, in terms of where you concentrate on, uh, also uh, matters in terms of the student being able to even effectively respond when it comes to exam conditions uh, that they will face, which is not going to in, a, in any way be similar to what uh, they have in the classrooms. I have less than three minutes, so I don't want to really go too much into the literacy. The result I would say for the literacy is actually quite similar to what we see in the numeracy. In fact, the curriculum is slower in, in, in that area, and more importantly, Importantly, uh, we see some of the findings in terms of shallowness of um, uh, what you see in the exam compares to teacher's instruction. So let me just go into the um, to alignment issues that um, uh, emerge out of uh, these studies. Number one is that the pace of the curriculum is slow. And that raises the question around what is going on. Is it the teacher's uh, uh, competencies that is slowing it or the, uh, uh, or the student grasp of the knowledge? Also, uh, in terms of cognitive demand, concentration has tend to be on the procedure knowledge and less on the conceptual understanding. And instructions and examination has uh, one of the lowest level of alignment. Uh, performance level is in, in lower uh, uh, topics less covered uh, in the curriculum and instructions have a quite higher uh, number of uh, uh, achievements the, in terms of success rate. And one explanation, I mean, that we could point out in, in our analysis is the fact that level of cognitive demand in the assessment really, really explains this divergence. So part of how we are trying to summarize or make sense of all of this is the fact that um, uh, this is pointing to the fact that alignment matters, but the dimension at which that alignment takes place matters even much more. What we are saying here is what you can see in this matrix you look at the standard and instruction and assessment. And when, uh, when you talk about alignment between the two, if it is towards uh, lower cognitive demand, you still don't see learning, take, uh, learning will not take place in the classrooms. You have to actually see that trans, I mean, that kind of alignment uh, converging towards this higher level of cognitive demand for us to actually see concrete learning taking place in our classrooms. Okay, thank you. I save you 20 seconds. <laughs> Okay. Let's come. Okay. Just take your seat. Okay, thank you. Jen, are you there? We are going for the discussion. Yes, Julius, I'm still here. Great. Here we go. Okay, so we'll take, we'll follow the same procedure as earlier on. Take the three questions and then We'll also get an opportunity to get questions from online. Yes, we'll begin with Matthew. Maybe anybody this side? Another hand? Okay, we'll take this. Okay, please. Hi, I'm Matthew Dukes, RTI. My question is for Jennifer. Um, I loved both halves of your presentation. Um, and really fantastic, much needed data on mental health in schools in Africa. Um, on the outcomes, I, I feel like when you're using a self-rated scale to measure a, an intervention in a new context, you have to do a little bit of work to convince us that you've measured a generalized shift in um, pro-sociality, for example, um, which is tough to do. But one, one question, specific question I could ask is, do you have um, some information about the specific items that that uh, were impacted? Like, for example, there's an item in the SDQ which is, I finished work successfully or something like that, which you know you could see mapping very closely onto TAL. Um, and others like, I worry a lot, which are a bit more generalized. So I'd love to know a bit more about that. And also your negative coefficients on pro-sociality, which I didn't understand. I'd like you to explain that if you can. There's a positive and two negative. Okay. Thank you. Over right here. Debbie. Thank you. Hi, my question is also for Jennifer. Um, <laughs> 
echoing um, Matthew's praise as well. I'm curious whether you saw any heterogeneity in terms of mental health outcomes among students for whom Tara worked really well um, and those who tended to struggle more, um, if you were able to disaggregate by that. And your neighbor? Yeah, my, my question is also for Jennifer. I'm <laughs> sorry about that. So just extending from what Debbie was saying, so my questions are related to one gender, second is learning disability. So just wondering, like, have you run any moderation analysis to see whether teaching at right level would, for example, like work better for like children with dys uh, dyslexia or dyscalculia, which would be even more amazing because these children tend to like, struggle a lot with uh, you know, mental health in an academic learning environment. Okay, we'll take other questions. Please don't ask Jane questions. Yeah. Let's ask the panelists here. So we have Bella over there. Oh, you gotta come in the other way. Do I have someone this side? Yes, there's a hand there. So I'm gonna be then. sneaky. One to Miriam, um, and then a small one to uh, <laughs> not saying. So Miriam, uh, I think I, I was just fascinated. I just super loved your work, but I was just wondering. If you also considered um, the, you know, out of classroom, out of school learning, things were happening in in ninth. I mean, I uh, in 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 grade nine. Uh, so I wonder if there were any measures at all to look at how students were dead spending time, whether doing kabaddi or other things. But surely something was happening. Did that lead to their something from the non-academic space? Uh, and then finally cramming it all in in grade 10. That's a question to you, whether you at all considered that. And one tiny question is there that, and back to Tal, is that there has been an issue that the way we've been looking at measurement of Tal, it's about literacy and numeracy, but not social emotional learning. And, you know, here is a space that is, uh, we still sort of groping with measures for social emotional learning in the way, uh, the Global Coalition for Accelerated Learning for Foundation Learning is coming together. How do you look at that end of the definition of um, foundation learning, literacy, numeracy, and plus? Thank you. Okay. okay. Hi, uh, my name is Stephen from South Africa. Uh, my question is for Miko. Um, can you tell me a bit more about how you estimated your treatment intensity effect? Uh, I know I've always struggled to to kind of measure the effect of the treated on where, on where treatment was implemented with more fidelity. It's kind of like something we obviously want to do. So I'm interested to you, how did you actually estimate that? Thanks. Thank you. Anybody has a question for Deji? The last paper? Yes? I think I can go. Okay. <laughs> People online will hear you unless you have the mic. That's fine. It's for our online audience. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, no, Deji, I think uh, I can't remember, uh, but Lant was presenting a similar paper, or maybe it was from the same uh, context as yours. But, uh, you know, I know, uh, fairly understand the incoherences you found broadly in terms of, you know, uh, the curriculum and then teaching practices and ultimately what is being assessed. But just thoughts on, you know, what, what sort of policy recommendations could come in as a, any country, you know, most of uh, many countries would go through either a first a curriculum revision, right? Everything else will follow. So what, what are you telling the people who are potentially or countries or contexts who are potentially either starting to do a curriculum or starting to, let's say, uh, particularly for many other countries, starting to enact the curriculum in the classrooms? Any, any, any thoughts on that? I know you rushed, so probably giving you that chance to talk about it in detail. Great. So we'll answer those. And then after that, we'll also pick questions from online. Okay. Jen, are you there? Yes, Julius. I hope I cover all the questions, but if I miss anyone, you can always follow up. So the first question was Matthew from RTI, I believe, and he spoke about um, doing some convincing on the skills. And I, I absolutely agree. Of course, these are self-report skills. And um, there is always that question of how much do we believe this? Um, but this is a standard in the field in terms of 
how we how we measure some of these mental health outcomes that we care about. Um, I, I did try and interrogate it a little bit, having the teachers also report on their observations of the students. I didn't actually see any differential effects there between those who were exposed to tell and those who were not exposed to tell. And then in terms of the subscales, you had said something about a decrease in pro-sociality that you wanted to understand. What I was showing was rather a significant increase in pro-sociality. So the subconstructs in um, the SDQ, pro-sociality is one of them. And the way that the outcome is constructed is that total difficulties includes all of these externalizing and internalizing subscales, excluding pro-sociality because it moves in the opposite direction. So all of the subscales like inattention, emotion problems, peer problems are all grouped together called total difficulties. And then pro-sociality stands alone. So are you asking like if I could see mapping onto some of the questions that specifically map onto Tal, I was careful not to decrease construct the subscales too much um, because I thought it would raise more questions like your first question around like how much can we trust these skills so I wanted it to be a more robust skill because it is designed to really um, holistically capture all of these things that are going on um, and then the second question I think was from Debbie if I got your name correctly and was on heterogeneity for those who tell work specifically well this is a really good um, question, and I, I have to say I haven't interrogated this with my study sample because I, I took it from the hypothesis that in improving the school climate for students, we would find an overall increase in mental health um, for the, the students that were exposed to Tau. So it was less about looking at it from the education side because there's such a robust literature already on the education outcomes. So even though I found null effects, it wasn't such a concern because my main um, objective was to really show what else could be done with, with TAL to leverage this ongoing um, intervention already. And, and just to give some context that uh, prior to my doctoral research, um, I worked with Youth Impact as their TAL program manager and their research manager. So I was seeing this in action. I, there was a lot of anecdotal evidence that I was collecting um, that I really wanted to investigate and test further. So that's really the impetus for the study. Um, Julia, should I answer the last question? Yeah, yeah. Do you want to tie that with the social emotional learning issues? What's that? The, the, that was, that was Baylor's question, isn't it? Yes, I think so. But I didn't quite get what the question was for social emotional learning. It's measures. 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 Oh, yes. So I wasn't testing social emotional learning or life skills. I wasn't quite testing for that. But yes, there is such an opportunity for that. Um, but this study was specifically testing for specific mental health difficulties. Um, but yeah, I think this is an ongoing co conversation and should be incorporated in all of our assessments of TAL because there's obviously a clear mapping onto SEL. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Jen. We'll come into here and uh, Miriam. I'm not sure I fully understood the question, but it's you, you seem to want to know uh, what else ninth grade students are doing out of class. Out of class, uh, I, I I I don't know what to say in response, but uh, some, the, the subtext seems to be that kabaddi and kadai was not was somehow nothing, and I want to sort of push back and say no for the students in the class. Uh, I mean, these are not sort of, you know, dopes, they enjoyed it. This meant a lot to them doing the kabaddi and the kadai, especially after a year of COVID. And, you know, these are contexts, rural contexts, where often there are no commons outside the school. So for them to not have been in a common space, but sort of isolated into their own homes, for them to have this chance uh, was brilliant. But the larger point also is that this was enabled by a sort of larger systemic failure about not having teachers, a larger systemic failure about not actually responding uh, in any real way to COVID outside the learning loss narrative, as if that was the only thing that happened during COVID. Uh, so yes, uh, I just want to underline Kabardi and Kadai was very important, and that made sense for students where they were. Okay, Micho, intensity. Yeah, thanks for your question. So the way we calculated just the mechanics of it is look at the number of cycles that were implemented in a school, and then they get assigned a percent. So if you implemented three cycles, 
out of five, that becomes 60%, so 0 0.6. So all the schools get on the scale of zero to one in terms of treatment intensity, and then an IV regression where that's instrumented with the random assignment. But uh, also something that I'll just mention quickly uh, to add some context as well, is that we had two assumptions that we list in the paper for this to work, where you have to assume that treatment effects scale linearly with program implementation, and then also that uh, in the control group schools, that potential treatment effects are uncorrelated with weeks of implementation of the program. So we think these are reasonable assumptions for this context that students likely benefited from more weeks of instruction. And then also thinking about that it was the qualitative evidence from the process evaluation that really cemented it for us that they just implemented weeks of the program because they were confused about their treatment assignments. So having that qualitative evidence helped us make that assumption. But if you think about using this, it's good to think about those as well. Okay, Deji. Okay, so thanks. Um, in terms of what should policymakers be thinking about, um, I will not be strong in saying this is what you should do. I would rather be saying this is what you should be thinking more around, and I think that is around the classrooms. If you look at the um, alignment issues that were raised, um, I think most of them tends to concentrate within the classroom in terms of uh, slower pace, um, uh, misalignment of uh, the, uh, the the instruction and, and the exams, and even uh, the cognitive demand uh, within the classroom. So, it just points to the fact that there is a lot going in the classroom that we don't understand and we need to unravel. And we used to, uh, I mean, we need to use that as a basis for any intervention we are designing. Okay, we'll take another round of questions. Still have twelve minutes. Yes, there's one hand. There is one hand over here. Sorry, I missed the first. Where's the first one? And there is there's a hand there. So you could begin with Amanda. Yeah, begin from where you are. Yes, begin with that. Behind you. Hi, my question's for Jennifer. Is that okay, Julius? Yeah. Okay, cool. Hi, everyone. Um, okay, so this question is a little bit about dose and also who's delivering the program. Right, so as I understand it, these children are getting you know, a one hour trial class and that's being delivered by TSPs or um, basically teacher aides, let's say. And, and these teacher aides are, and so as I understand it, the teachers in the school are not being trained in TARL and they're not delivering TARL, it's just the TSPs. Is that right? No, okay. So my question is, um, I'll, I'm trying to get it spill over here because it seems like you're having a big effect from a one hour kind of intervention. And I'm wondering if other teachers in the school are also being exposed to TARL, maybe these TARL methodologies are kind of spilling over into their other non-TARL classes, right? If you're training teachers on this methodology on kind of how to interact with children and the children are, are really responding to it, I'm wondering if they're using methods in their other class, right? So ultimately my question is, are, you know, if you had any interviews with, with teachers, are you seeing that they're using these TARL type methods in throughout the school day and not just this one TARL hour? Okay, over here. Sorry. My question is to Miriam. It seems like these high stakes tests in grade 10 had a real big effort uh, impact on the effort of teachers and, and students and they didn't do anything in grade nine. Now, I would think it's much more efficient to actually spare your effort over grade nine and grade 10 and you can do with less work in total, you can actually have higher exam results. But apparently teachers and students don't think that way. Do you know how they were thinking? Okay. Over here. Hi, um, uh, my name is Arvind. I work for Education Initiatives in India. Uh, my question is for Miriam. Uh, first of all, uh, um, a great paper, and I loved your storytelling skills. So, um, uh, my question was with regards to uh, initially when you mentioned that uh, the school was uh, um, situated in a marginalized context uh, for, uh, within the community as well. Um, uh, the experiences that you saw, the sort of the shape of the classroom, so to speak. Uh, 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 the good, the bad, or the whatever, or was that uh, uh, 
only the result of uh, um, like a systemic uh, uh, or a policy based uh, uh, sort of failure or did the marginalized context also have to do with it or was it like an intersectionality between both of them so just the question was how did the marginal context sort of come into play uh, in the construction of that classroom okay did i, I think i saw some hand Hi, uh, Rajesh Singh, PAL Network. Wow. A quick question to the gentleman from ID Insight. Uh, sometimes TAL almost feels like it's either a complementary or parallel track to uh, education. So how difficult is it to actually scale it up? You know, when you're thinking about scaling it up and maintaining the results in a new geography. Thank you. Okay, so let's answer those. Uh, Jen, do you want to go first again? Yes. Um, so in answering my question, I would like to caveat that there are current youth impact people in the room, so they can speak specifically on the ongoing delivery models. But I believe youth impact is in eight out of 10 education regions now and explore various delivery models. But in the study sample that I have, I use um, the national service participants. So those are the ones that are delivering um, the intervention. Not to say that teachers are not delivering the intervention, but that in my study sample, I'm working with the national service participants. So just to provide that clarification. And then um, you ask a really, really good question on how this is mapping onto what's happening in the rest of the hours outside of TAL. I think this is an ongoing conversation, um, thinking about how are the principles of teaching at the right level, how is the pedagogy being inculcated or um, applied to the, the, the various subjects. And there are a few things that I can speak anecdotally about because um, I didn't do the research specifically on this, but just to give you a, a sense of, uh, of my take on it is that there is um, a applied principle and form in that teachers who've observed TAL and teachers who've been trained in TAL are inspired to try things like using smaller groups to do activities, using multiple problems for differentiated um, classrooms and teaching. So some of, some of the, the methods used in TAL are being applied, not to say that they are doing TAL specifically, but they are applying the principles. Now, what also is being observed is that I think what clearly we can see in TAL is that we are expanding the, the toolkits that teachers have. So it's not, it's not so um, like, it, it, it's, it's a, I don't wanna say back to basics, but it, it's just that teachers who've been taught in a certain way are being reminded of their pedagogy that they used to use and are being given additional tools on how to teach certain things that they've been, they've been stuck teaching in one simple way and they're getting other ways of teaching it as well. So what teachers are also asking for is like, can you give us additional tools to teach these other more complicated concepts? So the, I think there is a, a, a research gap there and more that can be done beyond the foundational literacy and numeracy. So there's an opportunity. Thank you, Miriam. The question on high stakes tests. Yes, so the high stakes tests are distorting clearly the system and uh, while I appreciate your question of how are teachers and students thinking about it and sort of assuming that uh, having that spread over two years would be sort of more efficient. Uh, well, A, that choice isn't available because uh, the exam is in grade 10 and you are uh, the, the demands on teacher time are not sort of amortized in quite the same way. So it, the system demands a lot of data. And when you are, and given this high stakes test at the end of uh, high school, I mean, as a teacher, it's far more sensible to make your students work in that one year than somehow find a way or even imagine that you have the control to figure out how your instruction time is going to be spread across the year. So I, I, I actually don't think it's possible. And it's not because they aren't thinking. They're in fact being exceptionally smart about both human psychology 
technology and the fact that you know if you have to make an effort you have to get them at one time all together feed everything in and get them over that exam because that becomes the focus and uh, what's sad is that we don't have adequate teachers i mean clearly these are teachers willing to work you know some of the larger narratives that seem to underlie questions about how students how teachers think seem to be that somehow they think uh, in ways that are self-interested but here are teachers sort of willing to spend their saturdays and sundays working with these students when you know they aren't getting paid extra for it but simply because they recognize that this this certificate is important because that that constitutes the end of sort of basic schooling in India and and that kind of that incentive to get that certificate also then shapes how students think if you are going to make an effort you'd rather make an almighty effort in that one year than try and spread out your effort in some sensible way because well we're not machines in quite the same way I think that's what I'd say uh, Rachel Yes, absolutely. So thank oh, you. Yes, you had a question about sort of the marginalized context. So absolutely. I mean, the marginalized context is part of the systemic uh, structural issue and, and, and the social marginalization sort of is, uh, is, is translating and reflecting in the educational marginalization. You know, pro as, as well as I do that today, anyone with money in India isn't going to a government school. So there are already these structural uh, disadvantages, which are then translating into educational disadvantages, because schools are under-resourced, and the more rural and more peripheral it is, the, the under-resourcing is, is higher. We also know that systemically we do not have enough high schools in rural areas. They're far more of an urban phenomenon. So clearly all of that is just compounding what's happening in the school. Okay, Nichon? Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for your question. Uh, it's definitely a challenging one to answer. To give to say that I know the answer would be hubris, um, but I'll give some of my early thoughts just on, on this in terms of um, how does this scale in, in different geographies. Um, some of the learnings from this work um, highlights the need for having enough teacher capacity to do this and uh, as we highlighted, sort of giving teachers enough training to implement it. And I think those will likely be some cost drivers, the cost of training teachers and, and making sure that it's a sustainable, that's why we wanted to do the cost effectiveness analysis so that is it appropriate for this context, but also just in terms of uh, doing this in different geographies. Um, our team is going to work on a couple of different tall based programs and I'd be interested to speak to them and perhaps I can share those learnings with you, but something that I think is necessary is having enough within school variation within grade variation in skills so that you can actually group them. Uh, we were concerned that if children are starting off from very low levels can you actually group them into different reading levels? So I think in new geographies, just making sure you have that variation in student skills in a classroom so that you can implement TARL is something to consider. Okay, I'll ask Deji a question since we didn't get a second round. So Deji, I think we saw that uh, almost all the components that you have in the study show uh, emphasis on the lower cognitive domains. And so in line with uh, the question on policy, uh, implications. What would you have to say about that on the issue of overemphasis on the lower level cognitive domain? Okay, so thank you. Um, I think even though, I mean, why, why the concentration on this lower cognitive uh, uh, demand was not part of this very study, and I think um, when we begin to analyze this study, we find that it's actually a major issue. And I think we did a subsequent survey in these two states. And what we asked in those surveys were around um, what happened, what are the classroom practices in terms of um, how do you, um, how do, you uh, do some uh, the tests, what are the influence of um, examinations on the classroom, also on what are the kind of um, training around cognitive demand. And about 40% actually has not actually had training, um, even though they passed through teacher training college, they don't actually recall what it, what's, or what even procedure, how is it different from even cognitive. So those kind of very basic concepts that can enable them to translate those different, uh, 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 what, what, what we think as uh, very important in terms of uh, cognitive uh, knowledge, it's not actually present. So for that reason, it's still 
kind of they believe that this is actually how it has been done and and i mean knowing uh, between right or wrong i mean that kind of um understanding is still lacking so i think it is it, it, it's something that is painting a clear picture around the need for capacity around that area i mean like I said, we need to actually understand better what is going on in classrooms and what are teachers in terms of even um, the, the, the extent to which they are emphasizing these different concepts and why are they actually putting emphasis on this more than that, given that, I mean, conceptually, uh, you, you expect that it is this conceptual understanding that is the key. So why are they actually not reaching that level? Is it the problem with the teachers or the problem with the system? I think it's something we need to actually shed more light on. Okay, thank you. So I'll just wrap it up with three main takeaways for me. Targeted instruction programs are important for children's learning, but also for their overall well-being. Uh, the teachers, uh, the case of India that we've heard Miriam talk about, they're adjusting to the realities of the system in which they are operating. And we see this dipole system, which is very confusing and really not the best. You spend a whole year playing and not learning, and then you push to your limits in the final year just because of the exam. But this is how the system is designed. And then finally, both procedural and conceptual competencies are quite important for children to learn because we see that overemphasis on lower levels of cognitive demand actually led to low performance. So thank you so much. Let's thank our panel.
Can I start? Should I go ahead? Okay. 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 Hi, everyone. So, what is the mic working? Okay. So, welcome back from the break. My name is Henata Lemus. I am a senior economist at the World Bank. Um, I actually specifically asked to chair this, section, this session. I'm very excited about this topic. Uh, the session is on implementation. Um, I always liked how diverse um, the RISE crowd is. Uh, I think we all work in different topics. I think one thing that we have in common is that we've all suffered through uh, implementation uh, of programs. I'd say Paul, perhaps, as we've seen today, has suffered way more than we have. Um, <laughs> Um, so this um, session is going to actually, um, the presenters are going to present to you uh, three pieces of work uh, providing uh, research evidence on uh, implementation issues. So Claire um, will first, uh, will show a study uh, that asks which type of education interventions uh, during emergencies at what scalable delivery modes can improve learning uh, across a range of contexts and countries. Noam will then um, go on to, he will go a step further and ask the question about what drives the variation effectiveness, can um, programs be uh, generalizable, and uh, he's going to look at uh, data from five uh, countries or different contexts, and also uh, use the results to inform a new um, RCT in Botswana. And Zara uh, will present a third paper uh, that asks the question of what governments are doing to support uh, implementation from more from a management perspective um, to then achieve uh, improvements in uh, the downstream delivery chain. So three very exciting papers. And I also want to say that this, you know, we've never had a session on implementation, so it's very nice to have one now, even though if we always talk about implementation. Um, but also it's a really nice way to motivate the next session um, which is going to be on a discussion of implementation and also to motivate the work that it's being led now by the work, uh, Works uh, Hub uh, initiative. Thank you. Claire. Awesome. Great. Hi, everybody. So my name is Claire Cullen, and I'm presenting joint work with nine esteemed co-authors, some of whom are in the room. Uh, you can imagine a, an RCTs run across five different countries involved huge teams, and so also some of the research staff are also in the room. Uh, so the title of today's paper is Building Resilient Education Systems, Evidence from Large-Scale Randomized Trials in Five Countries. So the key thing I want you to take away from this slide is that education emergencies are really common and they're really costly. So we've uh, done some web scraping and got a database going of an index of school closure length by the number of affected people by, for disruptions that end up closing schools. And you can see essentially this covers uh, countries around the world and at high frequency. And obviously with climate change, we're going to expect these number of disasters that close schools to increase. So in sum, over 2 billion people live in countries that are affected by shocks that end up disrupting education frequently. And these span things from like pollution, air pollution, teacher strikes, closed schools, conflict, climate disasters, floods, and other natural disasters. Uh, and so in recognition of the scale of the problem, the UN has established a global fund for education called Education Cannot Wait. And they estimate that 220 million children need access to emergency education programs at any point in time. Yet, in spite of the scale of the issue, there's really limited experimental evidence on what works uh, to support children in education emergencies. So we know that there's a large literature on the cost of school disruption, but there's less evidence on ways to stem these learning losses uh, during education emergencies. But we are now seeing through COVID, we've seen a few papers come out. And so there's like an emerging literature on ways to um, stem education losses during closures uh, and also in emergency settings. So what I'm presenting today, I'm just going to tell you a bit about the program. It's called Connect Ed, uh, and it's a targeted foundational numeracy tutoring program that's delivered through phone calls and SMSs. 
And so the origin is, as we've heard now a lot today, uh, Youth Impact, an NGO based in Botswana, was implementing teaching at the right level for a number of years before COVID. And then obviously in COVID, schools closed and students couldn't get access to that program. And so essentially Connect Ed borrows the principles from teaching at the right level, so targeted foundational um, tutoring. Uh, and it delivers it through one weekly SMS program. So students get this very big, basic weekly set of SMS problems, and then a 20 minute weekly phone call with an instructor. And they might be a school teacher or a volunteer or a, an NGO worker. Uh, and in this call, it's really targeted to the student's level. So what happens is there's like a baseline assessment. You figure out, is the student at addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division level? And then based on that initial assessment, the next level, the next week's call teaches them at the level that they're at. And then there's a checkpoint question at the end of that. So if they're taught addition, you get a question on addition. If you get addition correct, the next week you're taught subtraction. If you get it incorrect, you're taught addition again the following week. So it's really well targeted. So the conceptual framework that uh, this program was designed under and the plat mechanisms through which it's worked, um, through which it works is essentially platform and pedagogy. So it's trying to reach students through a platform at the right level. So at the level that they're at, we know mobile phones are really widely accessible in low and middle income countries. So it's not just like across countries, but also within countries, low income households often have access to a phone. So in our study countries in particular, uh, there's 100, on average 108 phone subscriptions per 100 um, members of the population. Uh, and there's also really widespread phone network coverage. So in Nepal, which has the lowest um, access in our, in our setting, 97% of households have access to sufficient network coverage to get a phone call. And another mechanism through which we expect this program to be working is through pedagogy. So it's teaching at the right level as well. So it's instructed uh, instruction that's targeted to the student's level, which there's obviously a wealth of knowledge that this room has produced or is familiar with. Uh, and there's also a growing literature on the impact of one-on-one -on -one tutoring programs, largely from uh, higher income countries, but also growing in lower income countries. So uh, this program, as I mentioned, was first developed in the early days of COVID. So it was done by Youth Impact. They ran a quick randomized control trial with a few researchers. Uh, in 2020, it was one of the first studies in education um, during COVID. And then after that program found that, found that it was really effective and cost effective, then a lot of other organizations and governments were keen to try it out in their setting. And so we ran randomized trials with these partners in five different countries. So to give you a sense of the timeline, so the Botswana proof of concept in 2020, and then the trial in Kenya, Nepal, India, Philippines, and Uganda um, over the space of the next couple of years. So the study characteristics, so the sample, I guess, like for a lot of teaching at the right level programs uh, is in like early grade. So we have in Kenya, it was grades one and two in the other settings, typically grades three to five, which is when this, um, the content is covered in a lot of national curricula. Uh, the studies uh, in all five countries, we had the phone call and SMS, but in all the countries except for India, we also want to try this potentially really cost effective version of just the weekly SMS. If that worked, that would be extremely cost effective. Um, and in terms of implementer type, we also have a different number of different types of implementers. So a mix of NGOs as well as government teachers. Uh, and in two contexts, which I'll tell you some more about, but in Nepal and the Philippines, we randomly assign students to get implemented, the program implemented by either government teachers or by NGO workers. And the length of the program was roughly uh, about eight weeks. Uh, we find you can look in the paper, but in the appendix, we show there's really broad geographic spread in a lot of these countries. Uh, schooling was disrupted in all settings and it was common programming. So there were obviously like small tweaks like the um, being delivered in students' language of instruction uh, or translating it, sorry, to, to each country, um, but very common programming across the board. As I mentioned, NGO and government delivery and an, at end line, an average successful reinterview rate that was 78% and balanced across all arms. So what did we find? So first looking at these first two red bars, uh, you can see the impact of the SMS program. This is in standard deviations. So we find 0.083 standard deviation improvement in learning outcomes on like a simple like phone-based ASR assessment um, uh, for, that's pulled across all countries. 
And then the next red bar is pulled across all countries, the phone and SMS impact. So that's 0.327 standard deviation improvement in learning, which is really substantial. I'm sure this room is very familiar, but like a 0.1 standard deviation improvement in learning is considered pretty great. Uh, and so this program, obviously during COVID, when not huge amounts else was happening, but extremely effective. And then if you look at the green set of three bars, this shows the effects just for Nepal and the Philippines, where we had randomly assigned students to receive the program by other government teachers or NGO. And these are um, not statistically significantly different. So equal effects depending on who was your implementer, which suggests like potential scalability within the government. So it's always standard deviations um, are always a bit controversial. It's not very obvious. So let's drill down to something that's a bit more intuitive. So this shares the share, shows the share of students who got the division questions correct in Uganda in grade four and five. So a couple of things to take away. The first one is you can see the control group has learning losses from baseline to end line. So this is the grade five students. There's a reduction in the share of students who can get division correct. We also see that the program, this purple bar here, uh, fully recovers these learning losses. So it's higher, like it's above the baseline level in the control group. And then these gains obviously dwarf what students are learning from a typical year. So obviously this is COVID, but just it's useful to know that 17% of students in grade four got division correct and 21% got uh, it correct in grade five. So everyone is always very curious about the country by country level results. And so what you can see here is, I guess, uh, it's worth noting that in the Philippines and Uganda, these countries had some of the world's longest school closures. And so in these two contexts, we find the SMSs worked, but we don't find that they worked in Kenya or Nepal. Whereas we find really consistently positive effects for the phone and SMS. So you can see the phone call and SMS arm uh, had positive effects across all settings. So how, why do we think this worked and why did it seem to work across all settings? So back to the conceptual framework, I guess, we do find evidence is consistent with reaching people at the right level. So this is a platform that people have, a lot of people have, they're willing to uh, use and engage with. So we had really high consent rates to participate and then really high engagement each week. So over 95% of households in the phone call arm had a language, had a week of instruction at least one point during the intervention with an average weekly um, engagement rate of 70 to 80%. There was also really high demand. So at Endline, for example, as well, we found 97% of control households wanted the program and 100% in the treatment group, uh, as well as a six percentage point increase in willingness to pay for the program. And then on pedagogy, we're finding some evidence consistent with the idea that this is teaching students at the right level. So what we would expect if targeting, um, like for a targeted kind of instruction program, that the program would be just as effective if it's, if it's targeted at students who know no operations versus students who know multiplication at end line. And that's what we find. We find no heterogeneous treatment effects by baseline level. And similarly for gender. Perfect, thanks. Uh, and then like also consistent with this story is when, as I mentioned before, we have this like great monitoring data where we know what student was taught one week, if they got the checkpoint correct, and then what they were taught the following week. So we can back out from that if it was accurately targeted to the student's level. And so when we plot accurate targeting trial by trial, we find that accuracy improves each trial. And then we also, when we plot um, impact trial by trial, we also find the same, the same shape. So we're finding that impact is in improving trial by trial. And so that is consistent with a story that targeting uh, is improving along with, um, with impact. Uh, and obviously everyone uh, might be a bit skeptical about a phone-based assessment. So we've done a number of robustness checks. So we find the same impacts, whether the assessment is done over the phone or in person, the same impacts, whether it's uh, a student is retested using back checks, same impacts, whether students are randomly assigned to different math problems of the same difficulty level. Uh, and also we do an effort task and we find that there's no treatment effect on effort. So it suggests that students, it's actual knowledge change. It's not just extra effort. So what have I shown you? So I've shown you results from large-scale randomized trials in five countries evaluating a phone-based education program. We find that despite these really five really different countries, we find consistently large and robust positive effects on learning point, between 0.3 and 0.35 standard deviations, which shows that these phone calls can scale across countries. 
We find similar effects when we randomized whether the implementer was an NGO or a government implementer, which suggests potential scalability within government systems. We find that the program delivers, when we quantify it in, um, and look at cost, up to four years of high quality schooling per $100, which puts it in the bucket of a very cost effective program, obviously with the disclaimer that this is COVID, so I'll talk about that in future work. Uh, we also find evidence consistent with possible mechanisms of being using an accessible and at the right platform, uh, at the right level platform and pedagogy. And then in future work, there are some other studies. So this was taken up in a few countries in South America. So working with the IADB to kind of reconcile these results and see how they aggregate. Uh, and then we're also looking to test this in additional emergency settings outside COVID um, and non-emergency settings. Uh, and then we're also supporting a few governments are keen to take this up. And so we're working with them to scale this program up. Thank you. Okay, should I start? Yeah. Okay. Um, is the clicker working? <coughs> okay, two seconds. Okay, so the title of my talk is Implementation Matters. Um, sounds pretty obvious, uh, except very few of us measure implementation, account for implementation, study implementation, optimize implementation. Um, so I just want a quick show of hands before I start. How many people, um, actually, you know what, let me do this. Percent of people here who think that over 50% of people measure implementation in their studies, raise your hand. Okay, pessimistic audience. Okay, if you did that last time also. <laughs> thank you, we need one person. Okay, Bela, thank you. Who thinks over 25% of people measure implementation? I knew that was also coming. Um, let's say people in this room, which is a selected sample. Okay, we had some hands over 20%. Over 15, okay, now hands are going up, zero. Okay, very realistic. 12% um, are measuring implementation. Oh, sorry, that's actually, that's the answer. That's not a question, okay? So I'm gonna come to that, but this sounds so obvious, but we're not really taking it seriously enough. And I would argue there's some similar statistics in just pure policy efforts, not just research efforts, actually. So I can talk about that. So I'm going to share a study called Implementation Matters, Generalizing Treatment Effects in Education. And this is joint with Rachel Meager. So I just want to start with some motivation on the type of intervention that we're about to aggregate to make this point. And of course, many of this, us in this room know this and have made this point and, and move the agenda here, which is enrollments have gone up all over the world, but learning hasn't budged. Okay, so left-hand side is enrollment, learning on the right, uh, learning levels are low and haven't budged. But there, and many things that are really popular, and again, many people in this room have produced this evidence, uh, like flip charts, uh, grants, libraries haven't worked to improve learning, extra teachers, computers, you name it. There is a promising reform uh, that many of us have also contributed to and heard about and talked about many times of targeting instruction, which has improved learning. And this idea is a simple one and, and we know it, which is grades uh, and school systems are structured by grade uh, on this uh, horizontal axis, but the level of the child really varies and often uh, teachers are teaching to the top of the class. So they're just reaching 10% of kids who are maybe at level in the grade. And so really we should try to flip uh, the instruction and target to kids level instead of grade and regroup them. So we, we, many of us in this room are familiar with this concept. This has worked, okay, so across a bunch of studies, uh, this is on the, the Tall Africa website, Teaching at the Right Level Africa website, over 0.1 standard deviation effectiveness across many of these studies. So this is good news. We don't always see this, as Claire just mentioned, point one is pretty good in education. Half of education interventions don't work at all, and point one is the median effectiveness. 
But there's another thing that, oh, so it works, okay? So people are really excited about it and it's scaling. Okay? It's scaling, this is efforts supported by the World Bank, UNICEF, USAID, FCDO, Tall Africa, Pratham, j many people in the room, it's scaling, it works, it's very exciting. But there's also a lot of variation. Okay, so sometimes we're getting 0.08 standard deviations for this effect or this intervention, but sometimes 0.75. So what explains this difference? There could be many things that explain this difference. It could be the country context. It could be baseline levels of learning. It could be many, 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 many things. So that's one of the things that we set out to look at when we uh, did this study and started aggregating this evidence. So we did a systematic meta-analysis to unpack the generalizability and mechanisms of this approach and this evidence. How generalizable was this effectiveness really? Not just in terms of whether it was positive, but how effective it could be. If you can get to 0.8 instead of 0.08, that's a big deal. That's an order of magnitude difference. That's what we really want to address the learning crisis. What was driving these biggest effects? And we wanted to inform future work uh, to, to ask ourselves as we're scaling approaches like teaching at the right level, what more should we be studying? Uh, what are the unanswered questions that we should be studying? So we looked at a bunch of the evidence. This isn't all the evidence on this approach, but we looked at a bunch of the evidence. And luckily, there's been a movement recently to also make a lot of this data available. So a lot of this data was available. Uh, and we gathered evidence from a bunch of these studies representing over 70,000 children. Uh, five states slash countries, eight treatment arms. Okay, so a few things we did with the data. I mean, one of the good, uh, some of the good news with this intervention uh, is the outcomes actually collected were quite similar. So it's very hard to do this kind of aggregation if the outcomes aren't very similar. But many of these studies used a similar assessment, the ASSER assessment. The Kenya study was the one exception, which had an 100 point uh, a test, but all the other studies had uh, the same assessment. So my colleague uh, Rachel said this is great news because she had done an aggregation for microcredit and she said there uh, the measures were actually quite different. So she actually thought this was good. So I know we give ourselves a hard time in education and say the outcomes aren't comparable, but in this case they, they were actually quite comparable. So that made this, uh, that facilitated this. We did need to standardize the data a little bit. So we actually replicated all the original studies. The good news is they they all replicate by and large, uh, but we standardized a few things. So we put standard deviations in terms of common measures uh, and a few other things. We used assessments that were at similar intervals and time periods. So we did a bunch of work. We ran the exact same specification uh, to really standardize this. Okay, so original estimates replicate well. There's no replication crisis here. Good news, few. We're hearing about a lot of replication crises, so that's good. Um, and something that we did, and now I'm getting to the implementation point, is we had a sense that implementation was going to be a really important variable and feature. And so we worked with uh, Pratham, with j and folks who'd been involved in the original studies to understand the features of the original studies. And we really wanted to get a measure of take up and fidelity. Okay, Did it happen? Who did it? And was it done as intended? Were the children really grouped at the level? And actually, good news, a bunch of the studies have this information, actually. But the effects on those who received the program weren't always calculated in the original studies. So a few of the studies calculated not just were the people who were randomized to the study, what happened to them, but also those who received the program. So for those who are familiar, intention to treat versus treatment on the treated. So we calculated treatment at the treated for, for all the studies. Okay, so that was a contribution. And we were curious to see how much that mattered. Okay, so we used, for take up, we used measures of student attendance and whether tall materials were spotted in the classroom during random monitoring visits. Uh, so we used that. And for fidelity, we used a measure of whether the students were grouped by level during these random monitoring visits. Take up existed in all the studies, fidelity only in a few. So that was we, that's with a bit more of a caveat, but take up existed in all the studies. So what do we find when we just look at intention to treat effects? Uh, so this is those that were randomized to receive the program. Uh, we're finding a few things. One thing we did, we segmented with who did it, teachers or volunteers, a bit of a generalization, uh, but teachers or volunteers by and large. And so when you just look at intention to treat, the teacher effect, the average effect is 0.07 standard deviation. 
Uh, it's statistically significant when you look at the average effect here. And the other interesting thing, and I'm not sure how familiar folks are with, with meta-analysis, but there's this metric of an I squared, which is used to quantify whether the variation and the difference across the studies is sampling variation versus true treatment effect variation. And so if the I squared is low, that means that any variation is just sampling variation. It's not true treatment effect variation. That's how this is typically interpreted. And here we found the I squared was 0.01%. So that suggested that these effects were by and large quite similar. You can also see that visually as well. Okay, so 0.07 standard deviations, uh, pretty similar across the settings and treatment arms. Volunteer effects, 0.24 standard deviation effectiveness. So on average, about three times more effective. So that's interesting in and of, in and of itself. But the I squared is really high, 95, 96%. They're not generalizing so well. Uh, there's some, some important difference between these. Okay, so there's something interesting going on with the volunteers, uh, but it's, it's all over the map. When we look at treatment on the treated, this is such a beautiful graph. I love a beautiful graph. We don't always get such a beautiful graph. Rachel was actually shocked when we saw this. She said she'd never seen a meta-analysis produce such a clear result. Uh, you're seeing a few things. So one is uh, for the teachers, the average effects have gone up uh, quite a bit to 0.21 standard deviation. So when the teachers are doing it, okay, thank you. When the teachers are doing it, 0.21 standard deviations, which is great. The average effectiveness in education, as we said, is 0.1. So when the teachers are doing it, they're getting some big results. When the volunteers are doing it, uh, 0.76 standard deviations. So now this is on the upper, upper end of effectiveness in the literature. And the I squared is zero. Okay, so these measures of implementation, who did it and was it done, matter most, explain almost all the variation. Okay, more than baseline levels of learning, more than context, more than many other factors. So really, really striking result. This was a frequentist meta-analysis. Uh, some folks might know my colleague Rachel loves Bayesian meta-analysis. Uh, we also did a Bayesian meta-analysis. Uh, there's a few benefits of this. Um, I'm just going to describe one, uh, but there's a bunch. Uh, one is that you can use priors, uh, which is really valuable. So if you actually had some kind of qualitative information or a theoretical position on whether this should work, you can actually build that into the analysis. We do some of that in the paper. Another interesting thing, and I'll just jump to the next slide for time, is for the treatment on the treated effects for volunteers. So one of the things that Bayesian analysis can do in this hierarchical modeling is you have no pooling, which is kind of similar to to frequentist and partial pooling, which is in using information across the studies to update the information in every study. So in the frequentist meta-analysis, it just updated the average effect. Here, every effect can get updated. And so what you're essentially seeing is actually on this study, first UP camps, whereas this original effect is not statistically significant, that was actually because uh, take up here was very low, actually. I think in this case, it was about 7 or 8%. But in most of the other studies, take up was quite high, about 80%. And so it's using information on cases where take up is high uh, to update this information, and you have a statistically significant result. So it's a bit of a nerdy point, but TOT estimates are almost always underpowered. This is actually a neat way to power up your treatment on the treated effects. So anyway, there's some neat things about the Bayesian meta-analysis. I won't get too much into it. A few takeaways. Uh, implementation matters, and it matters most for generalizability in this case. Uh, I also want to make a bold claim that generalizability is attainable. Uh, maybe I'll get myself in trouble, but I'm going to put my neck out on the line. We found that this really can work across pretty diverse settings. I think Claire shared another interesting example uh, where that was the case. But it's rarely accounted for. Uh, luckily, we're a group of pessimists, so we were accurate, uh, but less than 12% of those uh, studies that we reviewed uh, had measured implementation. And actually, we're now looking at meta-analyses, which I know uh, economists don't do as much, but education folks do and public health folks do uh, and psychologists do. Uh, we are finding 0% of meta-analyses are reporting treatment on the treated. So if you have a meta-analysis you've seen that reports it, please let us know, but we haven't found one yet which we think is a real omission and, and we need to do better there. It also predicts the largest effects. The other thing that we do in the paper, which I haven't shown as much here, 
we actually just sound out a simple point and proof, and it kind of sounds obvious. We make the claim that if you don't measure implementation, you just can't point identify your treatment effect, and you can't say something about generalizability. One, imagine this case where you have a null effect. This is sort of an extreme case. In a null effect, one minute, okay. In a null effect, if you didn't measure implementation, there's just no way to know if it was a good intervention that was done badly or a bad intervention that was done well, okay? So this sounds obvious, but it's actually a really big issue. So we have to measure implementation if we wanna actually say something meaningful about the intervention. I actually wonder, maybe someone should do this study, uh, what percent of nulls were just bad implementation versus a program that, that really doesn't work. Okay, so there's a last piece to this. I don't know how much I'll get to say about this, but we then took this insight in Botswana, uh, Youth Impact, to optimize teaching at the right level as it was scaling to try to improve implementation. And one of the things that we did is we wanted to target instruction even more. And originally, we grouped kids by whether they could add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And you can see there's a bunch of variation there. We then also grouped them by how many digits they could recognize. And I know I'm coming to time, so I'm going to wrap up. Uh, and there, there's some variation too. So we had a treatment arm that grouped by just one uh, of the kind of operations and another treatment arm that grouped by both of them. So the idea was that it was even more targeted. And the bottom line is, that actually improved uh, learning outcomes quite a bit by about 0.2 standard deviations. Uh, and so optimizing the targeting of instruction further uh, improved results. So sounds obvious, but you do a little bit more of what the principal is telling you you should do and your learning improves. So it wasn't the case that this implementation feature was just a correlation in our meta-analysis, it is causal. Okay, I'm gonna end by saying implementation can and should be accounted for, studied, and improved. This is my last slide. It's a bit of a teaser for the end of the panel where we are going to talk about the What Works Hub for Global Education, whose focus is on implementation science. So that's just a bit of a teaser. More soon. I'll end on that. Hi everyone, I'm Zara. Uh, okay, great. Um, okay, uh, hi everyone. Uh, really excited to be presenting um, this work today. Um, so before I begin, I should say that I'm going to pivot a little bit. So while the first two presentations were ma mainly looking at how to implement a specific policy, uh, this work looks at how bureaucrats should approach policy implementation through the delivery chain. I should also say that this is part of a larger program at the Blavatnik School, which was called Deliverad, which had a quant component as well as a qual. Um, today, in the interest of time, I'm focusing on the quant component, which is co-authored with Michael Boyce Yadam at UCC, Claire Lieber and Maria Piayoko, and Claire and Maria are both in the room today. So let me just get started. Um, <clears throat> So essentially, the motivation for the study is that governments regularly commit to sector plans. These sector plans have a set of policies and they commit to essentially delivering these plans. But these plans do not always translate into tangible improvements into outcomes that we care about. And you might say, well, this is because the design of policies in these sector plans is just not effective. But you know, we're also increasingly realizing that the quality of implementation by bureaucrats also matters. And thankfully, Noam and Claire have already established this as well. So think, for example, a minister of education. The minister of education designs a curriculum and wants to get this implemented. Now, the national level bureaucrats, they're going to be thinking about how to design this curriculum, what should be the components. But there's also going to be the mid-level bureaucrats who will have to implement a range of tasks to implement this. So think, for example, getting teachers trained to deliver the curriculum, getting learning materials into the school, so on and so forth. So there's implementation happening at the national and the mid-level. And what we're really trying to answer over here is that, well, in a setting like this, how should bureaucrats approach implementation from a management perspective 
to improve downstream outcomes through the delivery chain. That's what we're going to try to look at. So we're trying to study implementation from a, from a management perspective. Now, <clears throat> there's plenty of advice out there from consultants on how bureaucrats should implement policy. Many of you may have heard of uh, Barber's Deliverology, so on and so forth. But the issue is that there's less empirical work looking at this question of how bureaucrats should approach policy implementation and what are the associated impacts through the delivery chain. There is emerging work, which is really exciting. So for example, Rasul and Rogger in Nigeria, they look at management practices at the national level and how they're associated with outcomes at the national level, such as task completion. There's also work by Cilier Zadel, Jakubis is in the room, where they look at district level management practices and learning outcomes in schools. But again, there's little empirical evidence looking at you know, um, how bureaucrats are approaching implementation and outcomes through the delivery chain, not just at the national at the, uh, or the school level, but through the delivery chain. At the same time, there's this lively and um, exciting, I would say, conceptual debate across social sciences on the merits and demerits of different approaches to implementation. So on the one hand, public in public admin and education, there's a lot of focus on how you know practices of bureaucrats that focus on problem solving and adaptation, deliberation, they can really drive outcomes through the delivery chain. They also talk about how there might be demerits of having tight controls and incentives on things like motivation. But on the other hand, you might contrast this with other disciplines, um, I would say economists. So we think about, we think a lot about principal agent problems and how we might use incentives and top-down ac accountability to improve effort and task completion. So with this background, what we're trying to do is, we're trying to do essentially two key things. The first thing that we do is that we develop a new tool to measure organizational approach to implementation. So the way we do this is we have 16 delivery related management practices. Now these practices are organized under four delivery functions. These are prioritization and target setting, monitoring and use of data, accountability and incentives and problem solving and adaptation. These functions were drawn from and based on the wider uh, deliver at conceptual framework that I can talk more about in the Q&A. And essentially under these functions, we identified 16 different constructs through quite a lot of um, discussions with experts and feedbacks, bureaucrats and ministers who had worked on delivery. So this is how we come to these 16 different practices. And based on these, we essentially compute an index which gives us an overall index, which is essentially delivery related management practices, which are capturing the bureaucrats approach to policy implementation. In addition to this overall index, we also do another thing. We're also interested in the style of approach. And this kind of goes back to the conceptual debate that I was talking about. So we essentially try to capture through our measure whether an approach is more towards problem solving or whether it's more towards accountability and incentives. For problem solving approaches, think about practices such as feedback loops, deep dives through the delivery chain and in accountability and incentives, things like high stakes accountability meetings and rewards and sanctions. Our measurement methodology is exactly the same as the WMS in the sense that we ask open-ended questions and then post code through a predefined rubric. Now, in addition to measuring this organizational approach to implementation, we also uh, do another thing. We're also interested in really carefully understanding and conceptualizing measures, which can tell us how bureaucrats are doing through the delivery chain. So here, our cons constructs are essentially a mix of things that bureaucrats are doing at the mid-level and at the street level. So at the mid-level, we're interested in things like staff effort, office task completion, office functioning. How are people actually feeling? Um, are they satisfied? Uh, do they understand what they're supposed to do, as well as things at the street level, such as head teacher um, and teacher effort and school functioning. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to get at, you know, this thin description around like, um, you know, uh, things like task completion, but also really getting a sense of how people are feeling. Um, and also um, our measurement methodology here is a mix of new um, uh, closed-ended survey modules, as well as established instruments like the SDI. 
So essentially, we take those, these two things, and what we do is we apply this in the context of Ghanaian education districts, um, where we essentially con conduct our survey to generate new descriptive evidence. Now, I'm going to quickly tell you what we find before going into the details, in case there's um, just to kill the curiosity beforehand. Um, so the first thing that we find is that when we look at the approach to implementation, generally across districts in Ghana, um, there's um, essentially, uh, we observe very low scores of delivery related management practices, which essentially means that these practices exist, but they're very ad hoc or quite informal. But at the same time, we see quite a bit of variation. So there's clearly some districts that are doing very well. They have high scores, but there are others who have low scores. The next thing that we look at, well, we know how the bureaucrats are approaching implementation in districts, but how are these essentially related to downstream outcomes through the delivery chain? And here, what I'm presenting is associations. This was not, this was not an RCT, so I'm presenting descriptive evidence. But essentially, um, what we find is that the overall delivery-related management index, it is associated, positively associated with some downstream outcomes. So not all of them, some of them. But interestingly, what we see is that not all of the delivery functions matter equally. Now, remember, I pointed out that we're interested in the style of the approach, whether it's more problem solving focused or whether it's more focused on top, top down accountability. And what we essentially see is that it's the problem solving focused approach, which is essentially driving some of these positive outcomes in the downstream delivery chain, not the top down accountability. And why is this important? So this is important because within Ghana, um, the government, the Ministry of Education, is attempting to cascade a national level approach down to the district level. And there's a very strong emphasis on top-down accountability, essentially things like performance contracts. But our evidence over here, and even the related qualitative work that we did, it actually suggests otherwise. It suggests caution and thinking more carefully about the kind of approaches you're cascading down. And from a research side, it essentially calls for a pivot towards thinking more carefully about problem-solving approaches and their causal, um, causal effects. Um, so this, with, with this snapshot, I'm just going to dig deep into some of the details and um, give you a snapshot of the results. So, <clears throat> so I just wanted to show this table, um, you know, just to highlight what we measure and how. And this is just to say that we really did try uh, very carefully to capture things through the delivery chain. So we're capturing things in the district office in terms of effort, task completion, how offices are functioning, and the same thing at the school level. And I'm happy to speak more about um, you know, what exactly these constructs look, look like in the Q&A. This is a map of Ghana. We pretty much went everywhere. It was a representative district sample. And essentially, in the northern part, we went to another 1,200 uh, 1, schools. Because we were interested in capturing um, you know, measures through the delivery chain, we surveyed the district director, but also the deputy director and the circuit supervisors who are essentially interfacing between districts and schools. Um, in Pakistan, they're called AEOs and similar kind of um, you know, civil servants in, in other settings as well. And then of course, um, you know, 1261 teachers as well. Um, so this is the first result that I showed you, which essentially showed that um, you know, how a district office is approaching implementation. So the table over here shows the 16 different practices that we measured. And the core thing to emphasize is that scores are low. So typically, uh, principally actually, scores are supposed to be between one to four, but we see a score of two, which means that the practices are quite ad hoc really. The average district, district does well on priority setting. So the districts know what their priorities are, but they don't do very well on strategic planning which essentially means they don't have the necessary work plans and things that you need to follow through with these priorities. We see a greater use of problem solving than accountability. But again, the point that I was making, there's a lot of variation. So over here, I'm showing you the four functions, and these are the scores from one to four. And I don't have to explain this because you can see that there's quite a bit of variation. There's some who are doing well and some where the scores are really low. This is showing the style. The dark green is accountability focused and the light is problem solving focused. And you can see that, you know, it's, it was interesting to us that regions that are close to central Accra 
are where you know there were more accountability focused practices and there's another discussion to be had which is where are these practices really coming from now what were the associations between these delivery related management practices and downstream outcomes how do they really matter um, so again, uh, what we did was, um, you know, we did we were basically showing associations. I'm not going to go into the regression equation, but essentially we tried to control for as many observables as we could, as well as geograph ge geography, following Rasul and Roger and Blue Mattel. And what we find is, which I've also given you a snapshot already, that the overall management index is positively associated associated with outcomes. Which ones are those? effort of district staff. So districts where there was you know, a higher delivery management index were the ones where district staff were going to the classrooms more. They were sitting in on classroom observations, sitting in on lesson plans, so on and so forth. We also see effects on effort of school staff where there was a higher overall delivery management index. We also saw that their teachers were showing more active instruction and less students off task. But again, not all of these functions were mattering equally. And there were different results depending on whether you were doing more of the accountability focused practices or more problem solving. And essentially, when we look at these um, associations by the sub indices, there's no positive relationship between the top down accountability sub index and downstream outcomes. But it's the problem solving that's driving the results. And essentially, what we see is that districts where there's higher problem solving, staff are happier and less likely to leave. Also, where districts have a higher problem solving index, there is less teacher absenteeism and less students off task. So I'm, I'm going to try to conclude now. Um, so on the policy side, I've already given you the policy implications, right? Um, this, has, this has clear implications for how the Ministry of Education is thinking about cascading its delivery approach. And essentially what we're showing is caution, that we need to be a bit careful about how we do this through the delivery chain. Um, on the research side, we're calling for a pivot in economics, which we're seeing now in works by Rasul and Roger, uh, Bandiera et al., where they're showing that things where you are encouraging autonomy, well, their autonomy is a slightly different thing, but essentially, we're calling for similar attention to things like problem solving, deliberation, and understanding the causal impact of these kind of practices. All of our instruments will be publicly available. Um, some can be applied across contexts, some not so much. I'm happy to talk through the details of this. And I just want to end with what I started. So this was part of a larger study called the Deliver Ed Program, where we had a quant component and a qual component. We spent a lot of time thinking about common conceptual frameworks because ultimately our aim was that we wanted to integrate these pieces to be able to add more nuance around the discussion of implementation, around the discussion of delivery. Because clearly things like what happens in these offices, what is the culture like, these things play a big role. Um, there are some other papers on the PSG webpage, but we're also working together towards an integrated piece, will be, which will be coming up in an IJET special issue. Um, I'm going to stop here and um, looking forward to questions. I think so. Yep. Is it work? Yes. Okay. So I'll take three questions. So I'm going to start over there. So the two people raising their hands over there. Thank you so much for very good presentations. I think this is a very important area of work. My first question is for Claire. So I'm still wrapping my head around the 0.89 standard deviation impact for Uganda. So, uh, so what happened in Uganda in terms of like the, with the school closures, do you have measures of like the trajectory of learning that what was the extent of the learning loss? One standard deviation is about two grades of learning. So in what time period these kids were able to absorb this kind of learning so that you have this uh, differential with the, with the control group? And just a tiny bit on the overall implementation side. So I, 
So Noam, this is for you in terms of like how, how do we measure everything in implementation? So it's a classic McNamara fallacy that like whatever you, you will measure, the rest will be disregarded in terms of the implementation. So when we are developing these modules, we are going into kind of like with, with certain priors in terms of like what the implementation decisions look like. So what is being missed could be an important part and who will, who will get to decide on that. Hi, Mpumi from South Africa. Two questions. One is if you've measured, clear any long-term um, sustained impact. So COVID is a specific context. Um, yeah, were you able to follow up? And then to the last presenter, you spoke about, it sounds like there should be trade-offs between problem solving and accountability. What's the, what are those? And what's the one thing we shouldn't do? Um, it sounds like you are more for problem solving. What's the thing we should drop? Thanks. Yeah, thank you to all the uh, presenters. A question mainly for Noam. How would your results fit into the context of it's a detailed critique of RCTs saying, oh, I can generate a lot of treatment effects um, just from randomness, basically, that you might pick up in your RCTs. So would you say, well, the distribution is a bit more centered and um, not so spread out as Deaton might claim? with you, Claire. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for the questions. Uh, on Uganda, so as I mentioned, students had been out of school for two years at that point. And then when we look at, I think there's some Uezu data and some of our own data that suggests, so in a lot of these countries, the government's main alternatives that they were providing were like television, radio, um, or online programs, or maybe paper packs. And like the highest rate we could see that just people were accessing that was like 30% of students accessing in a really great case, mostly between like a two and 15% of households. So if people were not accessing much else, so the control group was not getting great stuff and it had two years away, but certainly huge, huge effect sizes. Um, so I think the lack of alternatives mattered and the fact that it was two years away, it was also just like a really effective program uh, and had like a, great organization implementing. Um, yeah, I guess we're still like Youth Impact is still delivering this post COVID and is finding very positive learning effects. I think there's like a lot of RCT evidence now, but pre post it's very effective still. Um, but yeah, good question. Uh, and Bumi, the question about long term, we have not gone back to measure we could at some point though. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Um, no, that's a great question. And, and something that we've been um, trying to answer. So I'm going to say um, uh, the annoying thing that I, I don't think we have the evidence to say which one we should drop. And essentially, I think that's where why we need more causal evidence. But I will share some things that we found from the cross case study and generally anecdotally how we saw things evolve in Ghana. Um, so gen because the study was in, in you know, uh, four different countries, essentially, what we saw was that when you have accountability focused, top-down accountability focused practices, they do get you some things. So for example, at the national level, they do help bring people together, there's coordination, and it can help you achieve, um, you know, formal structural changes, like for example, getting a curriculum approved and those sort of things, but they are difficult in kind of pushing through, um, you know, changes in downstream outcomes. And uh, what we saw in Ghana, for example, was that the ministry initially started with a very top-down accountability focused approach at the national level. But over time, because there was pushback from the other agencies, um, they essentially started moving towards a more problem-solving oriented approach. So, and this has happened, you know, we essentially mapped these kind of approaches in another project across, you know, 199 countries. And we see this happening quite a bit where you see kind of, you know, countries initially adopting a more top-down accountability focused approach, but ultimately moving towards that's, you know, more of a hybrid. But again, I think we need more causal evidence here. Uh, we don't know what happens, you know, when you do one versus the other or when you do a hybrid, and it would be really nice if you we were able to do that. But it's obviously a very difficult thing to do in reality randomizing districts and whole government units into type of approaches can, can be very, very difficult. 
but we can make we, we can do a lot of sense making with you know descriptive evidence and and qualitative work here as well thanks sure um you know that problem that you mentioned is a problem and it's a problem i'd like to have because i don't think we're there yet i don't think we're measuring implementation enough in the first place to worry about having the wrong measurement but we should preempt it i i agree but i think first let's have the first let, let's first have measures of implementation that we're consistently bringing into our work and then uh you know if we overdo it you know what we can we can address that so i think first and foremost i would say we, we should start measuring it i think um you know i think two dimensions of it which are important are take up and fidelity but there might be more there might be more and i'd be curious people's views on what should come into that and those aren't cookie cutter measures take up is a bit more consistent did it happen did people receive it fidelity needs to be contextualized for each intervention so that's not like you can have a single fidelity measure you know so in the case you know claire shared for example fidelity would mean targeting instruction for another program it would mean something else so that needs to be constructed carefully for the intervention uh, so those are two dimensions uh, and I think, you know, it's, it's possible there's a third, there's a fourth. I'd love to, to hear from people. But I think first, let's, let's measure it. Uh, and then hopefully we, we can make sure we don't miss something. Um, on the critique of RCTs, and I'm sure Lant has the same critique. I think Lant is, is here. I'm sure we'll hear from him soon. Um, the, uh, I would say, um, I'm, I think this kind of work gives us a bit of optimism. I think it's true that um, RCTs have not always generalized, right? And, and so that's something that we need to be mindful of and cognizant of. I think in this case, it reveals that they might generalize better than we thought, actually, uh, or at least in this case, and if we accounted for the right thing. So I would just say I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic, um, but I'm sure there's a good debate to be had. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. All right, another set of questions, are there? Thanks so much. Um, thanks for the presentations. They were great. And it's interesting to see the kind of delineation between the TOT and the ITT and, and, and kind of isolating maybe the effects of implementation fidelity issues. That said, we don't want to let people off the hook, right, in terms of moving to more of a uh, just a treatment on the treated in terms of the impact estimates. But my bigger question is, when did we move to point one standard deviations as an effective program? Like I, I missed, I feel like I missed the memo because um sorry i'm just like i'm actually like really surprised because historically modest small effect sizes like something you would power a study to be 0 0.2 0 0.25 right those are some of the standards set by the what works clearinghouse and things like that i know from you know when it was at usaid those were like the non-embarrassing things that you invested in right and then 0 0.4 0 0.6 you know medium of course it all depends on cost you know it all depends on your distribution right there's nuances to it and 0 0.8 being a large where large started so today as i sit here and i and i think this is something i thought about too i feel like we've introduced a reference bias because we're not doing a very good job right so we look at the landscape of evaluations and set these thresholds for success that are based on a lot of really not good policy implementation donor funded programs. And so I think rather, why don't we take a look at how many standard deviations for a normal distribution or whatever modeling we want to pick and say, okay, how, how, where does this get, right? A first grader today to by the time they end up with fifth grade right in these kinds of effect sizes that we're talking about and you can use multiple you know distributions and model that out or whatever it's nowhere i mean i don't even have to like do the math it's nowhere so sorry i just i want to know where that standard got um i hate people that make speeches and don't ask questions i'm so sorry i've become one of them but i want to know like where that reference point came okay yeah so that's my question thank you uh, there was a question here here <laughs> Um, hi, this is Andrea from the UK. Thank you. I've really enjoyed your presentations. I just have a quick curiosity for Claire. If someone wanted to implement this program in a new setting, what would you say are some of the limitations or perhaps the caveats that you would share and say, well, beware of this or it wouldn't work in this situation? Thank you. Thank you. Two quick questions here, please. You and, yeah, thank you. 
Hi, thank you, uh, Daniel from the Lehman Foundation in Brazil. I would like to, to ask uh, Zara uh, about uh, one issue that occurred to me, which was uh, the issue of state capacity. And uh, if that was a variable that might be interesting to look at, looking at the, the approaches to implementation, what I, I guess my hypothesis would be that when you talk about uh, top-down accountability measures, maybe districts with more state capacity have more uh, capacity really to respond to these incentives than the others. So would that be uh, uh, an interesting approach to also look at into this, this very interesting work that you've been doing? So yeah, thank you. Or, or whoever hasn't asked a question. Um, my question is to Claire. Thank, thanks for the presentation. I was just wondering in terms of Uganda, again, the SMS uh, standard deviations um, has been pretty high. Um, just wondering if you looked at the cost of sending SMSs in across the five, five countries. So I'm just thinking that say not many people receive SMSs in Uganda if the cost of sending an SMS is, is pretty high. Um, and the sec second one was the last presenter. Um, so yeah, hi, Sarah. Um, so I, I'm just curious if in Ghana, it's 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 a pretty hierarchical top-down approach in general in education system, in which case, just curious how the research team approach interviewing the district education officers or, or the like, equivalent and getting honest um, responses to create the measures that, that, that you are describing. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, um, you want to take the hard question? Sure, where this, where this reference came <laughs> from, my goodness. Um, it, I, I agree with much of what you said, actually. Um, so maybe we, I should use a different reference point next time. But um, yeah, I think it did come from literature reviews, essentially looking at the state of affairs. Of course, I'd be curious to hear from, from others in the room. But um, yes, I think that's right. And the state of affairs are not good. So it's a good point. We should aim higher. Um, that's actually part of the motivation for the study is we said, yes, it worked, but how do we get to point eight, actually? And even better is maybe even moving from standard deviations, right, to all children reading, all children numerate, basic numeracy. Um, so, yeah, just agree with that point and agree we should aim higher. That would be my, my quick response. <clears throat> yeah, um, thanks for the questions. Um, so on the first uh, question about uh, state capacity, um, so, so I'll say two things. One is that we were interested in looking at, you know, where what explains the cross-district variation in these approaches to implementation. Uh, I didn't present that today, uh, and we need to do a bit more work on that, but essentially we were interested in understanding whether it's um, internal characteristics within the districts. So for example, you know, the um, you know, characteristics of the district director, characteristics of the district, such as, you know, staff skills. Um, so to what extent do these internal characteristics explain the variation versus external factors? Things like local political sponsorship that the district might have, things like, you know, external donor support. And what we see, at least in our data, that it's the external factors that explain, you know, who's adopting a more thorough approach to implementation. So it was essentially districts which had more donor support um, and there is a lot of it in Ghana. And then the second thing was having local sponsorship uh, from the local political MP. So those were the things driving, not so much the internal uh, you know, district characteristics. But I also think that it's really hard to understand what state capacity really means. So how do we measure it? How do we think about it? So we were thinking about it you know, in terms of these specific measures, in terms of you know, what the district staffing was like, and even performance measures within the district. So I think that's another black box to perhaps unfold. How do we think about state district capacity or state capacity? Um, on the second question about, you know, how do we make sense of these results? Um, yes, um, the education system is hierarchical as in many other low and middle income countries, but actually we don't know a lot about what is the variation in these approaches to management and implementation at the mid level. Um, Kanata here has done a lot of work on school management practices and we know there's a lot of variation there. Um, and what we're seeing is that it's the case in Ghana as well. There is a lot of variation and districts are using these different types of practices. And from the call work, happy to chat more over coffee, we have a lot of thanks to our amazing qualitative colleagues at UCC, Ottawa, and U of T. Um, but essentially, we have a lot of really good examples of what does it mean when a district is doing problem solving? Um, you know, what are the kind of things that they're doing? 
and what it, what is a district that's not doing problem solving. So we have those case studies and hopefully you'll see them in some output or another. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, great. Um, thank you for the questions. So I've been trying to wrap my brains and think where this wouldn't work. So I guess we know it works across different types of implementers. We have lots of different kinds of partners, government, NGO. So that, that doesn't meet the need. I guess we're doing it outside COVID and it's still working. Um, so I guess if you have a phone and if you can target, it seems to work well. However, we have done uh, another study looking at adolescents and like HIV prevention knowledge. And we have found like after COVID, adolescents are hard to pin down. They're a bit too cool. Maybe they're not really interested in chatting to someone in their 20s about like dating. Um, so yes, probably better for like primary school students. Um, and then also another thing that has come up a lot is people are keen for us to try this with literacy. And we are keen to crack that nut. Um, but it is obviously a bit harder with literacy than with numeracy, um, like seeing letters written quickly with SMSs and that kind of thing. Uh, and then on the other question about SMS cost effectiveness, I wonder if you are our reviewer. A reviewer has asked for the same thing. <laughs> so, so we're in the process of calculating that one, but that's an important question. And maybe in like extreme conflict settings, that's very easy and very cost effective to do. But in other places where the counterfactual is not so bad, maybe it's less cost effective. Great. Um, over there. Uh, Peter from Stellenbosch and Freya University. Quick question for Noam. Is it plausible that fidelity or take up often correlate with unscalable or endogenous factors like human resource constraints? Thanks. I think that's all, all we have time for. So, okay. Um, so, I would say that is, you know, that is, you know, one of the arguments actually, therefore we should care about mostly intention to treat because that's the policy relevant quantity. Our view and the view that we take in this paper is not necessarily actually, partially because implementation varies so much. So in these studies, sometimes it was 7%, but often it was 80 to 90%. And so it's not this fixed variable. And it's not that it can't budge, and it's not that it can't be that high. And in fact, the studies that had the highest implementation were actually the largest scale studies, tens of thousands of children. So they weren't necessarily the smallest studies. So I think if you conceive as implementation as unmovable, yes. But if implementation can be improved, no. Then the quantity of interest is how do you get this to be implemented well and to achieve that highest effect? That's also partially what the A-B test also brings some evidence to bear on is Again, making this point that implementation is not fixed, it can be improved, and then it has an effect. So I think that's often the argument, and part of the point that we try to make in this paper is it can vary, it can be improved, and it can be quite high, actually. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, we will, um, I'll give you five minutes for your presentation. You have your slides up? Sure, yes. I'm um, supposed yeah. to, um, well, I'm supposed to say three takeaways. I'm going to skip that just to give Noam some time to present on uh, the World Park Summit. Yeah? Sure. Uh, I, so I'm just going to, uh, because it's an implementation panel, uh, and I'm sure some people are wondering um, what's next after RISE. Uh, I believe I have two slides. I think they're going to come up, but I can also speak um, without them. Oh, that's a T-statistic. That is definitely not what I was going to talk about. Um, are there other slides? Uh, I can talk about T-statistics. I can do that. Um, well, I'll just keep talking. Uh, it's okay if the slides don't come. Um, and we'll have a panel soon also, which is also trying to bridge the transition. So this is just uh, riffing off of the implementation uh, uh, panel. Um, so... I, I would say maybe, and I'm curious how people would characterize after um, Rise, there is a, a cousin, maybe a sibling, uh, some relation that is close and, and trying to build on the incredible efforts of Rise, which have really been incredible, uh, but also with a slightly new flavor, uh, and that is the What Works Hub for Global Education. Oh, here it is. Okay, great. Uh, and the goal of the What Works Hub for Global Education is really to build an implementation science uh, because we know children are in school and not necessarily learning, but we're, that's the bad news. The good news is there are things that improve learning uh, and we have many people in this room generated evidence on those things. How do we now scale them, scale them with governments and implement them really well? 
And so let's do that. And then let's also try to get rigorous and scientific about how to do that. So that's the goal uh, with the What Works Hub for Global Education. Uh, also has a large investment from FCDO, uh, 30 million pounds to start. Uh, with additional strategic partners coming in as well. Uh, so that's the goal. Through the What Works Hub, uh, we're estimating that about 3 million children will be reached. So it's direct scaling and effort uh, through partners. It's a consortium of about 40 partners is the uh, BSG component of the What Works Hub. Uh, and that includes a mix of researchers. Uh, it includes a mix of implementers, of donor partners, uh, of governments, uh, and, and there's a lot of partnerships with governments. A very, very exciting effort. Uh, and in addition to the BSG component, there's also a wider What Works Hub effort. Uh, and I'm sure uh, Rachel will mention some of this in the panel, in the next panel, uh, which is also linking in with strategic partners like the World Bank, uh, which is very exciting, and other um, partners as well, uh, UNICEF, uh, IIEP, and, and a few others. Um, so we're very, very excited about this effort. So we're hoping everyone who's applied and come to this conference will continue to uh, come back through the uh, new and, and kind of recurring conferences that are coming. We actually just had our internal launch over the last couple of days, uh, where we're in inception period and over the next year we'll really be shaping the hub uh, and then we will launch officially more publicly uh, throughout the year and next year i think i have one or two more slides but i think i actually covered most of it we can flip through uh, is there another one or two yeah this is a, a kind of set of images and pictures of various partners in the consortium uh, so far uh, though we, we're also hoping to expand over time next slide uh, and this is the the slide on the strategic partners uh, through the What Works Hub for Global Education, uh, which is part of the, the larger business case that FCDO has. So yeah, that's in a nutshell. Happy to discuss it more, and I'm sure it'll come up in the next panel as well. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Can I ding? Luis, Shara, everyone at the back, Julius. <laughs> it's all men standing and chatting. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and thank you again for being so prompt uh, with returning from all the breaks today. It's one of the things I love most about the Rice Conference is that you gain incredible amounts of knowledge while sit like in really tiny bite sizes and then stress for the rest of the week that you've forgotten most of it. Um, my name is Laura and I'm, I've got a great fun conversation lined up. There will be no papers on this session. This is your chance to ask all the questions that you've been asked or you've been thinking in your head all day. Um, this is the, you know, I mean, it's live and so forth, but say what you want to say and unpack it all. Um, we're really going to talk about the shift from systems research to implementation science, hence the not so subtle um, demonstration effect of that through the through the four sessions today. Um, and I think it is worth just stopping and reflecting for a moment. Those of you, and there are many of you in the room who were around 10 years ago, which is a terrifyingly long amount of time. And I said kudos to the funders who give that link, the funding first and foremost, but also... <laughs> yeah, funders. Yay, funders. But also... Um, just the number of people who are still involved. And I think there were a number of us who sat around the table 10 years ago and said, we're not all gonna be here in 10 years, are you crazy? And yet here we are. So I think that's testimony to uh, the research that's uh, been generated through this program. The questions that are being asked by this program are the ones that we're still asking today. Um, or I say that, and yet are they? Because some of the questions I heard today are still the questions that we were asking at the start of RISE, you know? So the start of RISE was going back to Tessa, Justin and everybody else's paper, thinking, well, sure, like an NGO can use contract teachers and the government can't, like, how is that not working? Or, you know, kind of seemingly obvious things that are done in education that don't seem to be working either at scale or just as Paul demonstrates again and again at all. Um, and I think there are still some of those questions today. We're hearing a lot of um, a lot of organizations, people, researchers, practitioners still searching for this seemingly invisible, impossible thing called scale. But there are a lot of questions. I mean, I heard today even things like we have suffered through. This is Renata saying we've suffered through the implementation. Um, Bela, you saying were things designed to fail today? Ricardo, how do you create the political environment in which um, actors are going to support what's been designed? And I think those questions were there at the start of Rise. Um, and one of the goals of Rise was to enable everyone, you know, enable us all to take a step back and think about the system. The word system was very core to Rise at the start. Um, so the conversation today is going to go through that journey of, of 10 years of questions, no pressure, um, and, and look ahead to, to what comes next. And we've had a, a few hints of that today. Um, I'm not going to give big introductions to the three speakers because I'm sure you all know them well. Um, but I am, I mean, the roles, the various roles that they've played will come out, I'm sure, in, in the comments they give. Um, it's going to be a conversation. I'm going to kick off with some questions. Feel free to jump in throughout, but really, I've got a couple of rounds initially, and then and if you've got a burning one, put your hand up, but otherwise, we'll come out and extend the conversation after that. Um, and really, I, Mpumi, I want to kick off with you, um, because as many of you will know, Mpumi's got like a dream job, right? Um, <laughs> 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 working directly, I mean, overseeing, um, research and ways to get research generated, used, and then into practice across South Africa. Um, it's not the easiest job in the world, I can imagine, uh -huh. um, but one that really is connecting research generation to life. Um, and maybe just as a sort of baseline, where are we then? Um, my first question to you is, what are, the what are the questions in your and your colleagues' day jobs that you still don't think you've got answers for? Um, to many. Um, so I, I think firstly, we have a sort of formal research agenda that we've solicited across the department to ask questions on different aspects. So literacy, violence, parental involvement, nutrition, etc. So that's a public 
good that's aligned with the medium term framework. So that's like the government plan, five year questions that sort of is static and publicly available. But I think aside from that, questions that still remain. Um, after all is said and done are some very specific ones and broader ones. Some of the specific ones are still, after participating in years and years of international and regional assessments, um, we still don't know what children know in the early grades. So I can tell you that 81% of children, according to polls, can't read for meaning. I can't tell you anything beyond that. Um, so what do grade ones and twos and threes actually know? And then how does that fit into strengthening the curriculum? So there's still questions around that. We still have big questions that have largely remained ideological around language. Um, when should we be switching languages of instruction? Is the current policy appropriate or not? Um, if you look at the African context, there's a lot going on, contradicting stories, lots of countries switching to English too early, in my opinion. Uh, UNESCO, which told us to switch in grade three years ago. Uh, and then current questions around, are we switching too early? Uh, those questions have largely remained ideological. They're around politics and who's in power and not really the evidence of when to switch. So there's a bunch of those. Uh, then I have a second level of questions around when you are designing for a second intervention. So initially we had these RCTs, how do you teach reading for meaning for the first three grades, but how should we be thinking about teachers now? They've had some intervention. Do you have the same dosage, same depth? Do you come back in one year versus three years? Um, what are the impacts you expect to see on the second cohort and the third cohort? So some of that. And then some long-term studies. Um, where are the effects of these early interventions that we've had? Um, do you see them later? And maybe a last um, version, which is a slightly higher level. How do you get things like the Auditor General, who is, a, I guess, a, a watchdog in the state, of the state, to not just measure inputs, um, but to measure outcomes. And how do you scale that up? How do you get Treasury to be driving, um, delivering outcomes instead of telling us to cut teacher budgets? So those are still bigger questions than like literacy or numeracy. Sometimes I think the word system and the system's challenges make it feel like everything is a problem. <laughs> and then how do you drill? I mean, because the answer to any one of those questions feels like it's a research program in itself, yeah, right? So why is it then that you think you're not getting the answers? I mean, some are, like I've said, ideological, some are around what evidence exists. So you have a lot of diagnostic work, but not a lot of interventions that are measured. So you know what would work at scale. Um, and some of them are around political economy. Um, they're not around education, actually. They're about the systems, uh, how decisions at a broad level get made, what are trade-offs. Um, for example, we have a presidential youth initiative that's massive and focuses on employment, but it's not focused on education. But we do have real unemployment issues in South Africa. So how do you decide whether you want to keep more young people employed or you want to half the numbers and use that money for education so yeah yep and rachel that i mean it makes me think a little bit of some of the conversations that we had and for those who don't know i was at the then differed at the start of rise and rachel was my boss for many years um i won't ask any incredibly difficult questions <laughs> or tell any embarrassing <laughs> stories yeah, exactly <laughs> um but one of the things at the start of rise was not only about what the questions were, but who should be answering them and to trying to bring people from different academic disciplines into looking at education. Economists obviously being one large cohort, but also some of the really exciting stuff that I've loved um, through RISE has been some of the anthropology, the public admin, the Marx stuff, you know, on, on innovation. Like there's been some really interesting angles coming at education problems. Um, and, and you at the time had a graph that set out, this is the state of education research. My feeling today is we don't have as a global education community a, a view on the state of education research today. But given that you were the kind of author of that, of that graph, where do you think we've come from then? And, and uh, I guess a little bit about what's Rise's role in all of that. Ben. Mm. No, thank you. And maybe um, maybe the clever IT could, could put the graph up for you, <laughs> um, because I think, uh, you know, we actually have made incredible progress and 
sitting here with Lant, I think it's actually testimony to an economist <laughs> who was prepared to listen to the anthropologist. You know, <laughs> Yamini, I think, is probably one of the people you often talk most about, Lant, and I think that your convening of an interdisciplinary group has been quite phenomenal, and I think it genuinely has shifted the game. And I think, Laura, also we, you know, we had at the time on the, on the, um, Access at the bottom, we talked about quantitative research, and that was, you know, mainly economists. But there weren't so many of those. Um, they were, you know, there were fairly few studies at the time. And I think one example of how far we've come is actually if we think about the deep um, panel and you know the global education um, expert advisory panel and the Smart Buys report. Just in the last two years, between the last report and the one we um, have just put out, 250 new studies um, that are in there, 47,000 downloads of those reports. Um, I think it's quite phenomenal that we've really you know, grown that body. And I think also on, on um, you know, the other axis, from micro to macro, we were mainly doing lots of micro studies, particularly the qualitative side. We weren't really talking about scale. We weren't really looking at, at um, things through government systems. And I think um, all credit to um, the rights community and all of you who've been part of that, trying to really shift how we do that and what we look at. And so I think that's been um, you know, key. And another indicator of that, do you remember, and I think we've got um, Christine Beggs in the audience here, and I think we've got Lewis Crouch, um, you know, USAID and the bank, at the time and the UN, there were just four of us saying we needed to increase the quality of evidence. And, and Maria somewhere who was coordinating it all, um, Maria Brindlemer, um over there, um, four members, it's now 40 members, Laura, and six interest groups because people aren't content with just having the, the general panels. They want to deep dive into the topics, um, uh, you know, early childhood learning, teacher professional development, climate, education and emergencies, and so on. So, so I think that's been one area. I think what's also really um, fascinating has been the evidence uptake as well, and what's happened there. So RISE has shifted the narrative, and I think it's partly because there have been those different voices. The WDR um, 2018, um, you know, I think um, the fact that the RISE conceptual framework has been so influential in some of these and thinking about learning trajectories. And for many, they were talking about access and they weren't talking about learning. And we can forget that, that 10 years ago, um, particularly donor, donor driven programs weren't thinking about the, what happened inside the classroom. Um, and I think, I, I don't know who's here from the India team, but having just had the privilege, oh, there's Abhijit, um, having just had the privilege of spending a month in India, it was really telling that the 2020 new evidence, um, the Education Act, is very informed by all of the research that Abhijit and Kartik and, and others have done. And that having academics who genuinely engage with policy is, again, a really unique um, unique thing. But perhaps, I would say, the most exciting thing, and I know this was part of, you know, your vision and your push having come from the work in, in Bangladesh, what about the government and um, change at the government level? Um, so I'll just tell you a little story. Who, who here has been to the Education World Forum at all? The okay, quite a few. The largest gathering, as Laura well knows, of over 100 ministers from around the world. And this year, it was actually just fell after the day of the King's coronation. So London was in a bars and um, we were in the big, big forum with glass windows and we were overlooking that Westminster Abbey and a, a boardroom. And there you had you know, the usual ministers around the table and um, the fabulous Sally Grantham McGregor inspiring them about early childhood. And they were looking you know, intently at her because, of course, they weren't really doing much on early childhood. And they sat back and said, so do you mean what we've been doing is actually a bad buy. And 
Rukmini, of course, jumped right in and said, yes, actually, <laughs> with her usual frankness. Luckily, um, Halsey was in the room from the bank and in his diplomatic said, but yes, but you could turn it into a promising buy if you, along with your laptops, you add in some teacher support and coaching and so on. So, but I think what, what was great about that was you're actually starting to get ministers and, of course, their entourage they bring in the delegation thinking more deeply about the evidence. We weren't there 10 years ago, Laura. Mm. So, you know, I think that's extremely exciting. And um, Nick Sprawl yesterday said, look, should we also have a different starting point? And this is your first C in your five acts, Lant, which I absolutely love and always land well in discussions with governments. But should we be starting with their priorities rather than what Stefan calls our theory of ignorance, where Stefan, Stefan calls it that we're, we're just assuming that those in power want learning and that it assumes that they're waiting to be told what works and that once they have that knowledge, they're going to act and everything's going to change. Um, and I think that, um, you know, this is not necessarily where we, um, you know, where we, <coughs> where we know the truth is. And I think it demands a different way of working. So just to, just to finish on, on that graph um, there, in the middle box, if you remember, there was mixed methods. And I think um, this research opportunity, we still have some way to go on that. I think there was some great work with the Ethiopia team, with the Vietnam team. Um, you know, but Yamini yesterday, Yamini I, a fabulous anthropologist, called on us yesterday. She said, look, let's not think of the qualitative as a nice to have that you report on, you, you know, you don't even report on, but actually that we have at every stage before we implement the RCT, you know, at the design stage, at the implementation stage, and at the analysis stage. And I think it's a really good challenge. And I think the, the other thing that we um, have started but need to build on, and I don't know where Claire Lieber is, but, you know, somebody who's always a champion of um, empowering researchers who are young and upcoming, and particularly researchers from the Global South. And I think it's wonderful to see sort of that sort of, um, leadership from someone like Claire Lieber to encourage that um, young people come and see them progress in their academic careers. Um, and the way the community of practice, when you were using the, um, you know, the diagnostic tool, actually went out and called on them to help pilot that. I think another great example. And, and I think going forward um, with the What Works Hub, we need to do more of supporting that um, localization. Thank you. Um, Lan, I'd, I'd like to pose a similar question to you, um, because you've, you've said before that from the, from the start of RISE and many years before, the global community has known that learning has been an issue. Learning has been bedded into discourse and narratives on, on education. No one intended access to take over, right? Um, but the starting kind of, I guess, line in the original business case for RISE was we don't know enough about what works to improve learning at scale. Do we now? <laughs> <laughs> I, so I'm gonna ignore that question. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> For a second. <laughs> and because I was thinking about how to illustrate kind of where we are on the system versus implementation. And I want to tell the story of an unrequited love of my youth. Um, <laughs> which was with a car. Um, I love the Ford Mustang. Uh, I was born in 1959. The 1966, 67, 68 Ford Mustang was the dream automobile. Uh, you know, Steve McQueen drove a Ford Mustang. It was just so. <clears throat> and the Ford Mustang <laughs> was the epitome of cheap oil and no concern about emissions. So to make a fast car, you just made a huge engine, right? And then all else was like around that. Then in when I was 
14. So just about ready to drive. <laughs> All of this relationship with the Ford Mustang was <laughs> imaginary, of course, to a teenager. Um, the OPEC shock hit, price of oil, quintuples. Uh, in addition, the environmental movement all of a sudden says, you know, our air is really, really dirty from all these cars. And so the automobile manufacturers were under enormous pressure, including legislation, to increase miles per gallon, increase fuel efficiency. So in 1975, uh, my older brother's best friend bought a brand new 1975 Ford Mustang, and it was a piece of shit. <laughs> it was the betrayal of my <laughs> years of lust because <laughs> this is a little too personal, I guess, but anyway. <laughs> but, you know, they because the way the Ford had solved the problem of the trade-off of having a new objective of miles per gallon was they just put a four-cylinder engine in a Ford Mustang. But without really a fundamental rethink, without any improvement in efficacy in the way the system was designed. And so <laughs> it was just, it was underpowered. It like, it wasn't fast, it wasn't quick, it wasn't sexy, it wasn't, anything. It was a piece of crap. I am still, as you can tell, bitter <laughs> about Ford Motor Company uh, having betrayed uh, my love. Now, what's the point, you may ask? <laughs> the point is, a lot of what we're hearing is on the assumption we can just drop a modular component into an existing education system and produce a better system. And that, I think, is the overall, now I'm getting back to the actual question you asked. The motivating question, and I, I think the word scale gets people confused, right? The motivating question of rise, it was, why do some education systems, as a result of the routine operation of the system, endogenously produce excellent learning outcomes and other systems don't? Now, that is intrinsically a question of scale, but it's not the question of how do we take this particular known thing and scale it in the system? It's the opposite of that. It's how does the system come to produce as again, as a routine operate, as the routine endogenous outcome of the way in which the system operates, how does it routinely identify, assess, uh, uh, design and implement uh, programs in the system? So interestingly, as yet today, no one's used the word Vietnam. <laughs> now, Vietnam's a really interesting word because Vietnam achieves OECD levels of learning, roughly, mm -hmm. at roughly the cost per pupil, at least in the past before education expenditures expanded rapidly in Vietnam with its economic growth. It was producing OECD levels of outcomes at roughly equivalent expenditure per pupil that many countries today already have. And so... <laughs> The way the question is, like, how the hell does Vietnam do that, whereas other countries with similar expenditures don't, right? So I think we are much further along in uh, fleshing out what the functional characteristics of systems are, <laughs> but they're not unique mappings of one-to-one -one of design characteristics. Right, it's, you know, functional systems do these things, but that doesn't elicit the granularity of how do these things get done? There's lots of ways to skin a cat. And so different functional cat skinning systems skin cats. Ooh, sorry, let's not go down there. <laughs> let's pick a different metaphor. Anyway, so anyway, so I think we're 
more towards this. Um, but when you, you know, when we talk about implementation science, <laughs> there's two radically different interpretations of that, right? One is the science of how do we get governments to implement what we think we already know they should be implementing to achieve desired outcomes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that inevitably leads to deliverology type approaches. And the other is what is the science of systems that again, work such that they implement well and achieve the outcomes we want. And those are like radically different approaches. I, I, I call one, I, I was in a conversation where we're often in a situation where I've, we've had massive <laughs> progress in science, but we don't actually have a science of progress mm -hmm. because we don't actually have a science of how does progress happen. So. But I think in a way, the same thing has happened with systems research and the word system has been interpreted and misinterpreted so many ways. I think, you know, from the, the test last year to all these documents. I mean, almost every strategy now from any funder implements, you know, the language, the zeitgeist language of the moment is systems. And it really wasn't 10 years ago. I'm not going to blame Rise for that, but. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm happy to blame Rise. I mean, we, <laughs> <laughs> the question is, yeah, I don't know. I mean, you got to get fist people to use the word. I don't know. I, this is a big question for, of, of a science of progress. Do you get people using the word system <laughs> and then gradually get them to understand what the hell they're talking about? But see, I think systems change has been interpreted as your first example, that yeah. systems change is to do something we already interpret and therefore need to mold the system to do. Yeah. And in a way, I've had the same question from, you know, you know as, as you rise, you and the rise team have been evolving the idea that started quite early on around coherence for learning and recognizing that, um, purpose was going to be key and that commitment, the commitment of a certain number of actors in the system was going to need to be there. Um, my questions early on were, well, how do you achieve that coherence? Because I can see a way that that would also be interpreted to be from an external actor or indeed various internal actors within the system <laughs> with more right perhaps to say, well, how do we create it? And I think that is a sort of, there is a, there is a, I still have today a real question. Can we create coherence for learning, can we create a sense of purpose in the system? Because who's going to tell any teacher or district education official that they don't have purpose? Um, can we create commitment not only to a certain set of policies, but also to the to the implementation? Is it is it possible to do that? And do you think RISE has helped us understand how to not have a future set of actors running out exactly trying to create that? in wrong ways. Uh, I mean, this is very old fashioned joke about the TV show Lone Ranger. It was an American Western show. Lone Ranger was a Western cowboy who had a Indian companion. And the joke is they're surrounded by Indians and Lone Ranger says, we're really in trouble here, Tonto says. What do you mean, we? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> when you ask the question, can we yeah. do X, Y, or Z? Like, who is ex exactly is we? And I think if we as people in this room, the answer is for sure, absolutely not. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> uh, if we ask, can we people in this room contribute to assist at the local, national, state level? Can we help people create this? Probably with a program of research and understanding what constraints they face. But, um, you know, we this is where the challenge of the what works hub and implementation is just radically orders of magnitude more difficult than RISE because RISE was a research program <laughs> and we produced research and we did a good job of producing research, but producing commitment <laughs> is, a, is, a really, uh, is a really challenging thing and you have to say, you know, no amount of commitment from the global community 
is going to create commitment in South Africa mm -hmm. or commitment in India that, com that has to be created locally. So. And Pumi, what's your take on that? Is there commitment to learning in South Africa? Can you create more of it? And is there, I guess, building off this sort of uh, separation of a commitment to the goal versus commitment to the implementation that the last panel talked so much about, do you see a distinction? Is there commitment to one and not the other? I mean, I think there's a commitment to learning. I, I think I'm yet to find what people have in their mind of when you think of a dysfunctional system, it means you stand at the gate and you just see everyone's running around in a school. People are sitting in staff rooms, children are at home. That's not what you see in a typical school. You walk in, they're all there, they're doing something. I mean, I don't think they're doing it to just pass the time. Um, I think there's a different idea about how to do it better, et cetera. Um, and that can be shifted, but I think Lant is right around how you shift that. And I think we have uh, maybe two examples. Um, one is around a design failure, which um, Jacobus and Stephen were part of. Um, we used to call it informed and empowered when we started. It ended soon in three months and it was uninformed and disempowered <laughs> when we renamed it. And it was essentially this idea, global idea, give um, schools information, give parents information, they'll make different choices. No, that's not, was never going to work. We learned, did a little qualitative study quickly, early. Uh, the principal was happy to convene parents the first time. Um, and then once we presented the, hey, your school's doing worse than the school next door, you could be doing better, you have the same input, et cetera, the school principal just didn't call them back. Like, and that was the end, finished. Um, does that mean that school principal wasn't committed to learning um, or were we using levers that are, didn't build credibility for the, for the school principal and for what they may have perceived our mission to be? I think that's probably what happened there. Um, where's a different example where we've had a successful intervention that worked. We did it with an NGO. We had training at the beginning of each term. It happened on time as planned. Um, the current version is we're scaling up with the province and training happens, but there are lots of constraints and we've learned to live with that. That is the system. And so the budget constraints, the time cycles, academic time cycles that clash with financial time cycles that clash with the other district programs. Um, do I think that means they're not serious about learning outcomes? I, no, I think they are serious about learning outcomes, but it's around how do we take our programs or ideas that we think work, get buy-in, but also be flexible about how they get actually implemented. And so I'm more keen to see the results from that rather than this external, everything's perfect, but you actually are not in the system at all kind of work. Um, so yeah, I think there is a commitment, what it looks like, how you map it out, how you measure it, its timing are different depending on what level of the system you're working at. You say that is the system, These, it is full of constraints. How in the design of something like that, and then the kind of testing of the early <laughs> stages of it, how do you work out which of those constraints you can move? Which of them are movable and, and yeah. I think that's the, in our case, um, the advantage of being in the state, um, that we have a, a better understanding of who the various players are, and there's some trust um, that they have around sharing what the constraints are, um, and it's just really engaging them on what they think is going to work. Um, so, I mean, it's even things like, yeah, engaging them effectively. I mean, the curriculum policy says you should be teaching a 12-week term. If you speak to the actual subject advisors, they tell you you're wasting your time. Uh, you should probably aim for eight to 10 weeks because in reality, there are assessment week, there are funerals, um, choir competitions, et cetera. And I mean, you could do the policy thing and have a 12 week curriculum that never gets taught. You could argue with them, let's make it 10 weeks so we can do a bit of extensions. But them feeling heard and accommodated in the curriculum means that they're your partners rather than in opposition to your curriculum and are actually implementing the curriculum rather than the design curriculum. Someone was presenting design versus um, implemented curriculum. So, yeah. So you've just, I mean, I don't hear a huge number of examples around the world of um, 
one really strong listening and kind of identification of various different people's views of what the problem is, but then also not policy design that tests it, brings it back and says, actually, after three months, as you say, disempowered, you know, it's not, we're going to change the name and we're just going to stop the whole thing. Um, Rachel, turning to you on the challenge, as Lan put it, the challenge of the what works hard on implementation science, is that how implementation science looks like, you know, to, to enable governments and practitioners to pilot something, to listen first, to pilot something. So it's the whole old kind of PDIA test, learn, adapt mm. um, model. How, I guess, two sort of sub questions, how can a research, mostly research program come in to support the enabling environment in order to have that happen? Mm -hmm. And if it was so easy, and Lant has said it's not easy, then how has it not happened more? Mm. Already, big questions. <laughs> I think let me, let me let me start with 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 the first because um, I'd like to suggest that perhaps um, it's not just about the top down trying to create the commit commitment, but perhaps it's a totally different model we need in terms of the bottom up. And another little story. Surprisingly, sometimes the most unexpected things happen in a building like this. The third floor, coffee room, BSG. Always good for a bit of extra caffeine, a bit of uh, boost of the concentration, but sometimes also surprising things can happen there. And I had actually just been having a conversation with Kat um, Patillo, who had been telling me about the incredible example of Sobral, where if we talk about systems, that's where I think of genuine system reform, where you're thinking, you know, you're talking about political commitment and trade unions and communities and your finance ministries. And, and Kat had shared that how they went from, you know, at grade two, going from 40 percent learning to 92 percent learning um, just in three years. And this is one of the poorest states in the country of Brazil. Incredible progress. So how did that sort of commitment happen? Anyway, back to the coffee machine. I was up there um, just minding my own business. And of course, suddenly there was Dennis from Lehman Foundation. You think you're always meeting amazing people here. And I thought, OK, this is my moment to say, it was just the start of the pilot for the What Works Hub, and we were testing different sort of different ideas. And I thought, what about taking a group from a couple of our pilot countries, so Kenya and Pakistan, what about taking a group to see this? Because I'd found that as quite a powerful mechanism working in Nepal and India, that exemplars from the bottom up are often more inspiring than evidence from the top down. So I thought, okay, let's see if this works. And, and after you know, a bit of persuasion, um, Dennis saying, well, you know, really, we just do the scaling in Brazil. And I said, yes, but, you know, you know, sharing that lesson more widely, wouldn't that be interesting? Finally, he said yes. And what was interesting is they said, no, it's not for you as the donor to go and then identify who should go in terms of um, the individuals. We'll do that. And actually, an anchor organization in the country will do that. Yeah. And um, I was a bit like, oh, well, we're paying for this in my usual kind of tone. Of it. so, <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So we'll leave it to the anchor organisation. Unsurprisingly, the anchor organisations chosen ended up with independent criteria, independent assessment, ended up being PAL network members. Uh, you know, independent, respected, understanding evidence, but not politically aligned to any one partner. And for the first time, really, in my in my career, I saw a group of different peoples from different elements of the system coming together. What did they do? Lance, you know, when you took everyone out of their comfort zone, and let's not forget how difficult this program was at the beginning, it was hard. And Lant used to take everyone out of their comfort zone and do things like go to climbing walls and make dancing. us all made us dance. dancing. Do you remember the time you brought your wife to make everyone do some art? I mean, you know, or, or the time I hated the most, which was that, that dreadful improv session. <laughs> oh my gosh, here in this very building, how to humiliate people. Well, anyway, Lant's way of putting people out of their comfort zone was much more pleasant now on retrospect than what they did in Brazil. They took everyone and for three days, we went into the basement of some 
vanilla hotel in the Sao Paulo. We didn't have a window in the whole room. And for three days, they started you know, doing all this psychological, you know, what do you, what, you know, what's your worst characteristic? And what are the traumatic things in your childhood? And, and I was like, what? And I was sort of, after three days, I was thinking, I thought we were going to see system reform. I thought I was going to see some classrooms and children. What are we doing? And, um, However, there was, you know, there was a method in the madness. And those people who, when they walked off the aeroplane down the tarmac, didn't know each other and didn't really want to talk to each other because the trade unions definitely did not see eye to eye with the teacher trainer um, lead or the Ministry of Finance member who was on that course. They walked back, not only with common respect and as comrades, as we might say, but they walked back with a common mission and an outcome that they believed in that was that was not predetermined by someone, but it was based on what they believed were the problems. And I think it's, you know, it was a really inspiring um, model um, that I haven't haven't seen um, before. So what does that mean? I think that means that we do need a shift in culture, Laura. I think we need a shift in culture and how we use evidence. I think we need a shift um, in culture around using that to test, learn, adapt. And I think we need a shift in culture in terms of the local ownership of it. Um, during the course, I, um, we, I was also told that I couldn't be a fellow. And I thought, well, but I, would, I, I believe in this change just as much. Why, why can't I be a fellow on this program? And I said, well, at least my Kenyan counterpart, you know, they're Kenyan, they could be a fellow, and my Pakistani counterpart, they could be a fellow, seeing Baylor's laughing over there um, as the anchor organization in, in Pakistan. No, you're still a donor, and you are usually dogmatic about determining the agenda. And this is a different model. This is a different approach. And it's about a, you know, a locally owned and a locally led problem identification and solution. So I think, um, I think it's really interesting. I think the challenge therefore perhaps for the What Works Hub is more about how do we then identify what technical assistance might be you know, demanded and us being responsive to that to help then with a gold standard, if you like, of um, the change that they're trying to enact. So ensuring your alignment, um, Lant, I mean, thinking about the Sabral. So the Kenyan team went back saying their mission was going to be cr to create a Sabral of Kenya. And they wanted at scale in terms of one district to try and model what they'd seen. The challenge is, you know, you go back and you don't necessarily have the best assessment system. You don't necessarily have the teaching and learning materials. Um, they may not be produced. They may not be being, being locally created. So how do you then provide the appropriate support and so on to help help do that? And at the same time, um, help support sufficient evidence generation to do your test, adapt and learn, um, which again is a challenging thing to do. So, so you've got me really nervous about the trip that some of us in the room are going on to Sabral in November. <laughs> get, get ready for your stories. Um, <laughs> But I, I want to put your your challenge almost back to Mpumi. And if if that is what the What Works Hub needs to do, if that's what implementation science looks like, getting um, researchers, practitioners, government to be working hand in hand almost, you know, kind of changing that culture of practice in a way, is that possible? What would it take? Are you, I mean, you, you've given two examples where you're starting to see it, but... Um, what we're saying here really, and what, what I'm drawing from, from what you're saying, Rachel, is that the change in the practice of evidence can help contribute in and of itself to improvements of learning. Uh, do, you, do you think that's possible, feasible, and what would it take? Yeah, I think so. So I think the first thing is um, research is still underfunded um, in general. Uh, I know even the work we do, which is a lot of work, um, is, has a lot of external funding. Um, uh, the internal funding is sort of for our salaries and hopefully, I don't know, desktop work, um, analyzing existing data sets, but innovation, actually trialing things, piloting, doing the case studies, et cetera, needs money, actual money, uh, which we often don't have in the budgets. And in times like now, we have budget crunches, which are in fact saying we should travel even less, 
intervene even more, less, monitor remotely, et cetera. Um, so that kind of support financially is needed. I think there is a recognition around technical aspects of what we don't know. So I, I think most governments are open to, we don't know how to teach robotics and coding, if that's the thing you want to support. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on whether you should do that. But there are technical questions that are unknown, and I think people are willing to admit that. Um, there are aspects where people know something but need resources to deepen their knowledge. So, for example, the teaching of reading in African languages in South Africa is not something we'd want to outsource. It's something you can fund that's happening in the country. Um, how you roll out, etc., could then have some technical aspects to it. Uh, and then there's some behavioral um, research that we can bring that can be world class around how you change people's beliefs, um, how much exposure do people need to start believing children can learn, um, what do we learn from coaching, for example, how long does it take for someone to actually change their practice, those are things you can learn from the global north or other places. Um, and then there's the, I guess, the recognition that's necessary from researchers, donors, et cetera, that they don't know everything, right? So there's a undermining or mutual respect that happens both ways. Um, and that can be explicit or it can be implicit. You go to the training and you just keep doing whatever you were doing. Um, but I think if we get to those kinds of things that are are, are less like counting and ticking boxes and, and more relational. Uh, there is an opportunity for collaboration, it's a big need. Um, it's We have scarce resources, we have uh, large problems that need to be resolved and best minds um, applying themselves to that is a useful thing. So I think definitely doable, but should be thought through um, carefully. Lant, I think you have views on that, on that question too, in a way, right? The, um, <laughs> does, well, does, well, yeah, I mean, to take your pick, but does, um, will the study of implementation, from your point now, yeah. sort of research director of RISE, looking forward to the questions, and as I say, we heard many, many questions today on implementation, many more, I think, on politics, I have to say, but I'm biased on that one, you know, there's a lot of kind of the politics didn't work, but can implementation be studied? Can that culture shift happen? Will it help? So, strangely enough, I was just read a document that quoted me um, as saying something I had never said. <laughs> That's but, AI, blame AI. <laughs> but which I liked, so now I, I did. <laughs> uh, <laughs> which is that, um, you know, a discipline, there's a group of people who agree on what counts as a question and agree on what counts as an answer to a question. And a very serious problem, any commingling of what would be academically published research and implementation is that there isn't a discipline in which, uh, uh, you know, what these questions that we're answering count as questions. And in particular, there isn't a discipline that has agreed upon what counts as an answer to these questions that is sufficiently scientific, and my fingers just can't help do this, scientific and rigorous. Uh, and that is a first order problem. It's a first order problem because academia is completely, totally controlled by the disciplines. And so if you can't ask a world-class researcher as a junior, non-tenured person trying to make their way in the world to not respond to his or her chosen discipline. And if your discipline, <laughs> like my, second love after the Ford Mustang was economics, um, uh, who I met just before my wife. So <laughs> third is my wife. It's chronological. <laughs> I, uh, uh, <laughs> she doesn't watch her YouTube stuff. It's fine. <laughs> oh, oh, this is being recorded. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> who, of course, has become first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, but chronologically, my discipline, some disciplines work backwards. They say, here's what counts as an answer. 
Therefore, the only questions that count are the questions that can be answered with the method we have decided is the method of what counts as an answer. And you know, today and every day in which economists talk, we're obsessed with causal identification. And if you don't have clean, and I love the word clean because it's like a ritual purity clean. They don't mean, they mean clean like a religion means clean. If you don't have clean identification, it can't be an answer to a question. Uh, and yet the questions that we're asking are going to be incredibly difficult to frame into a way in which the affiliated, the associated disciplines that dominate academia will recognize as an answer. And since they don't, you know, and if you've defined what counts as a question by the questions that you can answer, which has very much happened, then you can't get research in the academically publishable, academically rewarded way embedded in this. And, you know, <laughs> I'm looking at Noam. This is a first order challenge of attempting to integrate research and practice. Yeah, go on. Go on. Yeah, go on. Do you need a microphone? No. Do we need microphones? You want to come and yeah. Oh, it's. <laughs> Sorry. Go I assume. Go on. Um. So when we talk about implementation science, how are we conceptualizing the thing that is being implemented? And I've started to worry about this because I think one reason why Rise had slippage issues in understanding what systems are because systems is an abstract term can mean all things to all people. I'm starting to worry about related slippage when we talk about implementation science because for example when we talk about implementation fidelity and this is not the question of like fidelity versus adaptation which is a separate issue um, because when we say an intervention was implemented well or implemented badly that implies that the quality of the implementation can be separate I'm sorry, the quality of the intervention, its normative value can be separated from whether there's a package of stuff that made it implementable or not. And I worry about this for two reasons. One is that I come from a country like many in the global south where people say, oh, we have lots of beautiful policies. Here is the paper they are printed on um, and nothing happens. Um, so, but also because who are we implicitly attributing responsibility to? Because if we say, the intervention was implemented badly. That is implicitly maybe putting blame on the on the teachers and the people in the district offices rather than on the designers and those who should resource it. And I worry about power dynamics there. Yep. So what what is it that we are implementing when we see science? <laughs> Rachel, that not to put you on the spot, but that kind of um, segues a little bit in, into the question, um, the kind of last question I was I was going to put to you and. Um, do you want to take that one and, and run with it? It's not an easy one. Yeah. No, that's a, <laughs> a, a, a big question there, Yui, and um, I think we could all give a, give a go at answering it. And I absolutely don't think this is um, an issue of putting blame somewhere. And if we, if we think about the system, it's about that complexity that there are different actors have different responsibilities. Okay. And I think the problem is that we've tried to look at sort of a slither of that without understanding the whole. Mm -hmm. You may remember, and I see, see Janice in the room as well, um, Janice Dolan from FCDO, at the time when we used to talk about a whole school approach in terms of how um, as a, um, we used to work with, with governments and actually not taking just single interventions and thinking that would change things, but actually looking across the whole, the whole system. I think... Um, you know, implementation science has to be about examining sort of those larger elements, therefore, and it, it's a little bit like Yamini was calling on us all yesterday, that we need to be kind of understanding the bureaucratic culture as well of the, of the public system. I think some of the work that Deliver Ed has done in the last couple of years, uh, the work that was presented earlier, um, Zara's here and Claire Lever and so on were doing, um, understanding um, what in the, the incentives exist to change or not, um, and understanding what they are. You know, why do some teachers turn up and others don't turn up? Um, why do some, you know, what are the constraints around, you know, the larger social context? Why are some children not turning up? I mean, a lot of the issues on equity, I think, have been another area that we haven't addressed sufficiently. And yesterday we had Pauline Rose 
um, have a call for us to actually think more carefully and deeply about some of the gender issues. And even in our measures of, say, cost effectiveness, at the moment, we're not bringing equity into those at all. You know, we're blind to those broader distributions. Um, and so it's sort of almost as if we've got this, well, there's a cost and there's a, there's a best buy, but actually um, it may be look more cost effectiveness to give a girl, um, you know, a, a scholarship based on merit, but actually are we also concerned about a girl who may have a higher need? And so, you know, some of those more complex issues also need to be addressed. And we haven't, we've been sort of hiding behind um, some of the numbers perhaps um, with those more complicated <laughs> issues. Um, but I think, you know, it does take us beyond, I mean, I think, you know, one of the, the most well-known studies coming out of RISE, for example, is that fabulous paper by Kartik and, and, and Abhijit's paper on, you know, the MP study that showed, you know, the school improvement plans not having an impact. And, you know, I think what we're saying with implementation science is, you know, the next step is then to understand, well, what were those, you know, what were those issues and are they, are they shiftable? So, you know, they, they revealed that those were kind of pretty much carbon copies. And obviously it was just a bureaucratic tick box that was resulting in that not having an impact. So what is it that could change it? Would it be greater parental engagement? Would it be greater support to the head teachers to incentivize them producing it? Or is it about a responsiveness in terms of the resourcing that then would respond to those plans? They weren't, you know, they perhaps weren't incentivized because even if they had the plan, there was going to be no action coming, resulting from those plans. And it's those broader questions that we need to be unpicking and unpacking and understanding if we're really going to make the shifts. And, you know, I think Christine begs at the back, um, you know, challenging us, you know, is 0.1 standard deviation sufficient? Is that sufficient? You know, are we content? You know, if we were on that level of change, Lant. I'd love to hear as an economist your trajectories. So you know, where would we be on that learning trajectory? We probably wouldn't get very far in terms of shifting um, the game. So we need to be doing something differently. We need to be understanding the system more broadly. I'm going to open out to any questions uh, in the room now, Tahir. So, okay, there's a lot. Hang on. Let me do this side first. Um, so, yeah, thank you. You know, generals fight last, what does it say? The previous generation's battle. So before we start what works, we got to fight the rice battle uh, and, and work through the system before we can get to implementation. No, Land, seriously, I mean, I think this is a good point, right? But there are ways of thinking about systems which are not ad hoc or anything, right? Mathematics has dynamical systems. And we have this idea of a state variable, which is slow to move, and then the control variable and the elusive search for control variables, which at the World Bank became like growth regressions, anything on the right-hand side could move and all that, and you know, which went nowhere. Um, so the point is that, you know, some of it is, how do you move a state variable? And I'd like to think that, you know, some of it is the, the hard problem which you are describing is what we call an equilibrium. Uh, you know, when things are in equilibrium, and particularly start thinking of intuition of a Nash equilibrium, uh, where, you know, it's self-enforcing, nobody has an incentive to deviate and all that. It's a stable equilibrium of some sort. And all throughout, we read economic history, other things, you know, we don't know, even if Vietnam exists and Pakistan exists and both are equilibria, right? Nash and many others have said, you know, just nobody knows really how to move. Theory doesn't tell us at least too much on how to move from one equilibrium to another one. And I think that's a real problem. I mean, I think that's a deep question about social change. So this is not just about technocratic solutions to various things. And this is like a problem which in economic history has been studied. There are different disciplines, of, sub-disciplines have studied. And I think this is a good way to think. And, and you know, we did try to do it, right? And our idea about thinking about the village as a closed market, and therefore we could look at an equilibrium very locally. So it was an equilibrium, right? A market-based equilibrium, you, you, you shake it, it takes 20 years to study it, right? I mean, we are still waiting to see whether where it comes down. So part of the report got ready is, but it has to be some idea of a general equilibrium, right? We don't know what the relationships are fixed. So the, my definition of a system really comes back to economics as an idea of a general equilibrium. So my sense is you move things and then things have to work out endogenously afterwards. And then the question is, you know, as, what does the Jupiter said? A new circular flow, as they said, right? I mean, that's what you're talking about. I mean, I think it takes time and you have to really think about it. 
And then implementation is maybe just one of the shocks that you can try out, but you got to have some idea of figuring out how to study the system. And I don't think that in a macro, the beloved field, it's really difficult to figure out what's going on with systems. The debates are endless, right? I mean, how do systems evolve, change? Uh, so my sense is that you got to think in, in, in localized ways of where, you, you, where the conceptual idea of the system still is there, but it's still, at least you can study it, you can shock it, you can trace it, you can see its evolution, you can see whether it comes to a new resting place. Uh, the challenge is, I mean, you put an impossible question, right? I mean, you know, can we replicate China? Can we replicate Vietnam? Can we do this? Either you become like a change of discipline, become comparative politics or something, uh, which we, you know, so I, I think that those are good questions. I think that we, we will have to think about it. I think that RISE at least forced us to think about a system. What do we mean really even conceptually? And I think this will, you know, I don't think we have an answer of what is implementation science, mm. but at least we can start thinking about it. And, and where does it fit in into some of these kind of disciplinary concepts? And is there a way to think about it? So, okay. Thank you. Pass the mic behind, but as you're doing so, I'm super enthusiastic about those who are, who have been involved in RISE, those who are involved in the Works Hub, those others who are not involved in either, but have great love and affection for implementation science and systems thinking. I think it's these, this is, let's, let's make this a conversation of the, the various different reflections that you've got on this conversation too. And then you guys can choose which pieces of it to pick up as answers or just leave that as a useful, brilliant comment and contribution. But I'll take three, initially three comments or questions and then come back round. Um, sorry, go on. Hi, I'm, I'm sort of just responding to some of the things I heard from all of you uh, out there. Uh, one about sort of anthropology being important is possibly the only anthropologist in the room. Amen and hallelujah. Uh, but also, I mean, and I, I resp in response to sort of Lance's idea about what constitutes a discipline and sort of the circularity of what constitutes a of a discipline. And uh, also, uh, yes, having just done, been part of this multi-method study and uh, having sort of, uh, I mean, as an anthropologist, I, uh, as, I, I, I just want to sort of respond to some of what I have heard in this room and some, some of the troubling, uh, almost low-level contempt for teachers that seem to run through some of the presentations. Uh, I've not, I mean, we've had uh, speakers mention a whole Teach, the teaching profession in a whole country is with poor cognitive skills. Uh, we've had situations where teachers, uh, you know, young women for the most part, working in low fee private schools, uh, often in the most exploited conditions. So, to, I mean, their classrooms being turned into game shows where money is thrown at you depending on your confidence levels and the decisions you take. Uh, these, 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 I wonder, I mean, I'm not, and I, I'm sure that there is a lot of, uh, you know, research and, 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 and great techniques behind it, but uh, I, I just want to sort of push uh, a little and say that perhaps you do need anthropologists, if only to remind everyone that teachers are humans and uh, that shouldn't need to be said, but that they are teachers and students are more than just data points. And uh, I, I have just spent two years with teachers who, uh, I mean, in, in the service of evidence-based research have literally been dragged out of their classrooms to provide data on how their students learn instead of actually helping their students learn. So everyone here in this room who is part of the, the, the accountability data production machine that the Indian education systems increasingly becoming. I mean, I hope folks are also looking at themselves and what is this incentive structure that you have created for teachers as producers of data now versus teachers as producers of learning and then to then use that very data to tell them they aren't doing their job seems to me to be fairly contradictory. So please, anthropology, if it is about systems, then there is no other science as whole and holistic in its approach as anthropology. Anthropology because anthro, human, and anthropology because clearly uh, 
you said it, culture needs to change. Maybe even the culture about how we think and talk about teachers. Good job. Super. One over here. And then I'll come back to you guys for anything. Thank you very much. I think I have the perfect economist question to <laughs> connect to what you just said. So provocative way of seeing things could be we are trying to heal many, many symptoms of educational systems that are in place by law schools, for example, but they're often not working, sometimes maybe even discouraging independent learning, independent problem solving. So maybe should we just focus more on building uh, different new systems, for example, explaining people how to use their phones uh, to get all the knowledge of the world from the internet, or to learn how to find knowledge and solutions independently, how to improve their skills without being told so by school. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'll turn back to Lant and then Mpumi and Rachel. Uh, any thoughts on those three wide-ranging comments and challenges? Ranging from how to move the equilibrium to uh, should we do away with classrooms and uh, teach kids how to use, how to, how to navigate the internet? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think those were interesting comments. I don't have anything to say. How can implementation oh, science? I mean, the, the, I, I think there's, Sorry, there's been some, say one. Yeah, go on. Uh, I worry that so, <clears throat> and I'm going to use a word that I'm I barely know what it means, but ontology. Ontology is actually really important in deciding how one goes about researching something because the ontological character of what you're researching <laughs> influences what a science of that mm. ontological entity would be, right? Mm. So there's, and the, there's behavioral sciences which are about the behavior of human beings and human beings we understand really unbelievably well, right? Uh, intuitively, right? <laughs> And then there's the science of objects, which again, we understand we have amazing progress in the science of objects. But both implementation science and systems are talking about ontological things that are neither agents who are driven by a teleological desire to achieve certain ends. And then we understand agents in terms of why they're doing what they're doing, but we understand agents and the why. We understand objects like this table in terms of the what, but, but neither organizations nor systems are ontologically agents, nor are they ontologically objects. And so that creates a whole series of really deep questions of what, what a science of organizations looks like. And in the word implementation science, <clears throat> it's also not obvious what the unit, the most important unit is. Is it the organization, which is at least a legally fiction that's identifiable, mm -hmm. or is it a system? And a system is by definition almost an amalgam of very different ontological objects. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I'm, I'm just coming to even a, a bare minimum understanding of what <laughs> the phrase implementation science might even mean in terms of what's the ontological character of the reference of the of the thing isn't settled by any stretch of the imagination. Mm. There are, yeah, there's a number of challenges, challenges, and maybe no one wants to come in at some point um, on how the World Works Hub might want to respond to some of this stuff on day one <laughs> of the inception phase, right? Um, I don't think we should put him on the spot. But. Yeah, yeah. Rachel, do you have anything to add? Just, I just respond to the um, question from a fellow anthropologist. I think um, I think one of the one of the things that actually we care a lot about is listening to the voices of of teachers and also seeing positive um, outliers. And one one example of that was recently um, in in Kenya on a visit to a school um, in Kirinyaga where they're wanting to do the, the Sobral um, and walking past all of these empty, you know, quiet kind of classrooms of buzzing teachers and going to this very quiet one at the end, wondering where they were taking me. And at the end there, 
we opened the, you know, walked in, walked into that classroom, and there were 107 children in the classroom, with teacher Lucy at the front of that class holding the attention of every single child. And, you know, she had so many, and it was first term, that they all had cardboard round, you know, the name plaques round their necks, so that she could call each one of them by their name. And create that presence and each one of those children um, actually could could already read and one of the things she was doing was teaching at the right level without it, it actually being called that she was going around she was asking them to use their to me finger and follow the, the the reading and in that way as she walked around the class she tapped some of them on the head the ones who obviously weren't able to follow and she then called them out she said today's angels come out come to the front and she was actually doing catch up so you know there's some amazing practice already going on and some of this is about identifying that and looking at well how come in that school when two classrooms away there was chaos and really poor practice was it that there was a teacher in there holding every single child's attention and I think some of us understanding implementation isn't isn't just about external sort of experiments but it's also about us pulling out those um, those exemplars of good practice, um, and and some of it's about understanding the bureaucratic um, challenges that prevent good things that could be good practice happening. So, another example would be in Kenya when I was up with um, staying in a boma up in the far north in the Samburu country, and the classroom still had as as in a lot of Kenya had all the laptops locked in the cupboard. Now you could complain and say, well, what was the head teacher doing with all the laptops still locked in the cupboard? And it wasn't that they didn't have technical support because actually there was a girls education challenge technical um, support person who was helping them with another laptop initiative, which they were using. So why were all of, and they only had one of those, or I think maybe one per class, so had about six of those. And there were these, just so many other laptops locked in the cupboard. And when you asked, it was a fear. It wasn't a lack of desire. She was a brilliant head teacher. She was afraid. None of those had been sold or, or lost or they were all safely in the cupboard. But she hadn't been given the authority to go ahead and use them and the support needed and the structures used to need it. So part of the implementation science is understanding some of those and trying to unlock some of those um, issues in the in the system. So I think there's a lot of respect for teachers and, and their role and actually how hard it is. Um, but that brings me back to, I guess, part of my question earlier of if it were so easy, would we be doing it? Because um, there's been laptops, textbooks locked in classrooms for decades. There's been um, brilliant teachers found in pocket here, they're everywhere and isn't part of the problem in every school, in every country that you know, we're talking about here, but that where nine out of 10 kids can't read is in some schools, there's 10 different interventions, often not talking to each other, right? And for me, is there anything you'd like to add? Before yeah, we go just out? a quick comment um, on teachers. I, I think I hear the sentiment around teachers being spoken about as data points. And I think for the purposes of what we were presenting, that makes sense. Um, but I think it's also a recognition that teachers are the best resource, that we have to change learning outcomes. I know in our context, parents are not it. We've, they, we've had enough uh, research, we've had COVID, et cetera, that show that teachers are still the best resource we have uh, to teach reading or anything in, in schooling uh, that is related to school. So they deserve the attention and the focus. The wording you use around them maybe can be different. And I think even the technology question around, could we just replace teachers with technology? I think not. And COVID, again, was great for that. Uh, as an example, that it's not possible. I know in our context, we have 95% public schools. And even of the private schools, not every single child had technology. So there's still this a massive need for a teacher um, as a facilitator even if they incorporate technology so yeah and maybe there are other contexts where that's a viable idea i thought we had 10 minutes left we've got three so i'm really sorry to those who put their hands up and wanted to ask questions we've got drinks immediately after this and this partly i think why we have three because we don't want to delay you getting to the drinks please <laughs> find lant and pumi and rachel during the drink session and ask them those burning questions I wanted to ask Noam and then Rachel if you wanted to finish on anything related to the What Works Hub and Noam answer that question of, of how is implementation science going to fix it all? 
Uh, thank you. I, I actually have a question, if I can, but maybe you don't get to answer it. Um, I actually, I thought John here was going to share this. Um, in the break, he came up to me and he said, if I can share this with here, he said, if they had to write a book about me, they would write 0.1 standard deviation. <laughs> so we haven't managed to exceed 0.1 standard deviation. So uh, it's hard to get to 0.8 or all children learning. I just thought that was a, a funny um, moment there saying that this aspiration we've set, it is really hard because it's true. The median effectiveness is 0.1. So we're really a far way away. Um, but I will say our goal as a What Works Hub is to make progress and to make sure more children are learning and we understand rigorously how to do that. So one question I have for the panel, but I don't know if you can answer it in three minutes, is now that we're shifting from this theme of systems to implementation, what do you think we should keep common so we don't lose the amazing work that's happened over the last period? And what do you think we actually should do differently uh, as we move to implementation? Um, so that was my question. And I also realized when I was up there, I didn't actually say who I was. So that was a, I'm that going to be the academic director, or I am the academic director of the What Works Hub. So I'm listening very closely. Uh, so thank you. <laughs> Super. Why don't we finish with each of you giving 30 seconds on the response to Noam? Um, Sure. Um, I think the, the systems thinking aspect is still key. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there was a question earlier around, like, do we blame teachers? I think that would be incorrect. It's understanding what your program was, what you're doing and at every level. So, you know, you are you having a design failure, a delivery failure, a bureaucratic failure, a service provider failure, etc. And so that whole systems thinking, <laughs> system strengthening, system scaling, I think is important. I don't think it should be a competition between <laughs> systems and implementation. Mm -hmm. um, Lant. I I think in order to create a feel, a, a sub-discipline of implementation science, you need to change the conception of research from evaluating the impact of an intervention to evaluating the impact of the initiation of a process and then trace the process as part of the research. So it isn't just implementation of did they do it because otherwise you're 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 intrinsically in top-down mode yeah right because the intervention is pre-designed and implementation is a separate stage and so anyway so and and figuring out how to make that an acceptable rigorously methodological thing is i think the first order issue for for the research an academic component of the What Works Hub, because that's how things happen. They happen as a process. Uh, you know, I have jargon about this, like crawl of the design space versus, you know, most RCT is we're going to we're going to attempt to evaluate a specific design, as opposed to we're going to initiate a process in which the system is crawling the design space to find something effective and how you research that process is, I think, the key. Rachel, last minute. I would say three, three things, Noam, to your, to your question. I think let's continue to be producing that incredible quality of robust evidence that we saw in the graph. Um, but let's make sure it's costed. And in that costing, let's also consider equity. The second thing is, um, I think we need to do what Lance has said, um, is actually perhaps it's wrongly named as the What Works Hub, to think about this being the How Works Hub. And I think um, that's a challenge um, to you and the team, Noam. And I think the last thing is, um, on this discipline, let's be ambitious um, on implementation science. Um, as to hear and others said, you know, we're at the beginning of the journey of even thinking about what um, implementation science really means. But perhaps we need to be ambitious and have, you know, even a journal. I don't think special issues will cut it. We need journals where people can publish on this, where they have the academic incentives um, that allow them to, to be professional in the space. And I hope that that community of practice that has been just so phenomenal in RISE continues to grow and it grows with all of those you nurture from the global south as well so that in the future they are leaders and their leaders support 
the children um, of the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.